Matter of Trust, The Shades of Pemberley, written by P.O. Dixon, narrated by Pearl Hewitt. Prologue The after-effects of the sea breeze misted her eyes and masked her tears. Tears of self-recrimination for the life she had lived. Tears for the life she had left behind so many years ago. Most of all, tears of joy. She was returning home to take her rightful place amongst society. He called her name from a distance. Brushing her tears aside, she turned in the direction of his voice. Having greeted each other in the usual way upon his approach, he said, "'Your ladyship, please say you have considered the offer I made last evening.' The undistinguished gentleman, with the amiable smile, had been a constant companion since they had made each other's acquaintance upon setting sail from the continent. No, he was not the handsomest man she had ever known. By his attire, he did not possess enormous wealth. But there was something about his manner of speaking and the way he comported himself that lent a window into his character. His steadfastness and loyalty spoke to his forthrightness, his dependability. The gentleman standing before her was a man whom she could trust. I am loath to part with you once we dock. There remains so much more we have yet to discover about each other, he said. With a gracious smile, she accepted his extended arm. Sir, I look forward to travelling with you and your lovely mother. It would make the journey much more bearable, knowing that she would not be alone. Far too many years had passed since last seeing the home she loved. Her home. She looked across the horizon and smiled. At last, the dissolute child returns. Chapter 1. Three Months Earlier, Derbyshire, 1812 Darcy walked from the window overlooking the stables of the Matlock estate and took a seat. Do you suppose for one instant that what happened was not disturbing enough? Imagine the irreparable harm pursuant to the added scandal of an early morning duel. My sister's good reputation would never have survived unscathed. His cousin, Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam, was such a hothead. He persisted even to the present day in going on and on about hunting down the nefarious George Wickham. His intention was to exact his own brand of punishment for the scoundrel's offences against young Georgiana Darcy. The second son of Darcy's uncle, the Earl of Matlock, Richard enjoyed little in common with his cousin when it came to such matters. Fortunately, Darcy's temperament was calm and cool, and indeed had won out. Months had passed, and yet it might have happened just yesterday, so fresh was the memory which haunted him. The guilt of the self-recriminations. What that I could have taken better measures to protect her, said Darcy. Stop blaming yourself. You could not possibly have known what he had planned. For the life of me, I never thought he would make Georgiana a pawn in his schemes. My God, she is barely sixteen. Shaking his head, he said, too young to understand the implications of what she had done, and yet old enough to presume my motives were entirely selfish, having nothing to do with my desire to protect her, and everything to do with my supposed jealousy of him. You must give her time to come around to your way of seeing things. Oh, I should have known better. Kept him away from my sister. Then she and I would not suffer this gulf between us. Darcy brushed his hands over his face. I have seen him with other young ladies. I know firsthand what he is capable of, having been forced to make amends on his behalf countless times over the years. I remember well. What I fail to comprehend is why you even bothered at all. What is this power he holds over you? He has made your life miserable for as long as I can recall. Since you were boys. Darcy said nothing. He cocked his head slightly. His mind drifted to that faraway time. Things were not always unpleasant between Darcy and George Wickham. For a time, they were as close as could be, almost as close as... Darcy sat up straight and alert. He dared not complete his thinking. Whatever is this hold he has over you, I suffer no such soft spot for him. My deep regret is my not having done everyone a favour by calling him out and killing him, rather than allowing your lesser retribution of banishing him from Pemberley. 
I would much rather you banish this line of thought. Darcy ran his hands through his hair. He shifted restlessly in his seat. Will you not tell me what is troubling you, cousin? Darcy's chest muscles tightened, the same as always when he was forced to recall one of the lowest moments in his life, his father's death. It had happened six years ago. More than the loss of his father stood out in his mind. So did all the pain of missed opportunities, regrets of the past, and sorrow over what would never be. Darcy also had to contend with his father's last words. I bear this horrible secret, something my father said when on his dying bed. Words to the following effect, that I must look after Wickham and do my best not to forsake him. He said there was a reason he held Wickham in esteem. Certainly there were more important matters you two may have discussed besides George Wickham's fate. Those were my sentiments. Father had been unconscious for days. Then, in a moment of consciousness, he called me to his bedside. He said that he always loved me best, though he had not always shown it. He looked at me, pleadingly, and said, Try to understand my reasoning, son. George's birthright was to be raised at Pemberley, to enjoy the same privileges as you. He, too, is a Darcy. George is your... Recollection of his father's suffering gripped him. Darcy stood and walked across the room before continuing. After having said as much, my father gasped his final breath. Richard sat up straight in his chair. Those were his last words? Your... Do you suppose it is possible your father was admitting that he had sired a bastard child? If it were so, that would make Wickham the heir to Pemberley, would it not? Hardly. Even if he is my father's... Words that had never flown from his lips were unlikely to sprout forth now. Even if it were the case, he would have no legal standing. I am my father's only legitimate son. Trust me, Richard, I have investigated this from every angle. I wager you have not considered this angle. What if your father had secretly married before he met your mother, let us say, to a woman of low standing, and that marriage begot Wickham? Then the first wife died. Better still, she is alive and insane and dwells in one of the far wings of Pemberley. Darcy's increasing ire for his cousin ruffled him, thus easing some of the pain of his memories. Pray, Richard, rein in your eager imagination. Do you think my father was capable of such deceit? No. However, there is the matter of your grandfather. Tales of his ruthless nature persist even to this day. By all accounts, scandal of any kind was his abhorrence. Rumour has it that there was nothing he would not do to protect Pemberley's legacy. Darcy raised his brow. <laughs> the operative word being rumour. Indeed, but rumours do not originate without cause. Something instigated such speculations, and many have perpetuated them. Say what you like. Deception is at the root of your father's dying words. I suppose you think you are helping me, Inspector. I am always at your service. I might point out one other thing for you to ponder. Tossing the legal aspect of this situation with Wickham aside, what of the moral aspect? Thus you understand my quandary where he is concerned, why I have felt responsible for his actions. Oh, heavens! The implications of what might have occurred had he successfully eloped with Georgiana are unthinkable. Are you certain he did not take advantage of her? I have Georgiana's word that nothing untoward occurred between the two of them. I have also lost her good favour in having exiled him from Pemberley. I pray some day she will understand. So you have not said a word to her of your father's deathbed confession, or rather, your suspicions? Of course I have not said anything. I have kept my suspicions to myself. What would I say? Should I confess my fear that Wickham may be our illegitimate half-brother? I would never saddle Georgiana with such a notion, especially since I lack proof. Your father said he was a Darcy. He did not say he was his son. What other explanations exist? Look, Richard, I know where this is leading. Should I find proof that he is a Darcy, my father's bastard son, I shall know how to act. Until such time as that, I prefer to give Wickham as little thought as possible. 
Even if he is a Darcy, he is a lowlife who is unacceptable for polite society. I pity the unfortunate people in whatever town he decides to pitch his tent next, as it were, said Richard. Certainly no more than I. Wherever he turns up, I fear it will mean certain trouble for some unsuspecting town. I count my blessings in being able to leave Georgiana in Lady Ellen's care while I visit my friend Charles Bingley in Hertfordshire. I dare not leave my sister at Pemberley even with her companion Mrs. Ansley for such an extended amount of time. Though it is doubtful he will ever show his face at Pemberley again, I know with certitude that Georgiana will be safe from Wickham's reach here in Matlock. I could not agree more, said Richard. With that said, it is best to say as little to your parents as possible about why I insisted upon having Georgiana stay with them. The less they know about Wickham's treachery and Georgiana's shame, the better. Moreover, say nothing about my suspicions of Wickham's lineage. Of, of course not. It goes without saying. So what do you suppose has become of him? I do not know, nor do I care. My greatest fear is that he will show up when least expected and pull me back into his drama once again. Your burden is heavy indeed, cousin. You have my heartfelt sympathies. I only wish there was something more I could do to ease your load where George Wickham is concerned. I have carried the burden of my father's dying words with me for far too long. I feel better just having talked about it. Thank you, cousin, for listening. Darcy walked to where Richard sat and laid a hand on his cousin's shoulder. Though I do not always say it, it is times like this when family means most. Chapter 2 Hertfordshire, November 1812 Cursing his luck, Darcy stormed off the ballroom floor. It was disturbing enough that George Wickham had shown up in Hertfordshire of all places. Somehow he had ingratiated himself with the inhabitants of the country town, most notably Bingley's closest neighbours, the Bennets of Longbourn. With one exception, each of them, from the mother to the youngest daughter, seemed enamoured of the scoundrel. The exception, the eldest daughter, Miss Jane Bennet. No, she has cast her net for bigger fish. At least she is sensible in that. He had thought the second eldest daughter, Miss Elizabeth, more sensible than her actions suggested. So much so, he had requested her hand for a set. <laughs> what a mistake! Darcy reached for a glass of sparkling champagne from a passing servant's tray. How dare she! Defending George Wickham to me! Insinuating that my implacable resentment is founded upon a lack of character and malicious intent! From the moment he had come across the wretched scoundrel on the streets of Meryton a few weeks earlier, the hint that something unsavoury was afoot had filled the air. He looked about the assemblage of locals gathered about his friend's ballroom. The villain was supposed to be at the ball. Bingley confirmed earlier that he had indeed extended an invitation, and Wickham had possessed the audacity to accept. "'Where is he?' Darcy said, muttering aloud. Just at that moment, the two youngest Bennet girls skipped along, arm in arm, headed straight towards him. One of them carried a cup of punch. Unable to think of them by any other appellation, Darcy had named them Cilia and Silliest. The third eldest, the one who fancied herself proficient on the pianoforte, he nicknamed Silly. He stepped aside, but not soon enough to avoid the girls altogether. Bright red punch splashed all over his finely tailored jacket. Cilia clasped her hand over her mouth, yet still failed to suppress her hysteria, whilst Ciliest, the youngest and by far the flightiest, mindlessly dabbed at his lapel and did her best to contain the damage. Oh, Mr. Darcy, I'm dreadfully sorry. Those around them observed her antics, making the situation worse. Some did not even try to hide their mirth. How dare she subject him to such folly? He took out his crisp white handkerchief and patted it against his jacket. Young lady, I am quite capable of attending myself. Pardon me. Their subsequent fit of inane giggles earned them a scowl. After bowing and turning away, he heard one of them say, Whatever is wrong with Mr. Darcy? Oh, let us pay him no mind, the dour man. <laughs> I'm sure he's still smarting because I asked Mr. Bingley to have a ball. <laughs> <laughs> we are most likely interrupting his bedtime. The giggling grew louder. 
the irony of their sentiments did not fall short on Darcy. How is it that girls of their age are even out in society? What easy prey for the likes of his, for the likes of George Wickham. Then again, they seemed safe enough. As best he could tell, Wickham had only one of the Bennet daughters in his sights, Miss Elizabeth. On his way upstairs to change his jacket, Darcy observed his friend Bingley attending Miss Bennet. History enjoyed repeating itself, for this was not the first time he had seen his friend so besotted. Beautiful buxom blondes with angelic smiles tended to have that effect on his young friend. He distrusted Miss Bennet's motives almost from the start. Imagine her scruples or lack thereof in showing up at Netherfield on horseback in the midst of a storm. She was bound to fall ill. Of course, he could hardly credit such devious motives to Miss Elizabeth's arrival the next day. Her concern for her sister was genuine. She is devoted and selfless. What a formidable young woman she would be if she were not attached to such a family. By the time he returned downstairs, Darcy's head was full of the charming young woman. Oh, just when I thought I had mastered my strange attraction to Miss Elizabeth Bennet, one dance leaves me as confounded as the day she left Netherfield. What a relief it had been when her mother showed up to bring them home. The danger of her presence had ruffled his equanimity for far too long. When the time had come to hand her into her carriage, he had done so with a sense of triumph. How is it even possible for one woman to both excite and incite him at the same time? Her vexatious words on the dance floor lingered in his mind. What was it that she said about sketching my character? Perhaps I showed too little patience with her. She is young and likely has never had to withstand the charms of a scoundrel the likes of Wickham. Of course she believes his package of misinformation and falsehoods. She certainly is not the first. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours. He had uttered those words as a cold rebuke, but, truth be told, he meant every word of it. He feared that, if the situation called for it, he would do nearly anything for her. In the span of a few weeks, she had captivated him like no other woman before. It would not do. He could not wait to leave Hertfordshire and in so doing escape the beguiling country miss forever. She would be nothing more than a disturbing, albeit pleasant, memory. First, he owed it to his own sense of integrity to make amends for his earlier conduct, and if she would allow, persuade her that Wickham was unworthy of her trust. My behaviour on the dance floor did not represent my finest moment. Darcy needed to look for her and apologise. They need not be at odds, not over her lack of understanding regarding his character, especially if Bingley was determined to fall into Mrs. Bennet's carefully laid trap and find himself married to her eldest daughter. The fresh, crisp air did wonders for Elizabeth's mortified nerves as she stood on the terrace and beheld the magnificence of the night's starry sky. What a night it had been, and the ball had barely begun. Which had been worse, her sister's silly behaviour, her ridiculous cousin, Mr. Collins's insistence that he would be by her side throughout the evening, or Mr. Darcy's singling her out amongst all the women in the room for a set? She had sworn to loathe him throughout eternity, not stand across from him on the dance floor in front of all of Meryton. How it vexed her that they had spent much of the dance at odds. Their time together on the dance floor would have passed much quicker had their repartee been harmonious rather than contentious. She smirked in the face of such musings. As if such a thing were conceivable. He has never looked at me once except to find fault. Not handsome enough to tempt him indeed. Elizabeth looked up at the night sky and watched as the clouds danced across the moon. The night had held such promise. Her thoughts in preparing for the evening had been centred on one particular gentleman. He should have arrived by now. An evening of gaiety with the dashing Mr. Wickham was just what she needed to take her mind off her troubles. Her mother had been none too subtle in putting Mr. Collins forth as a prospective son-in-law all week. One of five siblings, all daughters, Elizabeth had grown up with certain truths. 
her family's estate was entailed away from the female line. At least one of the Bennet sisters needed to marry well. Mr. Collins, a distant relative, stood to inherit everything. Endeavouring to amend for the fortuitous circumstances of his birth, he aimed to make one of his fair cousins his bride. He had made his preference known almost as soon as he had arrived at Longbourn earlier that week. He had chosen Jane. However, Elizabeth's mother, whose mission in life was to get her daughter's husbands, had made it clear that Jane was soon to be engaged, and thus offered Elizabeth, her next eldest offspring, instead. Hm, that will be the day. I think my mother is correct as far as Jane is concerned. Bingley likes her. It is only a matter of time before he offers her his hand. He would be a fool to do otherwise, for Jane likes him just as much. That must certainly raise all our fortunes. Elizabeth smiled warily. One might think such aspirations are mercenary. However, one thing is certain. If a woman must fall in love and marry, she is just as likely to be happy with a rich man as a poor man. Good sense only dictates that she must choose the former. Once again, her favourite admirer, Mr. Wickham, graced her thoughts. So very pleased was she on the day of their initial introduction. His appearance was greatly in his favour. He had all the best part of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and a very pleasing address. If he had but one fault, it would be his lack of fortune. Yes, he was handsome and amiable, but a woman would be imprudent to consider him a prospective husband. Had he been given the living he ought to have had, his prospects would be considerably more agreeable. Elizabeth exhaled. Oh, hopeless romantic. Thy name is... The gentleman of her musings suddenly stepped out from amongst the shadows at the farthest end of the terrace and walked towards her. Oh, sir, you should have made your presence known. Oh, forgive me, but I would have done nothing to disturb your beautiful countenance. Gaiety replaced what theretofore had been tedium. He always knew what to say to make her smile. Oh, you startled me. I welcome your company, sir. The few clouds that had dotted the sky gave way to the brilliance of the full moon. As the moon brightened, so did her spirits. He came. The evening promised to be a gay occasion after all. I thought I might not see you this evening. Oh, would you have been very disappointed had I not come? I think I would have been, sir. <laughs> I could never stand to disappoint you, hence my presence. I pray you have saved room on your dance card for your favourite bow. My favourite, Mr. Wickham, whatever gave you such a notion? <laughs> a man knows these things. Out of nowhere, Mr. Darcy approached them. Mr. Wickham recoiled. What audacity, interrupting private conversation! His harsh, rebuking stare sent Mr. Wickham on his way. Next, the haughty man fixed his gaze upon Elizabeth. Dark, chauvinistic eyes pierced hers, cautioning, challenging, chastising her. Again! Pardon me, Miss Elizabeth, I require a word with you. Chapter 3 The unmitigated gall of the haughty, disdainful man. Only he would do such a thing. She clenched her fists at her sides. Miss Elizabeth, I encourage you to come back inside. I have a matter of grave importance I wish to discuss with you. If this matter concerns Mr. Wickham, then you need not bother. It troubles me when I see you speaking and behaving so intimately with George Wickham. If you knew his character, then you would understand he is no gentleman. I know from experience that the man is capable of all manners of vile misdeeds. You would be wise to keep your distance from him. Mr. Darcy, I am well aware you do not care for Mr. Wickham. You need not go out of your way to remind me on every possible occasion. I do not care for him with good reason. So you say. The truth is, I have only ever heard two people speak ill of Mr. Wickham's character. You are the first, and the second is your particular friend, Miss Bingley. Why, her worst allegation is that he is the son of a steward. Mr. Darcy flinched 
giving Elizabeth such satisfaction. If she knew anything at all about the haughty gentleman standing before her, it was that Miss Bingley's excess of fawning over him vexed him exceedingly. Miss Bingley is as ignorant of Wickham's true character as the rest of the people in Hertfordshire. The fact is that I have been cleaning up for his misdeeds for as long as I can recall. I do not mean to stand by and allow your family, and most importantly, you, to become his next prey. His misdeeds? Oh, surely you jest, sir. Mr. Wickham has provided a vastly different account of your past. I have no doubt. He is an accomplished liar. That and the fact that he is blessed with such happy manners render him quite the charmer. Do you deny you went against your own father's wish that Mr. Wickham should have the living in Kimpton? Darcy crossed his arms and regarded her pointedly. His charge is but a small facet in a complicated situation. If you hear me out, I think you will understand my motives. Oh, it is just as I suspected. Forgive me, Mr. Darcy, but I have heard all I care to on this matter. If you will excuse me, I have no further wish to continue this conversation, and I very much wish to remain out here a while longer, alone. Miss Elizabeth, please. Here you are, Mr. Darcy. Bouncy orange feathers soon appeared out of nowhere. I have been looking all over for you. You promised me the next set. You do remember? Elizabeth had never been more pleased to see Miss Bingley than at that moment. Darcy's brow creased and his stance tensed as she laced her arm through his and tugged at him to accompany her inside to take their places on the dance floor. You and I are not finished. I have much more to say to you he said to Elizabeth. On the contrary, Mr. Darcy, our conversation is over. I thank you for your consideration, but I think I am a far better judge of character than you have allowed. He opened his mouth to protest. Leave, Mr. Darcy. Clapping his hands, Mr. Wickham emerged from amongst the shadows as soon as Mr. Darcy and Miss Bingley were out of sight. Oh, bravo, Miss Elizabeth. I am honoured to be championed by such a lovely member of the gentle persuasion. A man could not wish for a more passionate advocate. He raised her hand, removing the glove and tucking it under his armpit. He brushed her knuckles with his lips. I did nothing that anyone who knows your plight would not have done, sir. <laughs> I beg to differ. Rarely has anyone stood up for me the way you did with Darcy just then. You have made me realise how precious it is to have a staunch defender in my corner. What is more, I wish that it will always be that way. The seriousness of his tone did not bode well. Mr. Wickham, you and I are such good friends. I have no reason to suppose that will ever change. True. However, there comes a time in every gentleman's life when mere friendship is not enough, especially when met with a woman as wonderful as you are. Miss Elizabeth, it would give me immense pleasure if you granted me the honour of accepting my hand in marriage. Astonished, Elizabeth said nothing. Still holding her hand, he said, I take it by your silence that you are amazed. You are no more stunned than I am, I assure you. Think about it. You and I are very fond of each other. You are my match in every way. He clutched her hand against his chest. Shall I speak to your father? Oh, speak to my father? She pulled her hand away and placed it on her forehead. Oh, please tell me that I am not hearing him correctly. Have I been so reckless as to persuade Mr. Wickham that I value him as anything other than a dear friend? Have I given him to think that I might be expecting his declaration? Elizabeth recalled as best she could the few times they had ever been in each other's company. What was it that she might have said or done to lead to her present discomfort? Miss Elizabeth, he said, effectively disabusing her of the hope that she was dreaming. Your father... Elizabeth looked at him straight in the eye, searching for some indication that he was merely speaking in jest. She encouraged him to surrender her glove. Putting it on, she said, Mr. Wickham, 
If I supposed for one instant that you were serious, then I would be obliged to thank you for the honour of your consideration. I would then have to tell you no, and in no uncertain terms. He reclaimed her hand. <laughs> I understand it is the habit of respectable females to suspend a man's request for as long as possible before yielding. <laughs> I am not opposed to allowing you some time to consider my proposal before you say yes. She jerked her hand from his affectionate grip. Do you think for one moment that I would accept the proposal of a man who has confessed his inability to provide for his own needs amply? A poor foot soldier is how you described yourself. How on earth do you intend to support the added burden of a wife, a family? Firstly, you could never be a burden to me. He reached for her hand again, but she stepped away. He moved closer. Secondly, you should not underestimate me, my dear Elizabeth. I am not a man without prospects. I have a feeling it is only a matter of time before my ship comes in. And until such time as that, what are your intentions as regards a wife? Where would you go? Where would you live? <laughs> I have given this a great deal of thought. I find that uh, life in the militia does not suit me. He straightened the sleeve of his scarlet uniform. I have a much higher calling than that of a lowly foot soldier. I am resolved on quitting the militia. I propose... We reside at Longbourn. <laughs> Surely your father will welcome a son to help him with the management of his estate. <gasps> you are ridiculous. Oh, I am a man in love. Elizabeth walked away and leaned slightly over the stone balustrade. Her busy mind grappled with confusion. What is he thinking? What might I have done to lead him to think I would consider his hand in marriage? Surely he is not serious. He is... Elizabeth's heartbeat raced to her throat when he placed his hands on her bare shoulders. Turning abruptly, she found herself in his arms. She placed her hand against his broad chest and tried unsuccessfully to force some distance between them. Lips pursed, he leaned down. His face crept closer to hers. It would not do to be discovered in such a compromising position with him. Elizabeth ducked her head in time to thwart his intentions. He grasped her arm, slowing her efforts to escape his presence. Elizabeth wrenched her aching arm from his firm grip. Freed, Elizabeth ran as fast as she could, straight into Mr. Darcy's arms. Miss Elizabeth! Oh, of all people to see her in such a state... Her humiliation increased tenfold. His countenance took an abrupt turn from unaffected concern to outright horror. Elizabeth then noticed what had shocked him so. The sleeve was ripped at the seams from her torn gown. She gasped aloud. In her eagerness to flee Mr. Wickham's presence, she had not even realised the mishap. What must Mr. Darcy think of me? Darcy removed his jacket with alacrity and placed it about her shoulders. Looking around to confirm that no one else had noticed her tattered attire, he took her by the elbow and led her into a quiet corner of the room next door. Tears filled Elizabeth's eyes as remorse overcame her. Darcy cupped her chin with his hand and gently lifted her face to gaze into her eyes. What happened? Who did this to you? Did Wickham? The sound of her mother's voice cut him off mid-sentence. Elizabeth's heartbeat raced. She looked at him pleadingly. Oh, my mamma must not see me like this. Before either of them would have supposed, Mrs. Bennet approached her daughter. Lizzie, there you are. Mr. Collins has been asking for you. Where have you been? One would think you were avoiding him when you know he intends to marry you. Once Elizabeth lifted her hand to wipe her tears away, her mother took note of the tenuous situation. Mr. Darcy, what is the meaning of this? What on earth are you doing standing here with my daughter? What have you done to her? Excuse me, Mama. I fear you are... The touch of his hand on hers silenced her words. What on earth is he thinking? 
Mrs. Bennet, I accept full responsibility for what has befallen your daughter this evening. By her mother's countenance, Elizabeth did not know which of them was most startled by his declaration. Her mother's eyes widened as she covered her mouth with her hand. What exactly are you saying, Mr. Darcy? Your daughter and I will be married. Elizabeth's mind tumbled over the gamut of alternatives before her. Papa will be furious if he learns of what Mr. Wickham has done. There are but one or two avenues he might pursue. I scarcely know which would be worse. He might seek to avenge my honour, or he might insist I marry the gentleman. Either of the two was a real possibility, and neither of them boded well for her future security and happiness. Mamma is adamant already that I marry the odious Mr. Collins. Papa would be unwise to insist otherwise in light of my shame. I cannot, I will not marry my ridiculous cousin. But why should Mr. Darcy accept culpability, especially since he does not even like me? Mrs. Bennet placed her hands on her hips. Why, of course you will marry. Oh, I have not the faintest idea of what occurred this evening, but by the looks of my daughter, there can be no other remedy. You, sir, had better speak to Mr. Bennet. She embraced her daughter. I shall take care of everything, my child. As Mrs. Bennet ushered her away, Elizabeth turned to look back at Darcy. Darcy said, Miss Elizabeth, you and I need to talk about what happened. Halting Elizabeth and her steps, Mrs. Bennet turned and said, And you will, Mr. Darcy. She drew Elizabeth closer in her arms. You shall have time enough to talk about this tomorrow. My daughter clearly is overcome with joy, are you not, my dear? Elizabeth was speechless, motionless, and not even capable of nodding her head. What was happening to her? There, you see, Mr. Darcy, the dear child is overwhelmed by your proposal, and thus will be returning to our home. We shall expect to see you tomorrow at Longbourn. I shall prepare a special dinner. Her mother's voice took on a tone of approbation. Of course, you are most welcome to come as early as you like. Once again, she turned to shepherd her daughter away. Elizabeth surmised her mother knew exactly what was afoot, and was determined to do whatever it took to prevent her from putting an end to the lunacy. Confirming Elizabeth's silent assertions, Mrs. Bennet added a little spring to her steps. Ten thousand a year! Thank heavens! We are saved! Come along, dearest Lizzie! In her confusion, Elizabeth turned to bestow on Mr. Darcy one last questioning glance. In so doing, she observed a rather chilling spectacle. There Mr. Wickham stood several feet away, observing everything. Chapter 4 If any man can show just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak. Gasping for breath, Elizabeth sat straight up in bed. She looked around the room dimly lit by the glow of the early morning sun. Same room, same bed, same lovely pictures that had decorated the fading blue walls of her room for the past decade. Placing both hands about her head, she released a heavy sigh of relief. Oh, it was just a dream! Contented, Elizabeth laid her head on the pillow and endeavoured to capture the last vestiges of sleep before starting her day. Mere moments later, a strong sensation of foreboding gripped her, ripping the lingering relics of sleep from her eyes and stirring panic in her mind. I am engaged to Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth threw the covers back and bolted from bed. I must speak with Mr. Darcy. I shall not hold him to this impetuous declaration that we are to be married. As she hurried across the room to dress, she spotted her torn gown. Beside it, Mr. Darcy's black jacket. She intended to mend the gown herself before anyone noticed the damage, but what on earth would she do with his jacket? She picked up the finely tailored garment and ran her fingers along the fabric. Nothing my father owns compares to this. Its masculine scent of musk and spice summoned bits and pieces of her dream. 
vivid images of sights unseen, rocky cliffs, streams that decorated the unaffected natural beauty of the landscape. Pemberley. If there was but one troubling aspect, it was her inability to conjure Mr. Darcy's face. Oh, he was a handsome man. The lucidness of daybreak proved that fact irrefutable. She could see him so clearly, tall, dark, with strong, dimpled cheeks and cleft chin. However, in her dream, he was as faceless as the clouds. He is a complete stranger to me. Elizabeth resolved to speak with Mr. Darcy. Much like her, he too habitually arose early in the morning. Perhaps if she walked to Netherfield, she might accidentally meet him and talk before it was too late. Oh, decorum aside, this untenable situation must be rectified. No one would fault her for her breach of etiquette. After all, he was her betrothed, at least for the time being. First, she needed to escape the house undetected. Oh, too late. By the time Elizabeth made it downstairs, all she heard was her mother boasting of her neighbour's envy when she shared the happy news that her second eldest daughter would be married to Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley and Derbyshire. More than once she heard ten thousand a year tossed in for good measure. Elizabeth placed her hand over her heart, hoping to slow its rapid pace. What all had taken place during her absence? She had returned home in the carriage with Mary. The eldest daughter after Elizabeth, Mary had already had enough merriment for one evening and volunteered to accompany her. The rest of her sisters had remained at the ball. Unnoticed, Elizabeth stood at the doorway and beckoned her eldest sister's attention. Laying her napkin aside, Jane excused herself from the breakfast table and the two of them headed to the east drawing room to talk. After taking a seat on the sofa, Jane said, Lizzie, I can hardly believe it is true. You and Mr. Darcy engaged? Goodness, Jane, who else knows about all this? Why, all of Meryton knows by now. Mamma made certain that the news spread throughout the ballroom with alacrity. Oh, Jane, what shall I do? Do you know whether Mr. Darcy spoke to Papa after I left the ball? I do not know. By the time the news made its way to me, I saw no sign of either you or Mr. Darcy. Mamma said she sent you home with Mary so that you might rest after your ordeal. But I can hardly account for Mr. Darcy's going missing as well. Elizabeth buried her head in her hands. Her sister's words did not bode well. Pray, Lizzie, what happened to affect such a change in your feelings towards Mr. Darcy? I thought you did not like him. Rubbing her temple, Elizabeth looked at her sister and said, Jane, I hardly know where to begin. Everything happened so suddenly. Mamma mentioned your situation without going into any sort of detail. Did something untoward take place? Her sister took her hand. I know Mr. Darcy is the best of men, despite what you thought just yesterday. I can only imagine some sort of misunderstanding led to all this. Indeed, Jane, a big misunderstanding. But I really must speak with Mr. Darcy. Mamma should not have been so eager to spread the news. Oh, you know, Mamma, how could she possibly resist? A daughter well settled, married to the wealthiest man in Derbyshire? <laughs> this must certainly be a dream come true. Mr. Bennet opened the door and stole a look inside the room before entering. Mr. Bennet said, this is where you ran off to, Jane. The silver-haired, bushy-browed patriarch peered over the rim of his spectacles. We missed you at breakfast this morning, Lizzie. If I did not know better, I would think you were avoiding me. His sardonic wit never failed him in such times as this. No, Papa, I simply am in no humour for breakfast. Indeed. Jane, might I have a word in privacy with your sister? Jane stood to quit the room. Pausing at the door, she looked back at her sister. Her angelic blue eyes reflected her concern. "'I have reason to believe you were expecting this meeting,' said Mr. Bennet, the instant he and Elizabeth were alone. He took a seat across from his favourite daughter and waited for her to speak. 
Elizabeth swallowed. She folded her hands and rested them in her lap. Indeed, Papa. Jane said my mamma boasted of my newfound happiness to any and everyone at the ball who would hear. Indeed. But in fairness to your mother, what she intended as a hushed whisper here and there spread like wildfire. Mr. Darcy had no choice but to speak to me in light of the speed with which Mrs. Bennet's proclamation ran throughout the ballroom. The gentleman and I spent hours in company. However, my Lizzie, I must hear it from you. What is the meaning of this? Elizabeth said nothing. Lizzie, surely you are a sensible young woman, but did you not say mere days ago that you hated Mr. Darcy? In fact, you were rather fond of Mr. Wickham. I am persuaded were he able to provide for you, no doubt you would have welcomed his suit wholeheartedly. Instead, you accept the hand of the one man who has been responsible for Mr. Wickham's dire straits. Elizabeth bit her lower lip. I am not as enamoured of Mr. Darcy as I ought to be. However, I am certain that will change with time. I certainly hope so. I am relieved to hear you say so. It gives me a modicum of comfort, knowing that you are approaching this of your own will and with an open mind. However, can you respect him, especially in light of all that we have heard of his character? All that we have heard is what Mr. Wickham has said. Frankly, Papa, after what he has done, I begin to suspect his credibility. Why? What has he done? She had said too much, certainly more than she had intended. She was not about to tell her father what had happened the evening before, not after what he had just said about her fondness for Mr. Wickham. Oh, how she wished she had been more careful in her pronouncements. Suffice it to say, he is not the gentleman I thought he was. Well, it is just as I always knew it would be, my Lizzie, for you have not lacked your share of suitors. The proud, disagreeable Mr. Darcy, your affable cousin, Mr. Collins. Granted, neither of the two suitors compare with your Mr. Wickham. However, you are very clever. You chose wisely, for you could never expect Mr. Wickham to come around asking for anyone's hand in marriage. Rubbing his chin, Mr. Bennet said, It is far better he did not, for it would be only under the threat of scandal that I would even consider such a man for you, or any other of my daughters for that matter. This brings us back to your Mr. Darcy. I think he is honourable and respectable. Nevertheless, what of his attitude towards your family, your friends? I cannot bear to lose you, Lizzie. I fear that, once he takes you away from Longbourn, we might never be allowed to see you again. Elizabeth had not even considered such a prospect. Not that she had time to consider much of anything in the limited hours of her engagement. Surely Mr. Darcy would never seek to change me, to force me to give up my family, my friends. Would he? Perhaps I worry needlessly, my child, for what it is worth... Our discussion last evening gave me cause to think there is a great deal more of good in the man than he willingly shows. Your settlement is more generous than anything I might have conceived. Of course, with the suddenness of it all, he spoke largely in conjecture of what his intentions are and how he means to provide for you. Everything is yet to be put into writing, but rest assured that you will be well provided for, my dear Lizzie. Elizabeth remained quiet. She knew nothing at all about this man who already had commenced planning her future life. Mr. Bennet filled the silence with comforting words. I only hope you find happiness. My advice to you is to be cognizant of the fact that you both have a part to play in that regard. Yes, Papa. If I am to marry Mr. Darcy, then I shall be a good wife. Mr. Darcy will not regret his decision. Perhaps it will not be so unbearable. I am spared the prospect of a life with Mr. Wickham or Mr. Collins, and Mr. Darcy will be married to a wife who is everything of kindness. 
"'In fact, I might well kill him with kindness. "'I see no point in both of us being miserable.' Three miles away at Netherfield Park, the household was beginning to stir. Bingley had set off to attend his business in London at sunrise, leaving Darcy to contend with a very frustrated Caroline Bingley. He entered the breakfast room and spotted her sipping her coffee whilst pacing the floor, her burnt orange gown swishing from side to side. Save the footman standing at the breakfast buffet, no one other than Miss Bingley was present. Darcy moaned under his breath. Wonderful. When she saw him, she returned to the table and set her cup down. She then raced across the room to greet him. Lacing her arm through his, she led him to the table. Where did you run off to after our set last evening, Mr. Darcy? <laughs> oh, never mind all that. You will never believe what they are saying about you and that little chit, Eliza Bennet. Miss Elizabeth, Miss Bingley. She bestowed him a look of astonishment. Yes, yes, Miss Elizabeth, or whatever. That mother of hers has turned her sights from my brother and landed them squarely upon you, it seems. In light of the firestorm of gossip she ignited during the ball, it seems I am to congratulate you. <laughs> Smirking, she sipped her coffee. That is quite generous of you, Miss Bingley. I accept your felicitations. Caroline nearly choked on her coffee. The sight of it gushing from her mouth was most unbecoming. You mean to say that loon spoke the truth? That you and her daughter are engaged to be married? Darcy reached for the paper. Glancing over it, he calmly said, I know not why this comes as a surprise to you of all people. How long have you accused me of favouring Miss Elizabeth above all other women of my recent acquaintance? Was it not you who hinted of wishing me joy just weeks ago? Yes, but was it not you who said the Bennet daughter's chances of marrying men of any consideration in the world were materially lessened owing to their low connections? That you would sooner proclaim her mother a wit than allow for any beauty in Eliza Bennet? Yes, I dare not argue with you, said Darcy, between sipping his steaming hot coffee and perusing the latest headlines. However, things change. I have since regarded Miss Elizabeth as one of the handsomest women of my acquaintance. I shall be honoured to call her my wife. She should not have lingered outside the door of the parlour, nor should she have been amused by her mother's attempts to placate her cousin, Mr. Collins, by explaining somewhat awkwardly the muddled affair. She simply could not help herself. Even in such times as this, Elizabeth retained her sense of humour. Containing her mirth proved difficult. I beg you to consider my daughter Mary, who is next in line after Lizzie. As I think of it, she is far more suited to the life of a parson's wife than Lizzie. Elizabeth was inclined to agree. However, she would not wish such a fate upon anyone, especially not one of her sisters. The put-upon man tugged at his collar. Twisting his neck, he said, I beg your pardon, Mrs. Bennet, but I am not one to be passed around from one Bennet daughter to the next, supposing my luck will change. Elizabeth's dearest friend, Charlotte Lucas, walked up behind her and attempted to peer over her shoulder. My dearest Lizzie, what are you doing? Elizabeth laid a finger to her mouth. Oh, Charlotte, Mamma and Mr. Collins are at odds over just which of the Bennet daughters is left for him to choose. Both ladies trained their ears to the confusion inside the room. Mr. Collins, a tall, burly man of little sense but a great deal of self-importance, stood to take his leave. It is a great honour that I have bestowed upon my fair cousins, first Miss Bennet and then Miss Elizabeth. Now I think I shall take my chances elsewhere. Elizabeth grabbed Charlotte's hand and they raced around the corner. Ever prudent and sensible, Charlotte did not rejoice in the situation's hilarity as did Elizabeth. Charlotte said, My dear Eliza, I am afraid I am unable to visit at all. I have urgent matters to attend. As quickly as she had come, Charlotte left, leaving Elizabeth to ponder the urgency. It was just as well, for she too had pressing matters to attend. 
I must speak with Mr. Darcy. Moments later, she supposed she must have conjured him up, for after she donned her bonnet and shawl and opened the door, he stood there with his hand poised to knock. Mr. Darcy! Good morning, Miss Elizabeth. I... I... We need to talk. Elizabeth glanced over her shoulder, then quickly stepped outside and closed the door behind her. I am inclined to agree. We need to talk, but not here. Shall we take a walk? Should we not go inside first? Perhaps visit with your family? Is that your wish, sir? No. However, after the events of last evening, I think it is only proper that we adhere to expectations. On the contrary, Mr. Darcy, after the events of last evening, it is imperative I speak with you alone. Darcy extended his arm. I am your servant. Lead me, and I shall follow. Elizabeth crumpled her brow. Was he attempting to make light of her predicament? Accepting his arm, she walked with him down the steps and along the lane leading to the large duck pond. Nobody would bother them there. Why did you do it, Mr. Darcy? I beg your pardon, Miss Elizabeth. Why did you tell my mamma that we are to be married? In light of the circumstances, I do not see that I had a choice. Your mother was on the brink of hysteria, and I cannot say that I blame her. What happened to you in the short time after I left you on the terrace? Did Wickham return? Did he assault you? Elizabeth looked away. Yes, Mr. Wickham returned after you left, and... Well, yes. I mean, no, he did not. What I mean to say is, he and I... We... We had a huge difference of opinion, a misunderstanding, if you will. A misunderstanding? His raised voice held a measure of astonishment laced with contempt. Startled, Elizabeth took a tiny step back. Miss Elizabeth, you were frantic when you ran into me. Your gown was torn, ripped at the seams, and you dare to tell me that it was a misunderstanding? Elizabeth walked away and stared across the pond. How could she tell him the truth? How many times had he warned her about Mr. Wickham as late as mere moments before their misunderstanding? And that is exactly what it was, a misunderstanding. Somehow she had led the gentleman to think that she would welcome his proposal, welcome his advances, when all she ever meant to do was to enjoy his company. That, and rejoice in their mutual dislike of Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth would not share her shame with Mr. Darcy. He was just the sort of man who would take pride in having been correct in warning her against Mr. Wickham. Perhaps one day she would admit her mistake, one day when she had learned to trust him. But certainly not now. As I said, Mr. Wickham and I suffered a misunderstanding is all. Darcy walked up behind her and placed his hand on her shoulder. Gone was the ire. He now spoke with genuine concern. Why are you protecting him? Elizabeth turned to face him. Her demeanour prickled with defiance, brought on by his earlier rebuke. The better question is, why did you say that we were to be married when you knew that whatever my dilemma, you were not to blame? I have been used to cleaning up for Wickham's misdeeds for as long as I have known him. He is a scoundrel, a reprobate. Seeing you in such a state, first amongst my thoughts was that your father would be compelled to avenge your honour, or even worse, attempt to persuade the man to marry you. Elizabeth schooled her expression. She did not intend for him to know that he had hit upon her exact fears. As much as the idea of marrying Wickham might not repulse you, I can assure you that it would never have happened. That is, unless you have a comfortable dowry of at least ten or better still twenty thousand pounds. I could not bear to watch you suffer a similar fate as so many other young ladies he has taken advantage of, with promises of love and felicity, and subsequently discarded. You know nothing about me, Mr. Darcy. You never once looked at me, except to find fault. Must I remind you that you thought me only tolerable and not handsome enough to tempt you? He shook his head. You are mistaken. I do not look at you to find fault. He closed what little distance there was between them. 
I look at you because I admire you, and because I am attracted to you like no other woman before you. Darcy took Elizabeth's hand. I ask you to forgive me for my careless remark at the assembly. You are the handsomest woman of my acquaintance. As regards your first accusation that I do not know you, I am guilty as charged. You and I do not know each other as well as we should. However, all that will change. Elizabeth withdrew her hand. I am afraid you have me at a disadvantage, sir, for I have never supposed myself to be particularly attracted to you, and I have certainly never done anything to garner your good opinion. And yet you have my good opinion, and I am fairly certain that it is only a matter of time before you admit that you are indeed attracted to me. Mr. Darcy, I think you are mistaking me for Miss Bingley. No, you are mistaken. Miss Bingley epitomizes all that I disdain in a woman with her constant fawning and simpering. Whereas you, Miss Elizabeth Bennet, amaze me, and always leave me guessing what you will do or say next. Holding his hands loosely behind his back, Darcy said, Come, Miss Elizabeth, we are to be man and wife. Surely there must be something you like about me. You are not my cousin, Mr. Collins. <laughs> In fact, you are nothing like him. That speaks highly in your favour. Such a comparison as that is hardly a compliment. I say that with certainty, after having been forced to make his acquaintance last evening. Elizabeth suffered embarrassment akin to that at the ball, when her cousin had the audacity to approach Mr. Darcy and introduce himself. So, it is commendations you seek. Exactly. I expressed my deep admiration for you. You ought to remark on what a loyal friend I am, and how I would do anything in the world for those who mean most to me. There is that, I suppose. I do not mean to make light of our situation. The road ahead will be fraught with difficulties. There is the matter of your family, your lack of fortune and low connections. Truth be told, my own family will deem our marriage abhorrent. However, I shall not let their sentiments dissuade me. From this day forth, I commit myself to you. I shall do all I can to tolerate your relations as we spend time together over the coming weeks, or months even, should you desire a long drawn-out engagement period. Tolerate! Not that again! Was it too late to accept her cousin? Heaven forbid that you should find my family wholly intolerable, she said. I knew you would understand my predicament. Elizabeth held her tongue. It would not do to argue with Mr. Darcy, certainly not on the first day of their engagement. The notion of killing him with kindness was now infinitely more appealing to her. She smiled wryly. Speaking of my family, perhaps it is time we return to the house. I imagine everyone, especially Mamma, is eager to enjoy your company. Must we? I rather enjoy this time alone with you. This has been an unexpected yet pleasant surprise. Darcy reached out and tucked an errant curl behind her ear. His affectionate gesture caught her quite by surprise. For a moment, Elizabeth's spirits rose to playfulness. Indeed. However... Tolerance is often something that comes about with repetition, and I would not wish to deny you any opportunity to practice. That evening a large party gathered at Longbourn, Mrs. Bennet's way of celebrating her good fortune with her closest friends and acquaintances. The Lucases, the Phillipses, the Longs and the Greens were amongst the families in attendance. Mr. Collins, who had calmed since his earlier disagreement with the mistress of the establishment, was present as well. He was puffed up with pride. Soon enough, Elizabeth found out why. When they could, Elizabeth and her friend escaped to a quiet corner of the parlour. Dear Charlotte, you are engaged. This strikes me as being rather sudden, even a bit outrageous. Charlotte arched her brow. You are one to talk. No, I simply refuse to believe you. I find it too incredible. My news is no more shocking than yours. But Mr. Collins is ridiculous. Oh, Lizzie, 
We all cannot be as fortunate as you to have attracted the notice of Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley and Derbyshire. Mr. Collins is a respectable man with a good living. I shall have a comfortable home, and I wager I shall be just as contented as you shall be. Elizabeth shrugged. I dare not argue your point, Charlotte. Suffice it to say, Mr. Darcy's proposal was as unexpected as the prospect of the moon falling from the night sky. I am not surprised, dear Eliza. Whilst it is true he did not show his feelings as openly as did Mr. Bingley for Jane, any one who has ever paid attention to his obvious preference for you above all the other young ladies in Hertfordshire is not surprised at all. Elizabeth crossed her arms and glanced towards Mr. Darcy. In a lowered voice she said, It seems I am the last to have seen it. Perhaps you might have, had you not been so blinded with fondness for Mr. Wickham. Charlotte placed her hand on Elizabeth's arm and leaned closer. Speaking of which, how is it that you came to the ball with the express intention of dancing and basking in his adoration, and you left the ball engaged to Mr. Darcy? Oh, Charlotte, I fear there was a surfeit of misunderstanding that led to the events of last evening. I will only say that Mr. Wickham and I did not see eye to eye on a matter of grave significance as pertained to how each of us planned to live our lives. And now I would be perfectly content never to lay eyes on him again. Charlotte gasped. <gasps> That is not like you to utter such a thing about your favourite. Oh, pray what happened? Chapter 5 Some things remained best unspoken, even amongst the most intimate of friends. Surely Elizabeth would be obliged to marry Mr. Wickham should the knowledge of what he had said and done that evening on the terrace be generally discussed. Elizabeth trusted no one with that particular information. I dare not get into the details at the risk of besmirching anyone's character. Charlotte shrugged. Keep the details to yourself if you must, I shall not pry. However, I am glad you took my advice not to be a simpleton and allow your fancy for Mr. Wickham to make you appear unpleasant in the eyes of a man ten times his consequence. Elizabeth smiled weakly. Indeed. At any rate, I congratulate you on your good fortune, as you must surely congratulate me on mine. <laughs> Will yours be a long engagement? Her smile wavered. Mr. Darcy says that he is willing to wait as long as I would like, but I see no reason to delay it over long, and I would much rather get it over with. I am inclined to agree. As I told you before when discussing Jane's situation, there is time enough to get to know each other after the wedding. Oh, Charlotte, I was so sure it was Jane who would be engaged by now to Mr. Bingley. I know, Eliza. Perhaps there is still hope. He is expected to return from town shortly, is he not? I thought as much. However, in speaking with Mr. Darcy this afternoon about Bingley's intentions, he was particularly vague. One would think he does not want Mr. Bingley to return. Whatever gave you that idea... Exactly what did Mr. Darcy say? He hinted that he would soon be moving from Netherfield to the inn in Meryton. Hmm. I find it odd that a man of Mr. Darcy's stature would wish to trade the comforts of Netherfield for the inconveniences of the goose and crown. Those are my sentiments exactly. However, the Hursts and Miss Bingley are planning to return to town, and it is possible Mr. Darcy does not wish to remain at Netherfield in the Bingley's absence. I suppose that makes sense. Both ladies looked at Jane, who sat in a corner. The smile that graced her lips proved a stark contrast to the forlorn look in her eyes. Charlotte leaned towards Elizabeth and spoke in a hushed tone. I cannot speak to Mr. Darcy's intentions, but I am sure Mr. Bingley knows his own mind, and especially his heart. If he is in love with our dear Jane, nothing will prevent his return. Oh, I pray you are correct, Charlotte. Darcy and Elizabeth walked arm in arm along the garden path. Spending time in her company was becoming more and more pleasing with each passing day. 
Were it not for that family of hers, he would have had no qualms whatsoever that his impetuous proposal was anything less than a blessing in disguise. Fortunately, the excuse of the late autumn weather afforded him time alone with his betrothed, as neither was opposed to the cooler outdoor air, whereas her sisters, save the youngest two who were always content to walk to Meryton, wanted no part of it. "'My uncle and Aunt Phillips are planning a dinner party in our honour," said Elizabeth. Darcy grimaced. "'He would rather spend the evening doing hard labour. Not that he had any idea of what that was like.' He said nothing. Stopping, Elizabeth released his arm and crossed both of hers over her chest. You might at least try to be happy about it. Darcy clasped his hands behind his back and faced her. When is the party? The date has not been established. My aunt wanted me to speak with you, for she does not want to take anything for granted. His expression pensive, Darcy said, I am to return to town for a week or so. When did this come about, and when were you planning to tell me? There are several matters I must attend in town, and I am telling you now. Would your trip have anything to do with informing your relatives of your plan to marry me? No. When do you intend to visit your relatives to tell them about our engagement? Not right away. I prefer to wait until we are closer to the wedding date before letting my family know. Even then, I shall inform them by letter. Her expression stony, Elizabeth eyed him but a second before looking away. Did she expect him to rejoice in the prospect of announcing the news to his acquaintances? Trust me, it will be better this way. I am afraid certain members of my family, whose names I shall not mention for fear of conjuring them up, will make both our lives miserable, and I do not intend to give you an excuse not to marry me. The couple recommenced walking. Is it really as bad as that, Mr. Darcy? Yes. As I told you before, we are a very close-knit family. Much is expected in my choice of a bride. My uncle and aunt, Lord and Lady Matlock, fully expect me to choose a bride from amongst the aristocracy. Lady Catherine, on the other hand, expects me to marry my cousin, Anne. Elizabeth pursed her lips. Oh, yes, I seem to recall hearing that. You heard it from your cousin, Mr. Collins, no doubt. I am amazed that he has not apprised my aunt of our engagement by now. Perhaps he simply has not had time, what with his own engagement, and the inherent excitement of it all. Judging from what little I know of his character, I suppose Lady Catherine will know soon enough. I think I had better tell her myself. I shall write the necessary letters forthwith. I suppose you should. I understand your aunt is very formidable. Darcy furrowed his brow. Is your understanding formed based on something your cousin said? I can hardly imagine it. Actually, I heard of your aunt's temperament as well as your presumed engagement from Mr... Wickham. Yes. Darcy stopped in his tracks. He moved directly before her. Miss Elizabeth though I would much prefer if I never heard talk of that gentleman again. I suppose some mention of him is inevitable. However, I have spoken with him since that evening at the Netherfield Ball. I have made it clear to him that he is to go nowhere near you. She released a long, beleaguered sigh. Oh, I suppose the polite thing for me to do is to thank you for your gallantry, sir. But I assure you, you need not have bothered. I am in no fear of Mr. Wickham. You should be. Then our sentiments are aligned. Neither of us has any fear of his approaching you. The only difference is that I do not now, nor ever will, trust him. And apparently you still do. The two resumed their walk, ambling along with some distance between them in awkward silence. How his aloof demeanour vexed her that evening at dinner, for if the past week or so in his company had taught her anything, it was that he could be exceedingly agreeable, even charming when he wanted to be. Elizabeth could count the number of words exchanged between the two of them for the rest of the evening on one hand. Why is he so annoyed? Is it my fault that I cannot bring myself to regard Mr. Wickham with the same degree of venom as he obviously does? 
If I feel anything at all for Mr. Wickham, it is pity. Besides, Mr. Darcy hates the gentleman enough for both of us. Later, when it was time for Darcy to leave, Elizabeth walked with him outside. His stern expression gave her the notion that he intended to part with her in anger. As Elizabeth was not designed for ill humour, some conversation was in order. She took it upon herself to ease the tension with a bit of levity. Do you ever plan to return, Mr. Darcy? His eyes swept over her from head to toe. Staring at her intently, he said, You may count on it, Miss Elizabeth. Why would you ask such a question? You looked miserable all evening, as if you could not wait to free yourself from my presence. Darcy grinned sardonically. <laughs> you sound almost as though you will miss me. Not that I find fault with the notion, for I shall surely count the seconds until I see you again. Darcy raised her hand to his lips and brushed a kiss across her knuckles. You are insufferable. Ah, yet another admirable quality to add to your growing list of my good traits. He climbed on his horse and accepted the reins from the stable boy. Eyebrows arched, she looked up at him and said, So when shall I expect the pleasure of your estimable company once more? I shall surprise you. In a rare moment of frivolity, he placed two fingers to his lips and then blew a parting kiss. Farewell, Miss Elizabeth. Lady Catherine de Bourgh blew into Darcy's study with the force of a fierce windstorm, catching Darcy and apparently his footman by his rattled expression completely by surprise. Darcy nodded to his befuddled servant to close the door. Before he could stand to greet her properly, Lady Catherine swooped down in one of the leather armchairs in front of his desk. Good afternoon, your ladyship. What brings you to town? Her aristocratic chin held high, Lady Catherine said, What an absurd question! You can be at no loss, nephew, to understand the reason for my journey hither. Your own heart, your own conscience must tell you why I came all this way to see you. Her ladyship perched her crossed hands atop her walking stick and glared at him intently. What is this nonsense about your planning to marry Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Longbourn and Hertfordshire, Darcy? And how dare you inform me by letter? Taken aback, Darcy said, Did you expect me to travel to Kent to inform you in person? I expect you to put an end to this foolishness. Are you not aware that the young woman is my parson's cousin? As soon as her father dies, Mr. Collins may turn her family out into the hedgerow, should he wish it. Yes, your ladyship, I am quite aware of the entail on the Bennet family's estate. But what has that to do with my engagement to Miss Elizabeth? What of your engagement to Anne? The fondest wish of my dear sister was that you two should be married. Have you no regard whatsoever for your obligation to your family? My mother's wish in no way obligates me to marry Anne. The two of you did your part in wishing it. That is the extent of your power. Her ladyship's mouth gaped open. Why, I never! Forgive me my bluntness, your ladyship. The fact is that Miss Elizabeth Bennet and I are engaged to be married, and there is nothing to be done about it. Besides, it is not as though she asked me to marry her. I was the instigator, owing largely to a misunderstanding, if you will. You have no choice but to accept the marriage and give us your blessing. To do otherwise, to end the engagement, would cast dispersion on your own family and brand me as a scoundrel. Would you have others regard me as such? Then I shall travel to Hertfordshire and speak directly to Miss Elizabeth Bennet. I shall persuade her to change her mind. Darcy pursed his lips. Agitation stirred his ire. I would not advise that, Lady Catherine. You may not like it, but I have made my choice. I want to marry Miss Elizabeth. If you do or say anything to jeopardize my plans to marry her, you must then consider me a stranger, for I shall have nothing to do with you ever again. Her stern gaze withered. Then you are determined to do this foolish thing, to marry someone so beneath you in consequence that it is laughable, someone with such low connections, relatives in trade? Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? I dare say Pemberley has suffered worse fortunes, and yet it has survived. I have no doubt that Pemberley's legacy will survive my marriage to Miss Elizabeth. 
though despite her lineage, it's quite extraordinary. I may have to accept this, nephew, but I do not have to like it, and I certainly will not be giving you my blessing. I am most seriously displeased. Then shall I expect not to be welcomed at Rosings Park this spring? Oh, I shall expect you, nephew. Both you and this Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Mind you, she had better be all that you say she is, or I shall know how to act. Lady Catherine stood to take her leave. Whilst quitting the room, she and Colonel Fitzwilliam nearly collided. Richard bowed. Lady Catherine, move out of my way, Fitzwilliam. I take no leave of you or your selfish cousin, for I am quite certain that you are in favour of this nonsense of his to marry beneath him, and in so doing, break your own cousin's heart. Richard did a poor job of hiding his lack of disappointment. Too often he complained how he would much rather remain in town during Easter. Does this mean we are released from our annual visit to Kent, your ladyship? Lady Catherine pointed her walking stick at her nephew. I have had quite enough impudence for one afternoon, young man. I shall expect to see you both. I need not to ask what that was about, said Richard once Lady Catherine was gone. I would appreciate it if you did not. However... I am most anxious to hear of your engagement. Specifically, what does your engagement to Miss Elizabeth Bennet have to do with your would-be half-brother? After sitting in the same fashion for some time, Darcy stood to stretch his long legs. He then walked to the fireplace to stoke the red-hot cinders. Meanwhile, his cousin Richard walked to the liquor cabinet and prepared two drinks. I thought you would be over making light of that by now. I almost regret telling you said Darcy. Turning away from the fire, Darcy accepted his drink from Richard. Both gentlemen walked to their favourite chairs and made themselves comfortable. Oh, what would my life be if I did not have you to make sport of, cousin? Deciding instead to focus on the topic at hand, Darcy ignored his cousin's mocking retort. I would be hard-pressed to deny being attracted to Miss Elizabeth, almost from the moment of our acquaintance but I am certain I would never have acted upon my attraction, owing to her low connections. No doubt you are fastidious in that regard. She must be something. Indeed. So where does Wickham figure in your newly betrothed status? I found Miss Elizabeth in a state of confusion. Her gown was tattered, and she seemed quite upset. Whilst trying to learn what had happened to her, her mother came across us. The situation did not look good for either of us. Well, one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I found myself giving her mother assurance that I intended to marry her daughter. That does not sound like you to allow yourself to be caught up in such an entanglement. I knew Wickham had been the one who had taken advantage of Miss Elizabeth. I know him too well to think he would have possibly done the honourable thing by her. Heaven forbid he even be allowed the chance. She does not deserve whatever he had in mind. Hell, no young lady does. Well, it is not like you can go around saving every young damsel from the nefarious Wickham. Nor would I ever wish to. Though, as regards the Bennets, I will do whatever I can. I am not sure Mr. Bennet is up to the task of protecting his family, especially with Mrs. Bennet pushing the girls in the path of every unmarried man of means in town, the younger one in particular. Shaking his head, Darcy said, she is a stout, well-grown girl of fifteen who is already out in public. Her high animal spirits and heightened sense of her own importance render her just the sort of girl whom Wickham might trifle with, especially now that I have warned him against any association with the Bennets. That is where your friend comes into play. What time did you tell him to arrive? Richard looked at the clock. A few minutes remain before he is due. He finished his drink and stood to walk over to the bar for a refill. At present, I wish to know more about your betrothed. <laughs> she is charming, witty, and beautiful. Yet she is the most stubborn and perplexing woman I have ever known. She challenges me like no other woman before. When I am with her, I never wish to be parted from her. When we are apart, it is all I can do not to return to her side. I am most eager to finish my business in town. I know not whether to pity you or envy you, my friend. 
What of her family, her low connections? Oh, Richard, I hardly know where to begin. Aside from her father, a country gentleman with no fortune to speak of, as best I can tell, there are two uncles, both in trade. The mother is everything I abhor. She is scheming, and she is someone whom I find particularly vexing. No doubt, said Richard. Yes, well, she is hell-bent on an alliance between her eldest daughter and Bingley. Tell me about the eldest daughter. Bingley describes her as an angel, if that is any indication. And how would you describe Bingley's angel? She smiles too much. She reminds me of George Wickham in that, and I suspect her motives. It sounds as though the Bennets do not rank highly amongst your favourite people, Richard said, his brow arched. Indeed, I can hardly wait until Miss Elizabeth and I are married, that I might take her away from the influence of those people. She will blossom once she is far from that family of hers. Richard furrowed his brow. So that's what you intend to do, to break her ties with her family? I do. I advise you to tread lightly in that regard. Besides, it is hardly fair to paint her entire family as beneath your regard with a single brushstroke. After all, there are members of our family who leave much to be desired. That might be true. However, society looks far more favourably upon the oddities of the privileged. What is deemed uncouth in the lower classes is merely eccentric amongst those in our sphere. Richard pursed his lips and peered at Darcy through narrowed eyes. Do not look at me that way, said Darcy. Richard stretched his legs and said, That way? Darcy knew his cousin's sentiments all too well. Richard was a second son. As a second son, even the son of an earl, Richard knew the difference, the preferences that were afforded his cousin Darcy and his elder brother, the Viscount, solely by virtue of their birth. Though Richard had asserted on many occasions his wish to see an end to such distinctions, Darcy always counted on the simple truth that his own world views were the most lasting and profound. Thus, Darcy would never expect nor even wish to see any such change. This is the way it has always been and always will be, said Darcy. Yet any children you and Miss Elizabeth have will surely suffer irreversible ties to people in trade. How exactly does that fit your rigid cast view of the world? Miss Elizabeth may have ties to people in trade, but I hardly view them as inseverable. Once she assumes her role as mistress of Pemberley, she will see the wisdom in cutting those ties. Oh, I would not bet on it. It is her family you speak of. She is a very sensible young woman. I cannot wait for you to meet her. Then you might see for yourself why I hold her in such esteem. Richard leaned towards his cousin and said, When do you expect that will be? During the wedding, of course. I expect you to stand up with me. I thought you might reserve that honour for Bingley. After all... In a rather roundabout way, he has been the means of bringing you two together. I have received word from Bingley that he has business in the north which might detain him for weeks, if not months. I have no idea when he might return. The footman opened the doors. A uh, Mr. Simon Bartley is here to see you, sir. Uh, show him in. We have been expecting him. If anyone had told her a month previously that she would be sitting in her window seat longing for Mr. Darcy's company, she would not have believed them. Yet there she sat, looking, waiting. She missed him. Why she felt thus, she was hard-pressed to explain. However, the sentiment was too palpable to deny. She missed so many things about him. The way he went out of his way to make her feel special, the way he abided her younger sister's constant giggles when in his presence, his patience with her mother's sudden approbation. She even missed his brooding whenever he found himself unable to arrange things for his convenience. Every day since his departure she had received a daily reminder of his devotion. She walked over to her bedside table and reached for one of the flowers that had arrived the day before. He had better return soon. Any more flowers, and she would find herself deep in a floral sea. After tapping lightly, Jane paused a second before poking her head inside the door. I suppose I do not have to tell you whom Kitty just spotted headed this way. Elizabeth ran back to the window. She walked over to the mirror and checked her hair, 
pinching her cheeks. She called out to her sister, Jane, how do I look? Fear not, Lizzie. I believe your Mr. Darcy will find you exceptionally tolerable. Elizabeth turned to face her sister and smiled. Jane, you know he has apologised for that remark time and again. I know, and I am merely teasing. One only needs to spend a few moments with him in your company to know he likes you very much. Do you really think so, Jane? Lizzie, is Longbourn not awash in blooms? At this time of the year one can only imagine the expense he must have incurred. Mr. Darcy and I did not part on the best of terms. I suppose this is his way of atoning for his aloof behaviour that last evening at Longbourn. Or it might just be his way of expressing his affection. Jane, you are as determined as ever to see only the good in every one. Well, there is a great deal of good in Mr. Darcy, would you not say? I am afraid I am obliged to agree with you. He insists. Lizzy, I beg you to be serious. Your Mr. Bingley thinks highly of Mr. Darcy. What better commendation do I need? Jane lowered her eyes. Elizabeth reached out and touched her face. Jane, I am sure that Mr. Bingley will conclude his business in town soon, and he too will return. Actually, I received a letter from his sister, Miss Bingley. She says her brother is not to return this winter. Oh, Jane, I am sorry. Why did you not say something to me earlier? I did not wish to dampen your enthusiasm with my unhappy news. Now hurry downstairs. By now Mr. Darcy will have arrived. And I am sure you do not want to leave Mamma, Lydia and Kitty the task of entertaining him for too long. Of course you are right, but I have every intention of discussing this matter with you. Yes, once Mr. Darcy has left, we shall talk. When Elizabeth entered the parlour, her mother, her two younger sisters, and her betrothed found themselves a captive audience, while Mary entertained them with a new piece she had been practising on the pianoforte all week. Elizabeth quietly took a seat beside Darcy. More than the performance, she noticed with some amusement how restlessness stirred his long legs. He shifted in his seat. The soundless drumming of his fingers prompted Elizabeth to ease closer to him. Catching his eyes, she silently willed him to pay attention. When Mary's impromptu exhibition was over, Darcy leaned close to Elizabeth and spoke in a hushed, sombre voice. Is there somewhere we might talk in privacy? This seems serious, Mr. Darcy. I'm afraid it affects my plans for remaining here in Hertfordshire. Papa is out for a walk about the estate. Let us talk in his library. After making their excuses, Darcy and Elizabeth made their way to the other part of the house. Once inside, he lingered as he kissed her hand, then her palm. I have missed you. You cannot possibly imagine how much. Elizabeth was by now a flutter with a mixture of sensations, enticement, titillation. I have some idea. Truly, Miss Elizabeth? Yes, said she. Wishing to break the spell of his deep, penetrating stare, Elizabeth slowly withdrew her hand and focused her eyes away from his. Thank you for the lovely gifts. Darcy smiled. It was my pleasure. He then walked across the room. So what is it that you wish to discuss? I must return to Pemberley. Her smile waned. When? I received a missive whilst in London, informing me of the imminent arrival of my aunt in Derbyshire. Lady Catherine de Bourgh? No, Lady Alexandra Spencer. She is my father's sister. His only sibling, in fact. I have never even met her, and yet she has written to me informing me of her plans to take up residence at Pemberley. In truth, I can hardly wait to make her acquaintance. She must certainly be someone special. Elizabeth crossed her arms. I'm surprised, Mr. Darcy, that you hold so high an opinion of your aunt already, when you admit to having never met her. Her ladyship is my father's only sibling. She is a Darcy. I need nothing other than that I know and trust in the goodness of her character. What would have been the point in debating the merits, or lack thereof, of his argument? Elizabeth said nothing. So you will understand, I need to return to Pemberley and oversee this unfolding situation. If possible, I wish to be there when my aunt arrives. 
The good news is that it will allow you to have Christmas with your family without regard for diverting all your time and energy towards me. But, but, she had warmed to the idea of his being there at Christmas. For the first time, he would meet some of her relatives towards whom even he could have no objections. When do you think he will return? That is hard to say with certitude. He returned to her side, took her hand, and brushed his lips across her knuckles. Rest assured, my dearest Elizabeth, I shall return. Biting her lower lip, she withdrew her hand and walked over to a window. She gazed out at the nearby pond, her mind a turbulent storm of conflicting emotions. Hearing her given name spoken by him for the first time was comforting, reassuring. He had never before addressed her thusly. Yet it felt right. She had taken some solace in the notion that they would have ample time to get to know each other before meeting at the altar, but it had been with the knowledge that they would be always in proximity. What did this sudden lengthy separation portend? Darcy joined her and placed his fingers on the small of her back. She turned to face him, her eyes questioning, his imploring. They stood as close to each other as two young lovers could. He lifted her chin and brushed the pad of his thumb along her cheek, along her lower lip. A frisson of longing pierced her being. Her lips parted as he leaned nearer. The low creaking sound of the library's door opening impeded further headway, as not one but all four of Elizabeth's sisters entered the room. Taking little notice of the betrothed's comportment, Lydia and Kitty giggled profusely as they danced to Elizabeth's side, took her hand, and led her from the library. This left Jane and Mary to walk along on either side of Mr. Darcy, as they too left the room, with Mary's promise of an encore exhibition of the pianoforte. When she could, Elizabeth graced her intended with an apologetic smile. His expression, on the other hand, gave her to know he was not finished with his earlier conversation. Since their engagements, Elizabeth eagerly spent time with Charlotte whenever she was not busy consoling Jane and reassuring her of Mr. Bingley's affection or shielding her betrothed from her family's indelicacies. She and Charlotte had always been good friends. Now they were even closer. I am glad that you have come around to accept the merits of my engagement to Mr. Collins said Charlotte, as the two ladies walked outside. Well, as you have said, you plan to be very contented with him. Is it true that you plan to be married soon after Christmas? Yes, I think it is for the best. I am so looking forward to having my own home, and my family must be equally delighted to have one fewer burden. Enough talk of my situation. Pray, when do you intend to wed Mr. Darcy? Elizabeth focused her gaze into the distance. Mr. Darcy advised me of his plans to travel to Derbyshire in but a few days. It might be weeks, perhaps months, before he returns to Hertfordshire. What business dictates such a lengthy absence from his newly betrothed? His late father's sister, a Lady Alexandra Spencer, has notified him of her intentions to come to Pemberley. She has probably arrived by now. What has he told you about her? He has been rather evasive, except to say he has never even met her. She left Pemberley before he was born. However, she advised him that she intends to make Pemberley her home. Her voice, portending doom, Charlotte said, Her ladyship's timing works to your disadvantage. Elizabeth looked at her friend intently. In what regard? said she. Let me just say that if I were you, I would not wait to assume my rightful place as the mistress of Pemberley. You had much better marry Mr. Darcy as soon as can be and stake your authority, as it were, in your new home. Biting her lip, Elizabeth wrapped her arms about her shoulders. I know you are reluctant to leave the bosom of your family, especially your dear sister Jane, but Mr. Darcy is your family now. For all intents and purposes, your place is with him. I suppose you have a point. Just think, dear Eliza, your marriage to Mr. Darcy must certainly be of some benefit to Jane as well. 
Mr. Darcy and you will certainly spend the season in town, and what with being Mr. Bingley's closest friend, should Jane also be in London, there will be many occasions for her to be in Mr. Bingley's company. Elizabeth smiled wryly. <laughs> now, Charlotte, you are beginning to sound like Mamma. Does that mean you will heed my advice? Your advice certainly warrants consideration. Ample reason existed in support of Charlotte's assertion. Elizabeth suspected that her betrothed harboured some reservations as regarded a match between her sister and his friend. Surely he would have no such concerns once they were married, as Jane and he would be brother and sister. Elizabeth could hardly wait to put forth the merits of her scheme with her betrothed once they were alone that evening. Mr. Darcy, I have given the matter of our engagement a great deal of thought. I have decided I would rather we marry sooner than later. Her sentiments seemed to have caught him by surprise, judging by the rapid turn of his head. He looked at her curiously. Yes? I see no point in a lengthy engagement, especially if you plan to spend the bulk of your time in Derbyshire. Shall I presume to sketch your character by the frequent exchange of extensive letters? A measure of scepticism peppered with concern crept into his voice. I was under the impression you desired a long engagement. What of your mother's plans for a proper wedding, the wedding clothes, a lavish wedding breakfast? She even mentioned a new carriage. Then there is the weightier factor in our decision for a long engagement period, so we might get to know each other. I have since given it some thought. I find I am much inclined to agree with my friend Charlotte as regards the advantages of getting to know one's spouse after the marriage. Ah, yes, that would be your friend Miss Lucas, soon to be Mrs. Collins. The one and the same. She and Mr. Collins are to be married within the next few weeks. At least she practices what she preaches. Exactly, and since we are bound to learn the defects of the other eventually, we may as well begin as soon as possible, and at Pemberley. Miss Elizabeth, Elizabeth, are you quite certain you are ready to be my wife, in the truest sense of the word? Because if you are not, I am willing, nay, I insist, we wait. You sound like a man who is having second thoughts. Shaking his head, he said, oh, on the contrary. In fact, one of the purposes of my going to town was to finalise your marriage settlement, that and to obtain a special licence. So you see, we can be married at any time, as soon as tomorrow. Darcy reached into his pocket and retrieved a small velvet-covered box. I also brought you this. It belonged to my mother. When he opened the box, Elizabeth smiled as widely as a gentlewoman must certainly do when presented with such a magnificent gift. He removed the glove from her hand and slipped the ring on her finger. A perfect fit. I offer you this ring as a symbol of my ardent devotion. Elizabeth might have spoken had she not been so astounded by his declaration. He kissed her hand. I can hardly wait until the day when we begin our life together as man and wife. Man and wife? Sooner rather than later. Elizabeth's heartbeat intensified. Her chest constricted. As innocent as she was in such matters, the look in his eyes and the touch of his hand on her cheek told her that he meant to make her his wife in every way. Her mind raced through the gamut of depictions she had seen in London museums and in the books she had read, even in her father's library, the ones she suspected she should not have been perusing. Did she know what she was about? Was she ready to take that ever-important step? She exhaled, and all that such a life entails. Chapter 6 Elizabeth braced herself. Teetering on the edge of their seats was the order of the day, at least for the past hour. Surely no one had that particular route in mind when speaking of good roads. Darcy had delayed his trip to Derbyshire to allow Mrs. Bennet those extra days she deemed essential if her daughter were to have a semblance of the wedding the next mistress of Pemberley ought to enjoy. 
Consequently, the weather had turned, rendering the roads less fit for travel than he would have wished. You must allow me to apologise for the uncomfortable ride, Mrs. Darcy. Surely you do not believe I fault you, Mr. Darcy? Elizabeth smiled and resumed her vigil of the passing countryside outside her window. Even a carriage as impressive as the large barouf provided little comfort for her that late afternoon, and her discomfort had nothing to do with the condition of the road. He sat directly across from her, his long legs positioned on either side of hers, else his knees might rest against hers. Elizabeth had much rather he sat beside her. Then she might ignore his intent stare altogether, as well as the effects wrought inside her. Elizabeth placed her hands in her lap. What would his sitting next to her mean? No doubt he would wish to hold her hand at the very least, as he had made a habit of doing whenever they were alone. Mere days after assuring him that she indeed was ready to be his wife, there she sat, his wife. Her mother had thoroughly impressed the neighbours with the finest wedding breakfast one could imagine, what with such short notice. Netherfield Park's recently idled staff had been engaged to assist in the hastened preparations. Unfortunately, the suddenness of her plans had prevented her aunt and uncle Gardiner from being there, but Mr. Darcy's cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, had arrived in time to take part in the festivities. He was older than Darcy and not nearly as handsome, but in person and address he was truly the gentleman. Amiable and considerate, he entered into conversation directly with everyone he met with the readiness and ease of a well-bred man. Elizabeth liked him very much. She wished all her new Fitzwilliam relatives would be just as agreeable. Of course, her new Darcy relatives were the ones whom she worried most about. His young sister Georgiana and his aunt Lady Alexandra Spencer. Even if they were twice as kind as the Colonel was, the possibility that they might be half as haughty as her husband gave her pause. How she would miss her family! Saying goodbye was more difficult than she had imagined. At least she would see Jane soon. Her most beloved sister was all packed, and she fully anticipated returning to town with the gardeners after Christmas. Hours earlier, the two sisters had broken their clinging embrace with tear-filled eyes and promised to see each other as often as possible once the Darcys ventured to town for the season. After a loud crackling noise and a violent jolt, the carriage came to a jarring halt. Darcy reached out to brace Elizabeth when she tumbled forth. Are you all right? The last time she had heard such a startling commotion, she and her sister Jane, along with their father's manservant, found themselves on a lonely country roadside, stranded for hours whilst awaiting a fresh carriage to transport them to the nearest posting station. They had been on their way to town to visit their uncle and aunt Gardner. Elizabeth straightened her dishevelled attire and assured her husband that she suffered no harm. The driver stood outside the carriage and beckoned Darcy's attention. He whispered apologies to his wife, opened the door, and descended from the carriage. Elizabeth watched as the men walked around the vehicle studying the damage. Darcy returned. Without entering, he poked his head inside the vehicle and said, I apologise once again, Mrs. Darcy. We are unable to continue on in our carriage. We must journey on by horseback. Elizabeth tried and failed to hide her disappointment. I realise this is a very inauspicious start to your new life as Mrs. Darcy. He reached to assist her. The situation cannot be helped. I shall endeavour to make amends. Looking around to take in her surroundings, Elizabeth noticed one of the postilions readying the horses. I am afraid I do not ride horseback, Mr. Darcy. This time he tried unsuccessfully to hide his dismay. You shall ride with me. What was more unsettling, the prospect of riding such a large, fierce beast as his, or the prospect of doing so whilst nestled in his lap? Darcy smiled wryly. Fear not, Mrs. Darcy, our sojourn will be quick. A rather comfortable inn is several miles ahead. I did not plan to spend our wedding night there, but it cannot be helped. 
Heat spread over her body. She attributed her disturbance to the realisation that there would be others in their riding party. What else could it be? Surely the prospect of being in Mr. Darcy's arms did not trouble her, not in the face of what must certainly occur once they were alone that night. A quarter of an hour later found Elizabeth seated in front of Darcy atop a large steed. He placed his arm around her waist. Leaning forward, he spoke softly in her ear. Are you quite comfortable? Elizabeth's heart fluttered. His warm breath upon her skin brought to mind a gentle caress. She caught her breath, aiming to answer his question, but her words did not come. She turned to look at him. Why did she do that? Her body responded to his gaze in a manner her mind dare not conceive. She exhaled when he urged his horse to move forward in a slow gallop. When the riding party picked up the pace, Elizabeth shivered a little as the cold breeze enveloped her, even as his body's heat engulfed her. By the time of their arrival at the inn, Elizabeth did not know whether to curse herself for never having taken to riding or count her blessings. She had found his hand resting firmly around her waist pleasing, even arousing, and she suffered its absence the instant he jumped from his horse and reached to hand her down. For a fleeting moment she recalled the intrigue of his caress as he took all the time in the world lowering her to her feet, his hands on either side of her waist. The main room overflowed with people. They would be fortunate indeed to find accommodations. When the door closed behind them, everyone looked up. A sweeping silence filled the room as folks cleared a path whilst the Darcys made their way through the crowd. Darcy led Elizabeth to an uncongested area near a window, where a respectable-looking elderly woman sat. The man who sat beside her vacated his seat when it became obvious to him that Darcy intended that seat for Elizabeth. Elizabeth noticed him hand the man what she supposed was some sort of recompense for his chivalry. Please wait here, Mrs. Darcy. I shall speak with the owner and secure lodgings for the evening. Once Darcy walked away, the older woman shook her head. He will not meet with any success. My husband and I were told that we secured the only remaining room. Elizabeth smiled at the woman, hoping against hope that she spoke out of turn. That gentleman you are with bears the look of aristocracy. The woman looked at Elizabeth's clothing and frowned. Did he refer to you as Mrs. Darcy? Are you his wife? I beg your pardon, madam. Please do not misunderstand me, young woman. I only ask because of the stark contrast between you two. He carries himself as would a nobleman, whereas you... The pitch in Elizabeth's voice rose. Do you mean to give offence? Indeed, I do not. I mean only to help. If you must know, madam, the gentleman and I have been recently married. So you are newlyweds. When did the happy event occur? We married this morning. Ah, that explains it, then. That explains what, madam? Well, your attire, of course. Mind you, young woman, Mrs. Darcy, I hardly find fault with you. You are a new bride who has married beyond your sphere. You want for nothing that your husband's obvious wealth will not provide. Elizabeth's pulse quickened. What she did not wish to say to her nosy seating companion. She bolted from her chair when she saw Darcy headed her way. Thank you for your unsolicited advice, she said before taking her leave. You need not thank me, my dear. I live to help others. Perhaps my husband and I shall have the opportunity to dine with you and your husband, said the woman. I am sorry. You and I have yet to make each other's acquaintance, and I am certain my noble husband does not dine with strangers. Good evening, madam. Elizabeth approached Darcy and laced her arm through his. She ignored the questioning look her actions evoked. Have you any success to convey, or are we to spend our first night as man and wife under the stars? Darcy placed his hand on hers. Our plight is not as bad as that. 
I persuaded the innkeeper to make at least one room available. Elizabeth showed greater enthusiasm than his news warranted, owing to the fact that her nosy companion had her eyes and ears trained firmly upon them. What do you wish to do whilst the room is being prepared for our stay, Mrs. Darcy? I find it much too crowded. Do you mind if we have a walk outside? I know I will enjoy the fresh air. We will have a short walk, and then I will accompany you to the room. My men and I have business to attend to make certain we are on our way as soon as possible. Hours later, Elizabeth sat on the sofa and stared into the fire. The evening had not turned out as she had expected. Their first night was meant to be perfect. So far, it had been anything but. Her frustration was not assignable to the state or even the size of the room. The small accommodations were clean and comfortable enough, quite cosy in fact. She missed him. Without knocking, he entered the room and walked towards her. He sat beside her. I thought you might join me for dinner earlier, said Elizabeth her hands clenched in her lap. My business took longer than I expected. He stood and walked to the table and lifted the dish cover. You barely touched your meal. Was it not to your liking? I am not in the habit of eating alone, Mr. Darcy. His puzzled look did nothing to curry favour with her. This is hardly edible now. Shall I send for something more? Please do not trouble yourself on my behalf. I would suffer no trouble at all. May I offer you a glass of wine? It might help erase a bit of tension. Elizabeth thought an apology for his tardiness would do just as well. I'm not thirsty. Darcy blew out the candles on the table. The blazing fire cast a romantic glow over the room. He walked to Elizabeth and sat beside her. Brushing her loosened hair aside, he said, No but you are tense. Elizabeth stood. Oh, I am rather tired. It has been a long day. Standing before him in her undergarments stirred her self-consciousness. Surely the fire rendered her silhouette for his unfettered perusal. On the other hand, her attire was far less enticing than it might have been. The maid he had dispatched to her room had done her best to help her prepare for her wedding night. Unfortunately, Elizabeth's luggage, and thus the lovely silk negligee she had planned to wear that evening, was likely waiting for her many miles away at the finer establishment. Darcy stood, placed his hand on her chin, and brushed his lips against hers. He had kissed her just once before, earlier that day. It had been nothing like this. His touch was gentle to her skin as light as a feather and thoroughly intoxicating, a promise of more to come. Elizabeth, said he, the tenor of his voice rivaling the warmth radiating from the hearth. Shall we retire for the evening? Eager anticipation defied her equanimity. What was happening to her? Endeavouring to reclaim her composure, Elizabeth said, are you quite certain you will be comfortable here on the sofa, Mr. Darcy? He turned in time to miss the hint of a smile that played across her lips. He folded his arms and studied the bed in a manner suggesting it was the weightiest decision he had faced in his lifetime. At last he spoke. Granted, the bed is smaller than I am accustomed to. However, I believe we will manage. Her heartbeat quickened when Darcy took her by the hand and walked to the bed. The air crackled between the young couple. My lady, he said, as he pulled the covers back. He waited until she climbed in and then tucked the covers about her. He walked to the other side of the bed and began disrobing. Try as she might, Elizabeth did not look away. The entire night stretched before them and Elizabeth's courage was slowly rising. If he meant to challenge her, she fully intended to meet him head to head. Stopping just before removing his trousers, he climbed into bed. He looked at her for an endless moment before turning to snuff the candles on the bedside table. Good night, Mrs. Darcy. Good night? 
he placed his hand on her face and brushed his thumb under her chin. As you said, it has been a long day. Let us rest. Tomorrow will be even longer. What seemed hours ticked by before Elizabeth closed her eyes that night? So much for feigning tiredness. Two bodies melded into one. Elizabeth was awakened by the sensation of his firm hardness pressed against the protection of her muslin petticoat and his trousers. Ensconced in his arms, with her small hand resting atop his in an innocent caress of her bosom, she smiled. The softness of his breath against her neck tickled. She turned to face him. Why not? He was her husband, the man with whom she would spend the rest of her life. His long eyelashes rested against his face. His countenance bore the innocence of a child. Enough staring and wondering. She reached out to touch his face and traced her fingers under his cleft chin, just as she imagined doing so many times before. He opened his eyes. Her heart fluttered. Oh, he was beautiful. Darcy raised himself in bed. Good morning, Mrs. Darcy. Did you sleep well? Elizabeth's suddenly shy smiled. Yes. Darcy took that as an encouraging sign. He reached out and brushed her bangs aside. He simply stared longingly. What time is it? Combing his fingers through his hair, Darcy checked. The hour is early still. Why do you ask? What time shall we depart? Not for a while. We have plenty of time to... She wetted her lower lip. Too. I realize we hardly know each other. However, we are man and wife. I want to know you as a man should know his wife. But last night... Last night we arrived late. We were both tired from our journey. Darcy gently massaged her back. The fact is that uh, I am in a terrible state, and I dare not leave this room as such, else it will be a most uncomfortable journey. I fail to understand, sir. Darcy said, I dreamed of you this morning, long before dawn. I dreamed you were here with me. You and I were lovers, in love, exploring and cherishing each other's bodies. I dreamed I was making love with you, every part of you, everywhere, inside you and out. As much as I longed for you... You encouraged my ardent desire to make you my wife. He skimmed his fingers along her jawline. We can have that, you know. He bestowed a lingering kiss upon her cheek. We need not wait until we know everything there is to know about each other. We need not wait another minute for such pleasures afforded to married couples and ardent young lovers. We can have that now. Her heartbeat quickened. His soft voice was mesmerizing. Stirring her emotions into an intoxicating frenzy, his eyes never veered from hers. Her voice cracked. We can. He traced undemanding, tiny circles on the back of her hand with his thumb, in that same manner as he had done since their engagement began. Familiar, comforting, reassuring. Indeed. May I show you? He smiled at the soft intake of her breath. Any reservations she might have held wavered in the wake of his passionate assault on her senses. Her silence, her soft expression, her parted lips, all whispered acquiescence. What started as curiosity about his touches soon went from wanting his touch to needing his touch. Pausing, he asked if she wished to stop. She could not have stopped if she wanted to. Stopping was the last thing on her mind. Light knocks intruded upon Darcy's bliss-filled dream. He awakened to find his wife in his arms. Soft flesh spooned next to hard flesh. 
his impetuous declaration of their engagement had not been a mistake. Hers was the sweetest wine he had ever tasted. There would never be another woman for him. The healthy young man he was, he wanted her, needed her. He wished he could spend all day this way. All he wanted was to ignore the knocking and arouse his wife from her slumber with promising caresses and teasing kisses. Another knock insisted otherwise. Darcy reluctantly seeded his warm spot in bed with his wife, located his discarded breeches, and pulled them on. Having ignored the call of the house servants to enter the room earlier, Darcy danced across the cold floor whilst pulling his shirt over his head. He opened the door and saw his valet standing there. Waters, this had better be good. The short, meticulously attired man who had served him faithfully for the past seven years bowed. Indeed, sir, I beg you to pardon my intrusion. I would not have interrupted you otherwise. However, I wish to inform you that the carriage is repaired and is ready for departure. In addition, another room is now available. I have overseen preparations for your bath. Your room is just across the hall, sir. Good man, Darcy said before closing the door. He returned to the bedside to awaken Elizabeth. Her lush eyelashes, her slightly swollen lips, her contented smile were more than enough to tempt him to climb back in beside her. He leaned over and kissed her forehead. Better she should rest a bit longer until a maid arrived to attend her. Elizabeth stretched her arms above her head. The room was bright with the morning sun and warmed by the fire. She likened her euphoria to that of one who possessed not a single care. The contented smile on her face disappeared upon her discovery of being alone in bed. The intoxicating fragrance of the consummation of her marriage, the commencement of her new life, lingered, giving an explanation to her bliss. The familiar sound of morning chores gave her to know she was not alone. Elizabeth sat up in bed and watched as the kind young woman who had assisted her the evening before tended the fire. "'Good morning, Mom," said she. "'Good morning, Betsy,' Elizabeth said. "'Would you like anything before I help you prepare for the day?' "'No, I do not want to trouble you.' "'No trouble, Mom. It is my job.' She brushed her hands on her apron. "'I'm on my way to the kitchen. Will you be having breakfast in your room?' I cannot help noticing you barely touched your meal last evening. Not knowing where her husband went, or when he might return, Elizabeth was a bit disconcerted. Did he mean for her to take this meal alone as well? I suppose I might have a light fare. Very well. I shall return shortly, and then I will prepare your bath. Alone again, Elizabeth ran her hand across the pillow. His pillow. The feel of her husband lingered on her skin. She loved it. The theretofore unexplained aching she had suffered in the days leading up to her wedding, she now understood. The trace of disappointment she suffered in having awakened to find him gone gave way to wonderment. Already she looked forward to her second night as Mrs. Darcy, and her day had not fully begun. Chapter 7 The tall beauty with eyes as radiant as his sister's, and whose countenance reflected the fine lines of his proud lineage, reached out her hand to him. Fitzwilliam, allow me to have a good look at you. Moments later she said, My, you are every bit as handsome as my brother once was. She looked at Elizabeth. This must be your lovely bride. Welcome to Pemberley, my dear. Darcy bowed. Lady Alexandra, it is indeed a great honour to meet you. He placed his hand upon his wife's back. You have surmised correctly. Allow me to introduce you to Mrs. Elizabeth Darcy. Please accept our apologies for not having been here to welcome you to our home upon your arrival. Nephew, do not be absurd. Pemberley is my home too. I do not require a formal welcome. Please join me in the drawing room. We have guests who look forward to making your acquaintance. His eyebrow raised. 
Darcy silently questioned Mr. Carter and Mrs. Reynolds, the butler and the housekeeper. Both had served in their respective positions at Pemberley for as long as he could recall. The two cast their eyes down. He hardly faulted them for the awkwardness. His aunt did not strike him as one who took no for an answer. A gentleman and an elderly woman arose from their seats when Lady Alexandra entered the room, followed by Darcy and Elizabeth. The two seemed far too comfortable for guests awaiting the introduction to the Master of Pemberley. "'Sir John Thorpe, I introduce you to my nephew, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy.' "'Indeed, it is a pleasure to meet you, sir. Allow me to introduce you to my mother, Mrs. Thorpe. We were both ever so fortunate to make your aunt's acquaintance during our journey.' Darcy bowed and introduced them to Elizabeth. After they greeted each other in the usual way, Lady Alexandra seized control of the conversation. "'Mrs. Thorpe, my nephew is a very handsome man, do you not agree?' "'Yes, he is indeed. He is every bit as handsome as his likeness in the gallery.' She peered over the rim of her spectacles. "'Mrs. Darcy, I do not need to tell you how fortunate you are to have landed such a fine husband.' A hint of amusement now replaced the hint of annoyance he had detected in his wife's eyes earlier in the grand foyer. Darcy cleared his throat. <clears throat> it has been some time since you accompanied my aunt to Pemberley. Are you planning to visit family in the area? Oh, yes. Our family lives in the north. Seeing your aunt to Pemberley has brooked no hardship on us whatsoever. In fact, we have enjoyed this time with her. Your home is magnificent. Indeed. Without uh, knowing anything of the particulars of your situation, I venture to say your family in the north must long to see you. We have uh, written letters explaining our delay. We were not at all anxious to take our leave of Lady Alexandra whilst she awaited your arrival, even though this is her childhood home. Heaven forbid, he said in a manner suggesting his reservations. "'And what a lovely home it is, sir,' said Sir Thorpe, echoing his mother's earlier sentiments, with a bit more pretense. "'Surely you will understand and will not be offended as Mrs. Darcy and I take our leave of you. It has been a tiring journey, and we had no expectation of receiving guests on the day of our arrival.' Lady Alexandra said, "'Of course you did not, nephew. Besides, Sir Thorpe and his mother are my guests. You and your lovely bride are free to run along and rest or whatever it is that young lovers do at such an hour as this.' She looked at her guests unabashedly. "'Shall we see you at dinner?' Darcy turned and faced his aunt. "'Your ladyship, you should expect to see me long before dinner. I shall see you in my study in two hours.' The dark panelled walls, the large mahogany desk, even the rich burgundy leather armchairs were the same as she remembered them. Her father's study. Lost in thought, her nephew's entrance startled her. He had everything that was pleasing in his favour. Strong, chiselled face, dark hair, piercing blue eyes, definitely his father's son. I am sorry to have kept you waiting. Oh, never mind the delay, nephew. I took the time to reacquaint myself with what used to be my father's favourite room. I spent many hours here, some of them not always pleasant. This room is very much as I remember it, but for a few changes. She beckoned Darcy to her side as she paused at the mantel to study the miniatures. Who are these handsome young men? I surmise this one is you, though this one also bears a strong family resemblance. Darcy rolled his eyes. That is George Wickham. George Wickham? Hmm. He must be important to have earned such a prominent placement right beside your own likeness. There is no significance to that placement other than he is, he was, my father's godson. I take no credit for its being here. It is exactly as my father left it. That is interesting indeed. Your father's godson, you say? Did your father have any other godchildren? Not that I am aware of, just that one. I would love to know more about this young man. <laughs> I am afraid I am not the one to enlighten you. 
I do not care for the gentleman, and I prefer to speak of him as little as possible. Her ladyship spread her fingers over her bosom. My, my, said she, before looking away. However, Lady Alexandra, I am open to knowing more about you. Why did you leave Pemberley so many years ago? Why did you stay away as long as you did? And why have you chosen this time to return? She glared at her nephew. You speak as though I am not welcome. Pemberley is my home. Actually, Lady Alexandra, Pemberley is my home, and you are my guest. Oh, is that how it is? I do not mean to say you are unwelcome. Mrs. Darcy and I welcome you here at Pemberley as our guest for as long as you wish. <sighs> well, what a relief to be welcomed wholeheartedly as a guest in my family's ancestral home. With a hand on her hip, she said, I will have you know I was effectively mistress of Pemberley in my beloved mother's stead, long before you were a glint in your father's eye, and for far more years than you have served as its current master. His voice raised, Darcy said, I do not need to tell you that Pemberley now has a new mistress. Of course you need not tell me that. Then you will understand that it is not for you to invite guests to Pemberley. Is that what this little lecture is about? Has your little wife complained about my position in this household already? He ignored the question. He encouraged her to take a seat at his desk while he did likewise. Those people are nothing more than upstarts. What do you know about them? Oh, what a judgmental young man you are. Sir Thorpe and his mother are decent people. No, they are not very rich. However, Sir John Thorpe and his mother arranged for my transportation to Pemberley, going out of their way, in fact, to assure my safe arrival. In turn, I invited them to stay at Pemberley and rest for a while before resuming their travels to the north. In other words, you accepted the generosity of complete strangers, even invited them into my home. When we met, they claimed an acquaintance by way of the elder Mr. Bingley, whose son, they said, is a great friend of the heir of Pemberley. What proof do you have of their claims? Oh, for heaven's sake, nephew, do not be such a prude. Surely Pemberley's household staff is up to the task of making certain that the Thorpes do not escape in the middle of the night with the silver? He held up his hand. Oh, enough, Lady Alexandra. They are welcome to stay a while longer. She pursed her lips. I now have no doubt why Mrs. Reynolds spoke so highly of you. Like your father and his father, you are a most generous master. I know nothing of the reason you left Pemberley, but by the derisive tone in your speech, you harbour resentment against my father and my grandfather as well. Is that why I was told very little about you as I was growing up, and why you managed but a few lines of condolences upon my father's death, your own brother's death? I do not intend to dredge up old family history. Needless to say, I have my reasons for leaving Pemberley and staying away as long as I did. <laughs> do I ever? I am happy to be here now. Yes, you have returned. I, for one, could not be more delighted to have you here at Pemberley. Georgiana will be pleased as well. Yes, I am anxious to meet my niece. Nevertheless, I have to wonder how you suppose your bride will feel. Mrs. Darcy will surely miss the large family she has left behind. I think she will embrace your presence in our home as well. She stood to take her leave. Darcy stood as well, his towering posture beckoning her to return to her seat. I have a few more unanswered questions. What have you been doing all this time? More important, why did you stay away? I cannot help feeling ill at ease over this situation. That you would rely upon strangers and now feel beholden to them when you might have reached out to me to arrange your safe travel is unconscionable. Ignoring his bullying tactic, she maintained her stance. Perhaps I might shed more light on my plight over the past several decades with you, but not now. Pardon me, nephew, I must speak with Mrs. Reynolds about this evening's meal. Perhaps you might defer that task to Mrs. Darcy. I will do no such thing, nephew. Mrs. Darcy arrived mere hours ago. Surely you will allow her time to settle into her role as Pemberley's mistress? Are you two not recently married? 
Trust me, your wife will appreciate my sacrifice. Lady Alexandra walked away from the study with as much grace as she could muster. Upon arriving at her apartment and closing the door, she threw herself down on her bed. Not much had changed over the years. Not her apartment, not the elegance and stateliness of her childhood home, and not the haughty attitude exhibited by its master. My nephew had the audacity to speak to me as he did, as though I am a child when I am nearly two decades his senior. Rebellious at heart, she had never kowtowed to anyone. She had stood her ground against fiercer Darcy men than the young buck who now called himself master, even to her own detriment. How ironic that I should require a complete stranger's blessing as a welcoming in my own childhood home. Moreover, what shall I make of that bride of his? She is attractive enough, I suppose. However, she is hardly a great beauty. Furthermore, there is the puzzle of her manner of dress. Her gown was a modest brown. Her chestnut hair was completely unadorned. Not even a feather or two. Her bright eyes are far too large, her face far too thin, to say nothing of her figure which is rather too slender. <laughs> a country mouse, if ever I have seen one. My nephew dared to accuse the Thorpes of being mere upstarts. Lady Alexandra had spent the past decades living abroad with her late husband, Lord Charles Spencer, the Earl of Ravendale, the scoundrel. He had managed to squander his own inheritance years before meeting her, a circumstance that made him more than willing to marry a fallen woman, especially one of great wealth. Her father had given him a small fortune in addition to her dowry of forty thousand pounds. Thanks to Lord Spencer, she had wound up nearly destitute with no other recourse than living in his family's villa on the continent for more than two years after his passing, until its rightful heir came around and staked his claim. She thanked goodness she had had the foresight to hide her jewels from the clutches of her late husband's creditors. She managed to pawn some of them to get enough funds to pay for her passage to England. Not that he was wholly to blame for her dire straits. In the two years since Lord Spencer passed away, she had managed to accumulate her own share of debts, what with her lavish lifestyle. Indeed, I mean to have such a lifestyle again, and by all that is sacred, I shall. Chapter 8 An actual slap in the face might have had less of a sting than her ladyship's latest slight, in front of Lord and Lady Matlock, no less. A week after the Darcys returned to Pemberley, the Matlocks brought Georgiana home. More than anything, Elizabeth desired to make a favourable impression on her new sister. All of Miss Caroline Bingley's acclaim, and even her husband's description of the young lady, hardly did her credit. As pretty as could be, the young woman bore all the elegance of an angel with her long golden ringlets and large blue eyes. Elizabeth greeted her with a smile when Darcy introduced the two to each other. She had barely acknowledged her introduction to Elizabeth with a meek smile and slight curtsy before Lady Alexandra took her by both hands. Oh, so you are Georgiana. Oh, I have waited so long for this moment. Lady Alexandra, Georgiana said, what an honour it is to meet you. You are every bit as beautiful as I always imagined by your portrait. Oh, I have been studying your portrait as well, young lady, but it hardly does you justice. My, how much you have grown since that sitting. Yes, it has been years since I sat for that rendering. We shall see that a master is commissioned to take your likeness when we're in town. Darcy cleared his throat. <clears throat> I applaud your generosity, my lady. However, I have decided otherwise as regards the timing of my sister's next sitting. Georgiana's eager enthusiasm faded. Darcy acted as if he did not notice, directing his attention instead to the other guests, Lord and Lady Matlock. He led Elizabeth to them and made the introductions. Mrs. Darcy, we have long anticipated meeting you. Our nephew wrote only to tell us that you were to be married, and very little else. 
Come, my dear, sit by me. There is much that needs discussing if you are to be truly welcomed into our family, said Lady Matlock. Elizabeth hid her dismay. Did Pemberley now have three mistresses? I will gladly answer any questions you might have, your ladyship. Lady Alexandra seized the moment to escape the Matlocks, who had all but slighted her. Come, Georgiana, let us leave Elizabeth to get acquainted with your Fitzwilliam relatives, whilst you and I have a tour of the grounds. After a rather lacklustre dinner party, owing to its being Mrs. Darcy's first occasion to flaunt her skills as mistress of such an esteemed estate, everyone gathered in the drawing-room. Lady Alexandra sat beside her niece on an elegant sofa, contented to be a silent observer. Lord Matlock had been staring at her all evening. She had never liked him. She disdained his evident regard for himself. The years had done nothing to encourage her good opinion of the aristocrat. His menacing stare was just as disquieting now as it had been several decades past. Having garnered everyone's attention, he spoke to her ladyship. I must say what a delight it is for us all, Lady Alexandra, now that you have returned to our society after so many years. You are very kind, my lord. You cannot imagine how disappointed our family was when you left Pemberley, especially my sister, Lady Anne. May she rest in peace. She often expressed her regret in not having the opportunity to know her new sister. With such a sister as Lady Catherine, is it any wonder? Lady Alexandra smiled. The Earl prattled on. Of course, sir, you left Pemberley months before the announcement of my late sister's betrothal to your late brother. Perhaps had you known what an auspicious occasion was afoot, you might have been persuaded to stay. One never knows, my lord. I see no point in dwelling on what might have been, especially since the principal parties of whom you fondly speak are no longer with us. Indeed. However, you have returned. This must mean a great deal to my niece to have you here at Pemberley, especially during such a trying time in her life. Lady Alexandra did not miss the glances exchanged between Georgiana and her brother, a sort of unspoken communication between siblings. She once had shared a similar bond with her own brother, at least during their earliest years. Indeed, it is a joy to be home, Lady Alexandra said with a smile directed towards the Earl. I have missed Pemberley. I recall my role as mistress in my beloved mother's stead. May she rest in peace. It has been such a pleasure to resume that position since my return. Standing before the fireplace with his arms behind his back, Darcy shifted his weight and placed one arm on his hip. I remind you, Lady Alexandra, your role was rather short-lived. Mrs. Darcy owns that privilege. Lady Alexandra placed her hand on her chest. Oh, I beg your forgiveness, nephew, if I appear to overstep. It is a sign of old age, nothing more. Lady Matlock, too, had eyed Lady Alexandra throughout the evening. She said, Surely you are not more than forty-five, why, fifty at the most, as you are the late Mr. Darcy's younger sister. Forty-five, fifty? I would never own either, and neither would you, I am sure. Both of you are the epitome of perfection, Sir Thorpe said. Hear, hear, said Lord Matlock. The following evening, the Darcys and their guests assembled in the drawing room. Darcy turned to his sister and said, Georgiana, perhaps you would play something for us this evening. Georgiana eagerly took her place at the instrument and exhibited, earning applause from everyone, especially Lady Alexandra, whose praise was effusive. When Georgiana returned to her place on the sofa, Lady Alexandra said, Oh, Georgiana, you cannot imagine what a delight you are. Thank you, Lady Alexandra. I confess I practice hours each day. Lady Alexandra looked at Elizabeth and said, Every family should have at least one great proficient. The Darcys are very fortunate indeed to be able to boast of Georgiana in that regard. Though you will never play as well as my niece, you would do well to follow your sister's example and practice. Clasping her hands, she peered at Darcy. My dear nephew might argue otherwise. 
However, I say it is good that I returned when I did. Directing her scrutiny towards Elizabeth, she looked down her nose and said, You have much to learn if you are to consider yourself truly accomplished, and you had much better attend to such matters with all haste. I shall begin to ease your transition as mistress of Pemberley by explaining the organisation of the household accounts. Elizabeth's back stiffened a bit. You need not bother, Lady Alexandra. I am already learning such things from Mrs. Reynolds. Poo-pooing the very notion, Lady Alexandra said, Why on earth should you be under the housekeeper's tutelage when I fulfilled the role of mistress admirably? Better Mrs. Reynolds tends to running the house and supervising the cooking and cleaning. I shall teach you all you need to know. Might I remind you, Lady Alexandra, you have been abroad. Much has changed in the thirty years since your absence, said Elizabeth. "'Judging by the look of things, any changes that occurred have not been for the good. "'In time I will have Pemberley restored to the splendour of my youth. "'Of course, by your own account, you were very young when you left. "'Surely the eyes of one's youth would recall magical charm that is nearly impossible to recapture. "'Better you leave the undertaking of refurbishing Pemberley to its current mistress.' By now, all else faded into the background during their verbal volley. All heads turned in unison to see who would say what next. All heads except Darcy's. Elizabeth kept her husband's face in view. He kept his well-practised mask of indifference intact. If he dared to contradict her, there would be hell to pay. He said nothing. You need not twist your emotions in a knot, Mrs. Darcy. I offered to help. You may or may not choose to avail yourself of my years of experience and my selfless generosity. But I do ask that you accept my words in the benevolent spirit in which they are intended. Yes, your ladyship is both selfless and generous to a fault. I simply cannot imagine how my first weeks as mistress of Pemberley might have been had I not enjoyed the convenience of your curiosity. Later that night, after everyone had parted and the household was settling, Lord Matlock cornered Lady Alexandra in the hallway on her way to her apartment. My lady, I was hoping for such an opportunity to speak with you alone. I would invite you into my suite, just to talk, mind you but I am rather certain you would object. Then why on earth even waste your energy with such foolish musings? Lord Matlock twisted his long moustache and said, On the off chance that I am mistaken. You are entirely mistaken, my lord, if you presume I shall accompany you to your apartment. Hmm. Pity. I was so looking forward to a few moments in your private company. Lady Alexandra walked past him a few steps. "'By the way,' he said, "'whatever happened to that young man whom you were so fond of "'just prior to your moving to Scotland to live with relatives?' "'The wily old fool had another thought coming "'if he supposed he could catch her off guard.' "'She turned to look back at him. "'I am sure I do not know of whom you speak.' "'Oh, I am sure you do. "'However, fear not. "'Your secrets are safe with me.' Your family is ridiculous. Stretched out on his wife's bed, Darcy raised a quizzical brow, yet remained silent. Do you have nothing to say in their defence? What would you like most for me to say? I shall do my best to oblige. Elizabeth silently counted her brushstrokes as she regarded his nonchalant demeanour. He barely tolerates my family, yet he is perfectly contented with these insufferable sanctimonious lunatics. Of course, I must exclude your sister and your cousin the colonel. She is young and impressionable, and he is quite amiable. I am sorry that he is not a guest. He did send his apologies, and we shall see him soon enough in town. He and his father are as different as night and day. Indeed. I detected a bit of tension between your uncle and Lady Alexandra. Did you? No. I observed her going out of her way to avoid him on several occasions. What do you suppose that was about? If not for the fact that she was studying him for signs that he paid attention, she would have missed his slight shrug. 
Elizabeth crumpled her forehead. She laid her hairbrush aside and then walked over and stood beside the bed. Of course, the tension between your uncle and Lady Alexandra was nothing in comparison to that between your aunts. I believe Lady Ellen cares very little for Lady Alexandra, which I find very strange. Elizabeth put both hands on her hips in response to his silence. Well, are you not going to ask how I reached my conclusion? Darcy reached out his hand. Pulling her to lie down beside him, he placed his finger upon her lips, followed by a sweet, tender kiss. No more talking. Lady Alexandra wiped the tears from her eyes. Oh, why must she subject herself to such agony? Why must she force herself to endure things best left forgotten? Had she not suffered enough already? She carefully folded the letter from her late father. He had written to tell her that Mr. Elliot had perished at sea. One would think her father's news had been devastating, as it surely had been, but there was more. Her father had gone on to say that nothing had changed as far as her banishment from Pemberley. The course she had set was the one she must live with for the rest of her life. The last time she had ever looked into her father's eyes, she thought him to be the coldest man in the world. His last letter had sealed her sentiments, yet she had kept it all these years. How ironic! Pemberley's new master's marriage to an upstart, when her father had denied her a chance of happiness with her one true love, owing to his lack of fortune and low connections. Lady Alexandra startled when she heard a light rap on the door. She looked at the clock. Who would be knocking at her door at that time of night? She returned the letter to its proper place in her stack of tarnished memories, placed the bundle in her vanity drawer, and turned the key. Standing, she gave a quick glance in the mirror, secured her robe, and went to answer the door. "'Georgiana, my dear,' she said while glancing up and down the hallway, "'what are you doing awake at this hour?' "'I could not sleep. May we talk?' "'Yes, of course.' She took her young niece by the hand. Please come inside. Georgiana walked into the room. She proceeded slowly at first, as if seeing the room for the first time, and then joined Lady Alexandra on the sofa beside the fire. So, you could not sleep? No, your ladyship. I suppose my restlessness results from uh, having met you. Georgiana lowered her voice. I do not mean to suggest that our meeting has been a cause for anxiety, for nothing makes me happier than having you live with us at Pemberley. Lady Alexandra laid her hand on Georgiana's. I know exactly what you mean, my dear. The discussion this evening after dinner caused me a bit of discomfort, and thus my purpose in coming here. Oh? Indeed, I started thinking rather wishing that I had some memories of my mother. My uncle said that my mother and you never had a chance to get to know each other as sisters should. My mother and I never had a chance to know each other either. She lowered her eyes, and her voice trailed off again. At least, not such that I remember. Lady Alexandra embraced her niece. I am sorry, my dear. My mother passed away when I was a very small child as well. My brother, your father, did his best to keep my memories of our beloved mother alive, at least for a time. What of your own brother? Do the two of you often speak of your mother? Georgiana broke the embrace. Rarely. She sat back against the sofa. However, I often have heard stories about my mother from her sister, Lady Catherine. She is... Rather, she was especially fond of the notion that my brother and her daughter, my cousin Anne, were to marry. Oh dear, I imagine she does not take kindly to the fact that he has gone off and chosen his own bride. Oh no, <laughs> the entire Fitzwilliam family is quite distressed by the affair. You mean to say they all believed he was to marry his cousin? It is not that as much as they are generally disturbed that my brother chose a wife with no connections and no wealth to speak of. This sounds like the proud aristocrats. 
Her association of her banishment from Pemberley and the Fitzwilliam family dynasty were inextricably linked. Your brother must love his dear wife a great deal to have gone against the wishes of the entire family. My uncle attributes my brother's motives to lust more than love. Your brother would be astounded to hear you speak that way, I am sure. Again she placed her hand on her niece's. Fear not, I shall not utter a word. I am interested in how your uncle came to such a conclusion. Is this not his first time making Mrs. Darcy's acquaintance? Indeed, however, he feels this way because of the hastiness of the nuptials. My brother has known his wife but a few months. Oh, that explains a few things, Lady Alexandra said. Whatever do you mean? Oh, never mind, dear niece. This certainly explains the awkwardness I sometimes notice when in the company of the two lovebirds. My nephew has settled himself with someone who possibly does not share his affections in equal measure. But why, when he might have had any woman whom he wished? Georgiana, am I correct in supposing there is a bit of tension between you and your brother? He treats me like a child. Georgiana stood and walked over to the mantelpiece. She picked up one of the miniatures. Her face paled. Is this not the likeness of George from my brother's study? Why do you have this in here? Lady Alexandra walked to her niece and touched her arm. My dear, whatever is wrong? It is just a picture. You look as if you have seen a ghost. It is just a shock of seeing this here of all places. Oh, I know it sounds foolish, what with its rightful place being in my brother's study. However, I have learned to avoid that particular part of the room so as not to be reminded. Reminded of what, my dear? The younger woman diverted her eyes again, but Lady Alexandra persisted. Her niece held inside a story that needed to see the light of day. I shall not ask you to divulge that which you would rather not discuss. However, you must know that your life is different now that I am here. You need never suffer in silence. I am your aunt. You are my blood, and you need not dread telling me anything for fear I might judge you harshly. Georgiana released a heavy sigh. Seeing this reminds me of my painful past with George. You see, he professed his love for me. We were to be married. However, when my brother learned of our plans, the two of them had a terrible argument. My brother accused George of falsely declaring himself to me in an attempt to control my dowry. He banished George from Pemberley before he and I could talk. Tears welled up in her young niece's eyes. My brother says my love for George is unrequited, but he is mistaken. I just know it. My dear, I'm terribly sorry that you have suffered such heartbreak. My own father separated me from the man I loved when I was not much older than you are now. I appreciate how painful it had to have been for you. Lady Alexandra lifted Georgiana's chin and looked into her eyes. I am doubly sorry that your heartbreak involves, Mr. Wickham. Again, I have to ask, why do you have this? Do you know George? Oh, my dear niece... Can you keep a secret? Chapter 9 If looks could kill, Lady Catherine crossed one hand over the other in her lap and raised her head in disdain. Fifteen minutes of idle chatter, a full quarter hour, where the subject at hand did not involve her ladyship's benevolent care and attention to her village, must have tried her patience. I simply do not know why my nephew thought it necessary to bring you along. For as long as I can recall, my nephews have visited me, and never before have they been accompanied by such an entourage. Lady Alexandra observed the tall, large woman with strongly marked features. She silently congratulated herself that the years had been far kinder to her than they had to Lady Catherine. She said, It goes to reason that he would be accompanied by a large party. He is recently married. 
so does that explain your presence? By her manner of speech, one would think the mistress of Rosings fancied herself of higher rank. Catherine, you mean to say you continue to bear a grudge against me after all these years? Was it my fault that stuffy old Louis preferred my company infinitely more than he preferred yours? No, Lady Catherine did not like Lady Alexandra Darcy. Lady Alexandra, the younger of the two, by a year, did not care for Lady Catherine either. Lady Alexandra scarcely knew Lady Anne, Lady Catherine's younger sister, owing to Anne's being away at boarding school. Nonetheless, Lady Alexandra's lack of affection extended to Lady Anne as well. The prospect of their families uniting by the marriage of her brother to Lady Anne had figured prominently in Alexandra's banishment from Pemberley. She just knew it, even though her father had denied the truth of it. Nothing had been allowed to impede his purposes of seeing the unification of the Darcy's wealth and the Fitzwilliam's nobility. "'I seem to recall several gentlemen preferring your company during those days,' Lady Catherine said. Her tardy guest's entrance into the room distracted her. "'There you are, nephew. What detained you?' "'Lady Catherine, pardon me. My wife and I were rather tired from the journey.' Lady Alexandra interrupted. Catherine, show him leniency. He is a newlywed, after all, and quite besotted, if you ask me. Lady Catherine's eyes narrowed. Her nostrils flared. Why, I never... Come now, Catherine, you must have. Lady Alexandra cast her eyes upon Miss Anne de Berg, Lady Catherine's only child, and said, At least once... Darcy stepped forward and intervened. Lady Catherine, allow me to present my wife, Mrs. Elizabeth Darcy. Lady Catherine eyed Elizabeth from head to toe as if looking to find fault. So you are Elizabeth. Hmm. Yes, your ladyship. The faint sound she made could mean only one of two things. She found her nephew's wife acceptable, or she found her utterly beneath her contempt. This is my daughter, Anne. Elizabeth and Anne exchanged greetings. Darcy, where is my niece and where is my nephew? I do not know, Lady Catherine. Of course, pardon my inattention to the indelicate nature of the tardiness of you and your wife. I suppose it is no wonder that Georgiana has yet to appear for dinner, what with such an example... If you do not mind my saying, Catherine, my niece and nephew are the epitome of decorum. They are not to blame for Georgiana's tardiness. In fact, she and her cousin are together at this moment enjoying a walk outside in the gardens before dinner. Then why did you not speak up sooner? I suffer no obligation to satisfy your curiosity. Lady Catherine ignored her ladyship. Elizabeth, Mr. Collins tells me that you and his wife are dear friends. I told him that he must be mistaken. That you are cousin to my vicar is something I am willing to overlook, especially as he is the heir to your father's estate. As such, he is a gentleman. But until such day, it is simply unthinkable that the wife of my nephew is a dear friend to the wife of my parson. Oh, unthinkable. Pray, your ladyship, am I to deny my dearest friend until such time as my beloved father passes away for the sake of your sensibilities? My word, you give your opinions rather freely. Darcy, is that any way for your wife to speak to her elders? Darcy donned his mask of indifference. He seemed no more inclined to inject himself in his wife's verbal skirmishes with Lady Catherine than he had been with Lady Alexandra. Fortunately, he did not have to answer Lady Catherine, for Georgiana and Richard entered the room. After the usual greetings, the butler announced dinner, and everyone proceeded to the dining room. After speaking with the butler, Lady Catherine tasted her soup. Satisfied it was to her liking, she directed her attention to Elizabeth. I have heard from my brother and his wife, both of whom speak rather highly of you for such a short acquaintance. She tasted her soup. 
This time she turned up her lips and rolled her eyes. No doubt her reaction had little to do with the consomme. Of course, Lady Alexandra speaks highly of you as well. She has been instrumental in singing your praises, but I prefer to form my opinion based on my own observations. What is it that you would like to know, your ladyship? Given license to satisfy her curiosity, not that she needed it, Lady Catherine asked her, at different times, how many sisters she had, were they older or younger than she was, were any of them likely to be married, were they handsome, were they educated, how many carriages did her father keep, and what had been her mother's maiden name? Despite all the impertinence of her ladyship's questions, Elizabeth answered them with equanimity and composure. Catherine, even you will admit that Mrs. Darcy is a suitable bride. She is, after all, a gentleman's daughter. Indeed, Alexandra, a fact that played largely in your favour as well. No doubt such luck of birth figured prominently in your securing the hand of a lord. You have a point. Moreover, imagine the irony of the daughter of an earl securing merely the hand of a baron. Not that I refer to anyone in particular, mind you. She glanced around the opulent room, especially since Sir Louis de Bourgh turned out to be quite a catch. When the ladies returned to the drawing-room after dinner, Elizabeth paused to speak with Lady Alexandra. I wish to express my appreciation of your intervening with Lady Catherine on my behalf, Lady Alexandra. I assure you, Elizabeth, this evening had nothing at all to do with my regard for you. I continue to wonder at my nephew's marrying you. In fact, after Lady Catherine's testimony, I am appalled to know your connections are even lower than I had thought. Elizabeth was aghast. With nothing more to add to the discourse, she walked away. Little did it matter to Lady Alexandra that her nephew would have been most displeased were he privy to her sentiments towards his little wife. She resented the fact that Elizabeth was no more than an upstart. She could not marry where she chose because of the proud Darcy legacy, yet Fitzwilliam had brought this social climber into their midst, installed her as the mistress of Pemberley, and all this with nary a raised eyebrow by virtue of his sex. Elizabeth had much to confide in her dear friend Charlotte, and thus sat in Charlotte's parlour soon after breakfast a few days later. Much of the talk centred on Elizabeth's first weeks at Pemberley and the subsequent weeks in town. Yes, she had visited Jane and the gardeners. No, her husband did not accompany her to Cheapside. The Darcys had made no social calls and had not received callers, not even the Bingleys. Yet Elizabeth hardly had time to catch her breath. She had tired easily when in town, a consequence of spending the bulk of her time visiting the modiste and being fitted for her new wardrobe and the like. She spent much of her time with no one other than Lady Alexandra, who was just as intent upon bringing her own wardrobe up to the latest fashions as she was in seeing that Elizabeth made the proper choices in outfitting herself in a manner worthy of the mistress of Pemberley. "'Lady Alexandra has exquisite taste, as do you, my dear Eliza,' said Charlotte. "'The compliments on this particular gown are all due to her ladyship. "'As much as she dislikes me, and I scarcely confess to a greater regard for her, "'her taste is impeccable. "'An accomplished woman, if ever I saw one. "'I no longer wonder at Mr. Darcy's strong opinion on the subject, "'for his aunt certainly embodies all that and more.' And let us not neglect to remark upon the manner of her speech, that certain air in her walk. In a moment of hilarity, reminiscent of their days in Hertfordshire, the two ladies burst into a peal of laughter, the same as they always did when recalling the pretentious Miss Caroline Bingley and her ridiculous behaviour when they first had met. Pray, dear Eliza, how is Jane? <laughs> I have thought of her a great deal. You mentioned she remains with the gardeners in town. Has she had any occasion to visit the Bingleys? Jane called on Miss Bingley. However, Mr. Bingley was not there. His sisters since called on Jane as well, but there was no mention of their brother. 
That is but one reason I can hardly wait until we return to town for the season. Oh, how wonderful! What a great opportunity you shall have to spend time with her. Charlotte, I will do all I can in throwing my sister in Mr. Bingley's path, although I have no assurances my efforts will not be impeded. I begin to think that my husband does not care for Jane as well as a brother ought to care for a sister. What is the basis of your opinion? Has he said as much? I confess it is not so much what he says, but rather what he does not say. Charlotte patted Elizabeth's hand. He simply needs more time to get to know Jane, and then he will surely see that she is full of goodness. I agree. Moreover, regardless of my husband's opinion, I shall spend as much time with my family as I wish. In fact, I have a very particular reason for wishing to see my aunt as soon as I return to town. I have a matter to discuss with her that is best broached in person. Oh, pray tell, if I am not asking too much. Charlotte, you must not tell a soul, Elizabeth said in a very quiet voice. Have I your promise? Anything you say will remain within the confines of these walls. Now I beg you, end my suspense at once. Oh, Charlotte, it is much too soon to know with certainty, but my greatest hope is that I might be with child. Charlotte placed one hand to her heart and the other upon Elizabeth's hand. How wonderful! Oh, how does Mr. Darcy take the news? By Elizabeth's mean, her friend correctly surmised Elizabeth had not confided in her husband. Eliza! Mr. Collins raced into the room. He stopped long enough to catch his breath. My dear Mrs. Collins, you will never guess who we are about to receive, said Mr. Collins. He then noticed his wife was not alone. Oh, my dear cousin, Mrs. Darcy, I had no idea we had the honour of your company this morning. Good morning, Mr. Collins, Elizabeth said. Do not leave me in suspense, my dear. You are about to enlighten me on our impending guests. Yes, the nephews of my noble patroness, Lady Catherine. I espied them both on my way to visit Rosings Park after my morning rounds with the parishioners, and I immediately headed back to alert you. He ran over to the mantel and peered into the mirror. Assured his appearance was acceptable, he stood straight and tall in anticipation of the imminent arrivals. Soon enough their approach was announced by the doorbell, and shortly afterwards the gentleman entered the room. Darcy paid his compliments with his usual reserve, and took the seat closest to Elizabeth, whilst the Colonel, who had previously met the Collinses in Hertfordshire during his cousin's wedding, renewed their acquaintance with courtesies expected of a well-bred man who meant to make a favourable impression upon his hosts. The ensuing conversation evoked a measure of discomfort for Darcy, for it involved the upcoming season in town and all the merriment that it would entail, especially as Elizabeth would be spending time once again in her family's company. All her attempts to engage Darcy in the conversation met with frustration, so much so that Elizabeth ceased bothering. A half hour later, all eyes turned to Darcy when he stood and signalled an end to his visit. Richard, will you see that my horse is returned to the stables? I believe Mrs. Darcy would appreciate a leisurely stroll along the lovely lanes of Rosings Park, and I am most anxious to attend her. Elizabeth accepted his proffered arm. Darcy bowed and said, Mrs. Collins. He turned towards her husband. Mr. Collins, it has been a pleasure. Other than concur, what was there to do in the wake of his pronouncement? Elizabeth made her apologies in the warmest possible way and quitted the room with her husband. There was no excuse for his rude behaviour at the parsonage. If he meant only to be silent and grave, why did he even come? She and her husband walked along the pristine lane in relative silence. She had decided that if they were to have any conversation at all, then he would have to be the one to initiate it. That proved to be a losing strategy. The man was a proficient social recluse. Just when Elizabeth had enough and was about to chastise him for his civility, or rather lack thereof, he spoke. I would prefer it if you did not contradict my will, especially in front of strangers. His will? 
How did he suppose she knew what he willed if he had barely uttered two words at the parsonage? Opting for a pleasant stroll back to the manor, Elizabeth tempered her speech. Charlotte is hardly a stranger to me. She is my dearest friend. Yes, well, in time you will learn to think less of her in that regard. Darcy stopped Elizabeth from pulling away by clutching her arm closer to his side. Elizabeth, I ask you to hear me out. I am inclined to agree with Lady Catherine in such matters as this. In time, you will learn to reconsider your attachment to Mrs. Collins. Regardless of where the two of you started in life, your lots are decidedly different now. It is unseemly to boast that my wife's dearest friend should be the wife of my aunt's sycophantic parson. Have you any other objections to Charlotte that might render her as unworthy of my loyalty and friendship, sir? He twisted his lower lip. Is the reason I gave not sufficient? Certainly not, if you consider that he is my cousin, the heir of my father's estate. How ridiculous would I be to look down on either of them? You know nothing at all about me if you think I would turn my back on my dearest friend. She released a long breath. Besides, I seem to recall when you expressed your admiration of Charlotte before we were married. I only mean to suggest that once you travel amongst the highest circles of society, you might come to think differently of your childhood acquaintances. Time will tell. If you find my friend and her husband's company so... Uh, so beneath you, why did you even call on them? I saw no reason for you to have to come to the parsonage house to rescue me. It is not as though I am missed at Rosings Park. Why would you say such a thing? Between your dueling aunts, I fail to see how anyone might get a word in. Darcy covered her hand with his. I missed you. I suppose that is kind of you to say, but I am afraid it is not enough to persuade me to remain in the company of either of your aunts for very long. I ask you to be patient with my aunts, both of them. Lady Catherine is doing her best to overcome her disappointment that Pemberley and Rosings Park will never be united, and Lady Alexandra is merely establishing her bona fides as Lady Catherine's equal. Surely you can see that Lady Catherine is not making that an easy task. Furthermore, she knows more about Lady Alexandra's past than she is saying, or at least she thinks she does. I ask that you be especially patient where Lady Alexandra is concerned. Sucking in a quick breath, Elizabeth said, Do you suppose I have not tried? I purposely extended her an olive branch just the other day. She practically snatched it from my hand, broke it in two, and pummeled me over the head with both pieces. Oh, I am sure you are exaggerating, Elizabeth. She said she had no intention of accepting my friendship. She is determined to make my life miserable. Are you miserable? Have you any regrets? Are you fishing for compliments, dear husband? Hardly. I simply wish to know. Your happiness is of utmost importance to me. Besides, I worry about you. You are not as lively as you once were. Is, uh, is something amiss? I am happy. I simply am not designed for ill humour. With that said, I am sure my happiness will increase a hundredfold by our return to town, for I will once again be in the company of my dearest sister Jane and my beloved aunt and uncle Gardiner. Elizabeth hugged herself in sheer delight. Oh, I can hardly wait. Her husband lacked her enthusiasm. Her brow arched. She looked at him pointedly. I shall expect you to extend the same courtesy to my London relatives as I have extended to your relatives ever since we married. I will do most anything you want me to. But as for socialising with your relatives from Cheapside once we are in town, I make no promises. Besides, it is not as though we will travel in the same circles. Mr. Darcy, how can you be so opposed to the notion of doing things differently now that we are married? Besides, why would we not travel in the same circles? <laughs> London is far more diverse than the limited society of Hertfordshire, Elizabeth. Even Derbyshire. In all my years, I cannot recall attending the same social functions as anyone in trade whilst in town. 
What about the Bingleys? I seem to recall hearing that the origin of their family's fortune was trade. He waved his hand dismissively. That was at least a couple of generations ago. Even still, you might be surprised at how rarely Bingley and I enjoy each other's company in town. <laughs> I suggest you brace yourself, Mr. Darcy, for your limited world of society and privilege is about to change. I fully intend to embrace my family and not shun them because hard work is the means by which they exist. As long as you remain open to heeding your own advice, we have no quarrel. Although he raised her hand to his lips and kissed it, there was no mistaking his tone. He meant to challenge her. I fully anticipate quite a few changes once we are in town, Mrs. Darcy. Quite a few. Chapter 10 The night everyone had been waiting for was upon them. Elizabeth's first London season as Mrs. Darcy held such promise for gaiety and excitement, if only the chief source of her trepidation did not reside within her own household. Months have passed, and I feel your aunt is just as intolerant of me as when we first met, Elizabeth said. Once again, she and her husband found themselves standing about in the drawing-room, awaiting Lady Alexandra's grand entrance, so that they might all leave together. Oh, let us not speak of Lady Alexandra. Tonight is very special. Lord and Lady Matlock have invited many of the most affluent members of the tone to their home this evening in celebration of our marriage. Everyone looks forward to meeting the new mistress of Pemberley. And I am just as eager at the prospect of introducing you as my wife. He took both her hands in his and stood in admiration. After kissing her cheek, he released her hands and walked over to a table. Opening the drawer, he retrieved a velvet box. Darcy walked back to Elizabeth and opened the box for her inspection. Brilliant diamonds surrounded sapphires in a stunning display. Elizabeth placed her hand over her heart. I want you to wear this tonight. She looked at him and smiled, prompting him to remove the necklace. Laying the case aside, he stood behind her, placed the necklace around her long, slender neck, and fastened the clasp. Elizabeth touched it as he took her by the hand and led her to the large gilded mirror over the mantel. Whilst she admired the jewel's brilliant reflection, he admired her. He placed his hands about her waist and leaned down to whisper, Beautiful. Oblivious of the ever-present servant, he kissed her along her neckline. She loved his lips' gentle caress against her skin. She wished he would bestow such tenderness more often than had been his wont of late. His affectionate demeanour changed when Lady Alexandra entered the room. Dressed in an exquisite royal blue satin gown, she honed her eyes on Elizabeth. Is that my mother's necklace? I have been looking for it. I meant to wear it this evening. Lady Alexandra, you forget yourself. You have no claim on any of the Darcy family jewels other than those bequeathed to you, which I have recently learned to have been quite substantial. Her ladyship jutted her chin. How dare you dig into my personal affairs, nephew? Darcy had every right to act as he had. His aunt's draw on his purse was not inconsequential. You and I shall discuss this matter in private, your ladyship. Suffice it to say, you have no right to avail yourself of anything in my home other than that which Mrs. Darcy and I allow. I do not expect to hear any speeches from you to the contrary. Immediately after dinner that evening, Darcy excused himself from the rest of the gentlemen in attendance to make arrangements to bring his sister and her companion back to Darcy House. He was speaking with the butler of Matlock House when Lady Alexandra joined him. Nephew, I see no reason Georgiana cannot remain here and enjoy the party a little longer. Darcy turned to the butler and dismissed him with a nod, assured that his instructions would be followed. I thank you not to interfere with my rearing of Georgiana, Lady Alexandra. Darcy was not impressed with his aunt's behaviour, and especially the fact that she had such sway over his impressionable young sister. 
he was appalled that she did not even return to Darcy House some evenings, and that she had a habit of returning at such unseemly hours. He had no wish to know what she was about, but he would be damned if his sister would take her cues from Lady Alexandra. Georgiana is not a child. She is nearly as old as I was when I left Pemberley. <laughs> and that is supposed to reassure me. <laughs> Pardon me, Lady Alexandra. Darcy turned to walk away, but was waylaid when she took hold of his arm. I am not done speaking with you, nephew. We need to discuss the timing of my niece's coming out. Now? Lady Ellen suffers a belief that she will be instrumental in guiding Georgiana through her first season. <laughs> you may rest assured that you will not have that honour. Now walking away, Darcy heard his aunt say, "'You will pay for your officiousness towards me, nephew.' For all outward intents and purposes, he chose to ignore her, yet he steamed inside. "'Must I suffer blame for these unknown sins of my father and my father's father?' Whatever Lady Alexandra's grievances, Darcy had heard enough of her idle threats." Lady Alexandra walked up to Elizabeth in the drawing-room and requested a private interview. Elizabeth smiled at the young woman by her side, a silent apology. When they were alone, Lady Alexandra said, "'Pray tell your dear husband that I shall not be returning to Darcy House.' Elizabeth bit her lower lip to subdue her delight before her ladyship completed the sentence. Did she dare hope? You need not be so pleased, young lady. I only meant to say I shall not return with the two of you. Old friends of mine have requested my attendance at another soiree. I see no reason to remain here at Matlock House amidst such boorish people, especially in light of your husband's outrageous behaviour towards me all evening. Her ladyship had the audacity to criticise Mr. Darcy to Elizabeth, of all people, when she was just as likely to criticise Elizabeth to Darcy in another circumstance. Elizabeth said, Lady Alexandra, I am astounded you took the time to apprise me of your plans for the evening. You have a habit of doing whatever you please, whenever you please, with little regard for the feelings of others. A benefit of my age and superior wisdom, I assure you. Whatever the reason, I shall do as you ask. I am rather certain Mr. Darcy will be delighted to hear that you are not without means of arranging your own diversions. Standing behind his wife as she sat at her vanity some hours later, Darcy leaned forward and traced a gentle pattern from her hands to her shoulders whilst trailing light and pleasing kisses along her neckline. Did you enjoy the evening, Mrs. Darcy? The soft touch of his breath in her ear caused her to smile and wrinkle her tiny nose in delight. Their eyes met in the mirror's reflection. Ah, oh, the evening was just as one would expect with such lofty attendees. Darcy reached for her hand, assisted her to her feet, and led her to her bed. Elizabeth said, Though it would have been nice to have known someone other than your family... Lady Alexandra sneered at me the entire time she was there, and of course you saw fit to send Georgiana home as soon as dinner ended. Darcy sat on the bed and drew his wife between his long legs. He gently rested one hand on her slender waistline. The other he combed through her long chestnut tresses. My sister is not yet out in society. It was insupportable that she should remain any longer. Elizabeth started undoing his cravat. She was enjoying a dinner in our honour, in her own aunt and uncle's home, for heaven's sake. Please do not start this with me. It is unfortunate enough that Lady Alexandra and I are at odds over my guardianship of Georgiana. It will help to know that you and I are of one mind on the subject. Perhaps if you were not such a stodgy old prude when it came to such matters, you would find more cooperation. Darcy pressed his lips together. This was not exactly the way he wished the rest of their evening to proceed. The sooner he changed the subject, the better. He leaned forward and nibbled at his wife's earlobe until she trembled with anticipation. Not such a stodgy old prude, would you agree? 
Only if you will tell me how delighted you are by the prospect of our own dinner party. A familiar tension that ruffled his demeanour whenever Elizabeth broached the subject of having the gardeners and her sister Jane to dinner manifested itself. Telling his wife how he genuinely felt must surely hinder his purposes. He obliged her with a lingering kiss instead, one to which she eagerly responded. Moments later, his wife's body trembling with anticipation, he broke away from the kiss with a smile. He said, When you put it like that, Mrs. Darcy, how can I possibly object? Chapter 11 On the whole, the dinner party turned out to Elizabeth's liking. Having invited Mr. Bingley, Elizabeth's inclusion of his unmarried sister, Miss Caroline Bingley, proved unavoidable. Other guests included the Hursts, the Gardeners, Elizabeth's beloved sister Jane, the Thorpes, and Georgiana. Not to be forgotten, of course, was Lady Alexandra. After observing Lady Alexandra's vitriolic acquaintance with the Matlocks, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, and Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth did not know what to expect. Elizabeth especially did not escape her ladyship's rancour. To Elizabeth's surprise, her ladyship was considerably kind and accepting of her relatives from Cheapside. Moreover, her attitude towards Elizabeth leastwise that evening did not disappoint. Mystery, thy name is Lady Alexandra Spencer. Mr. Gardiner, a sensible, gentlemanlike man, belied the notion that one who lived by trade and within view of his own warehouses was ill-bred and disagreeable. Even Louisa Hurst, Bingley's older married sister, could not object, as evidenced by her behaviour. She spent far more time in Mr. Gardiner's company than Elizabeth had ever seen her with her own husband. In the same manner as Elizabeth had regarded him whilst at Netherfield, Mr. Hurst spoke very little and indulged himself in food and drink very much. She had to admit that the evening would have been rather less entertaining if not for the antics of Lady Alexandra and Miss Bingley. The two were at odds from the start, in obvious competition to prove which one of the two of them was the most accomplished. Elizabeth and her beloved Aunt Gardner silently amused themselves over the two ladies' antics. More than once, they fought to contain their mirth. Jane and Bingley did not notice any of the goings-on around them. The moment he saw her that evening, his countenance brightened with hope and anticipation. He sat with her at dinner, and when he was not speaking to her, he was staring at her. Jane was as she ever was in his presence, answering his many questions demurely and bestowing unto him ardent devotion with her smiles. Miss Bingley's ridiculousness and Lady Alexandra's grandstanding aside, the evening was a success. Darcy lay on her bed and watched while she sat at her vanity brushing her hair. Everything turned out just as I hoped for Jane and Mr. Bingley. Whatever do you mean? They're as much in love with each other as ever. Frankly, I perceive your sister to be as unaffected by Bingley as when we were all in Hertfordshire. Elizabeth narrowed her eyes. I beg your pardon? I observed her most carefully and detected no particular regard for Bingley. Jane is shy. She rarely shows her true feelings to anyone. Trust me, she is very much in love. He shrugged. If you say so. It is not my word alone. Give it time. A few more occasions such as tonight, and you will see for yourself. Minutely shaking his head, Darcy said, I would not count on that. What are you saying, Mr. Darcy? You have had your dinner party, ostensibly to entertain your relatives, when, in reality, you meant to place your sister in my friend's path. It is done, and I do not intend that we shall be a party to any further matchmaking attempts. Should Bingley wish to pursue your sister, he had better take it upon himself. How dare you question my motives in having this party? Not that it matters. I was not at all impressed with your aloof behaviour. I doubt my relatives would wish to dine with us at Darcy House again after your perfectly cool civility this evening. 
My goodness, you barely spoke to anyone without first being spoken to. Darcy arched his brow. Was I rude? Oh, no. You are much too much a gentleman to say or do anything overtly offensive. Well, I can think of far worse fates than the prospect of your family wishing to avoid socialising with us. It would be the worst possible outcome for me. As important as family is to you, why do you insist on trying to separate me from mine? Elizabeth, this separation, as you suggest, is a natural consequence of your marrying into the Fitzwilliam family. It is bad enough that you continue to wander over to Cheapside every chance you find. I am considering putting an end to that. It is quite unseemly behaviour for the mistress of Pemberley. Speaking through clinched teeth, Elizabeth said, Stop trying to change me, Mr. Darcy. Their marriage was destined for misery of the acutest kind if he persisted in keeping her from her family. If he cared anything at all for their future felicity, he needed to open his heart to the woman she was now, whom she was in the past, and whom she would always be. His ridiculous stance brought to mind her aunt's advice from earlier that week. She had said it was not uncommon for one spouse to try to change the other. It had been going on since the beginning of time. Her Aunt Gardner also had said the woman usually tried to change her husband. That most certainly made Elizabeth feel better about her situation. At least she was not at fault. Her aunt also had cautioned Elizabeth to be patient with him. He loves you, her aunt had said. Besides, said Elizabeth, these people whom you would rather I spend time with want nothing to do with me, which is just as well, for I want nothing to do with any of them. You are mistaken. Our social calendar is full. It is Lady Alexandra with whom they wish to spend time. Or are you completely oblivious to that fact? You are very well received as well. How can you suggest otherwise? Just as you only tolerate my family and friends, I am sure your heralded acquaintances only tolerate me. I posit you will do well to spend less time in Cheapside and more time cultivating your position as Mrs. Darcy. The making of friends is a two-way endeavour. <laughs> you will want to talk, Mr. Darcy. He ran his hands through his hair. My position is established by birthright, by wealth, by... by... After a long exhale, he said, Do not force me to put my foot down. Elizabeth laughed. <laughs> what do you intend to do, imprison me? I am free to come and go as I choose. The gentleman's club allowed a much-needed place to escape the crossfire of bickering between his wife and his aunt. That day, being at White's was a balm for his masculine sensibilities. Darcy gulped his drink in a single swallow and pounded the glass on the table. Colonel Fitzwilliam signalled the waiter to refill his glass. Your temper leaves much to be desired, my friend. Which of the lovely ladies in your life should I thank for your company this afternoon? Darcy tapped his long fingers on the table whilst awaiting his next drink. Is it not written that a wife should honour and obey her husband? Ah. Mrs. Darcy, what is your lovely wife up to now? Oh, she is maddening. No sooner had I admonished her not to journey to Cheapside this morning than she defied my wishes. Richard laughed aloud, drawing the curious eyes of many of the club's illustrious patrons. <laughs> you admonished her? Mrs. Darcy does not remind me of the sort of woman who takes kindly to being admonished. Did I not warn you against trying to keep her from her family? I find it unsettling that she should act in a manner to which I am adamantly opposed. At least your dear wife is open and honest. She does not try to hide what she does from you or anyone else for that matter. If you truly care for her, you must allow her to make her own decisions, especially as regards her family. She will not do anything that will bring dishonour to the proud Darcy name. Richard sipped his drink. Your wife is just as proud of her own family, and with good reason. Having met the gardeners, I can honestly say they are upstanding people. Darcy silently nursed his drink. Richard leaned forward and lowered his voice. 
Must I remind you that every family has skeletons in the closet, as it were? Things they would rather not be generally known. Shaking his cocked head, Darcy said, oh, That again? No, this time I speak of Lady Alexandra. She is a lovely woman. She carries herself with the utmost dignity and grace. However, I do not trust her. I suspect she is not all that she seems, that she harbours some deep, dark secret. Something about Richard's words did not sit right with Darcy. Yes, he had his own concerns about his aunt. He figured it was his right. But at the end of the day, she was a Darcy. Nothing else mattered. Georgiana and I are all the family Lady Alexandra has. Of course, Elizabeth is her family as well, but they must learn to put their differences aside. Darcy paused to consider the possibility of another relation. Wickham, my father's. I do not even want to think about it. Though if forced, I will have to allow for the veracity of Lady Alexandra's claim that afternoon in my study, soon after we first met, of a strong family resemblance. Try as he might, he could not put his finger on it, but suffice it to say, the resemblance was there. Darcy dismissed his cousin's concern with a wave of his hand. I am beginning to see what uh, Lady Alexandra means when she speaks of the Fitzwilliam family's general disdain towards her. The high and mighty Fitzwilliams. I might expect such an attitude from Lady Catherine, even Lord Matlock, but certainly not you. <laughs> high and mighty, you say? You will want to talk when you generally disregard all things you deem beneath you. I suggest you have more than your fair share of Fitzwilliam blood coursing through your veins. Darcy leaned back in his chair and crossed his long legs. Brushing invisible lint from his finely tailored tan breeches, he said, I can see that you and I are not of the same mind, cousin. It seems we are not. However, I will not object to another round of drinks. <laughs> At your expense. Richard said, before signalling the waiter to their table. I shall propose a toast. Darcy obligingly raised his glass. To what are we drinking? Why, to family. Is there anything more important? Fate was on his side. The following week, word from his steward of a disturbance at Pemberley requiring his attention afforded just the excuse Darcy needed to escape the unpleasantness of town. Elizabeth took the news rather well if he did not count the fact that she immediately thereafter took a carriage to Cheapside. Now he need only share the news with his sister. You sent for me, brother? Yes, my dearest. Come inside. He stood and walked to her. Let us have a seat by the fire and talk. It has been a very long time since we had such an opportunity. Georgiana did as told and sat opposite her brother. Surely you do not blame me for that? Of course not. I simply meant to say. The conversation was off to a bad start, and he had not even broached the subject of why he had asked to speak with her. Georgiana folded her hands, rested them in her lap, and said nothing. I trust you have been enjoying this time in town? Oh, yes. <laughs> Never before have I had so much fun. I never knew London could be so diverting. Darcy frowned. Certainly he was delighted by her enthusiasm, but he had never seen her so animated when speaking of town. <laughs> when speaking of anything, for that matter. In fact, not since before the incident with his nemesis, George Wickham. It is good that you have enjoyed yourself. However, that leads me to the purpose of my asking you here. We will be leaving town for Derbyshire in two days hence. Georgiana wrinkled her brow. Lady Alexandra said nothing of our returning to Pemberley this soon, brother. In fact, she has promised to attend an exhibition, and I am to be her guest. Lady Alexandra has said nothing because I have not informed her. I am under no obligation to clear my schedule with her, young lady. She will not be joining us on this trip. I assume she will remain in town for the rest of the season. At least, that was his hope. 
he was eager to be away from her, especially now when Elizabeth and he were having troubles. Why must I return because you have been called back to Pemberley, especially since I might well remain in town with Lady Alexandra and Miss Ansley? It is out of the question. Brother, you must stop being as unyielding as you are. I made one mistake. I have since learned my lesson. Surely I can be trusted to remain in town under the supervision of Lady Alexandra, my own flesh and blood. Georgiana, I assure you that I know what is best for you, and I am not convinced that our aunt is the ideal person to influence you at this time in your life. Then I suppose you believe your wife is the better influence. Why do you suffer this uncharitable attitude towards Mrs. Darcy? Oh, trust me, brother, it is not my attitude towards your wife with which you should concern yourself, but rather your own. My attitude? Oh, tread lightly, young lady. She folded her arms in defiance. Yes, your attitude. Your wife suffers just as much under your stern rule as the rest of us. Are you too fond of your own opinion to see that? But as I suspect that someone else has planted such ridiculous notions in your head, I shall not fault you for your gullibility. However, I do demand an apology. Oh, I will apologize. I apologize. There, are you satisfied? Darcy stood and walked over to his desk. Taking a seat, he said, Hardly, but I suppose that will have to do. You and I will discuss this matter later. Effectively dismissed, Georgiana stormed from the room and slammed the heavy door. Darcy rubbed his temples. What a pleasant journey to Pemberley I have to look forward to. Indeed, what with the two most important women in his life angry with him, the trip would be quite arduous. He would make that the three most important women in his life, but whether Lady Alexandra would be upset or jubilant over his plans was an uncertainty. As regarded his wife and his young sister, he was flummoxed. Why is it that neither of them can see that everything I do is for their own good? When did I lose control? Chapter 12 Georgiana lightly tapped on the door before opening it. She cleared her throat, garnering Elizabeth's attention. Georgiana, please come inside. Make yourself comfortable. Elizabeth put her writing aside and turned to face her sister-in-law. The younger woman strolled over to the chair closest to Elizabeth and sat. I pray, Elizabeth, I am not disturbing you this morning. If I am, then you only need to say so and I will be on my way. Now, do not be ridiculous. I long for any chance to spend time with you. We are sisters. It is incumbent upon us to get to know each other better. That is what my brother says. Elizabeth furrowed her brow. You mean to say you are here because your brother told you to spend time with me? No, well, not in so many words, Georgiana hesitated. Opening and then closing her mouth, she finally said, You see, he knows how much I enjoyed getting to know my aunt and spending time in her company. You have made no secret of your disappointment over our sudden return to Pemberley. Not that Georgiana was the only one disheartened by Darcy's decision to shorten their stay in town. Elizabeth thought it was ironic that both she and Georgiana attributed Darcy's motives to his desire to separate them from their beloved aunts. Fitzwilliam advocated my time would be better spent with you than with Lady Alexandra. I do not mean to come between you two. I am terribly fond of my own aunt— so I understand you're wanting to know Lady Alexandra better. Always prim and proper, Georgiana sat up straighter. Her eyes brightened. Oh, yes, she means the world to me. There is so much more that I want to know about her. Whenever we are together, my head fills with so many questions. I can hardly wait until she returns to Pemberley when the season ends. Georgiana then folded her hands in her lap and lowered her voice. Forgive me, Elizabeth. I know how much you dislike Lady Alexandra. Why do you say such a thing? I bear no ill feelings toward her ladyship. Then you must forgive me for speaking out of turn. Although I would not fault you should you bear my aunt ill will. 
Lady Alexandra has not endeavoured to make your life very pleasant. <laughs> that is true, but there is something you should know about me. My courage always rises in the face of any attempts to intimidate me. Georgiana smiled. I admire that about you, Elizabeth. My aunts, all of them, are rather fond of stating their opinions. I could not manage them with half as much ease as you. Elizabeth placed her hand on Georgiana's. Leaning forward, she said, There is a secret to dealing with your aunts. Georgiana's eyes widened. You must tell me, just in case I should ever need it. The secret is, one must not take your aunts as seriously as they take themselves. Georgiana covered her mouth. After a moment, she said, I shall endeavour to remember that. Less than a week later, Richard sat across from Darcy in the study. I never thought I would see you here at Pemberley, especially at this time of year. I never expected to be here, but it seems as if my father has matters needing attention in Matlock that only I can handle. So, here I am. Do you intend to stay with us for a spell? Heaven knows I could stand your company. Is there trouble in paradise? That is an understatement. Neither my wife nor my sister has forgiven me for cutting our stay in town short. Can you fault them? What are rocks and streams in comparison to beautiful gowns and private balls at the height of the season? Darcy rolled his eyes. Frankly, I have had enough of town to last a lifetime. Uh, speaking of town, you will never guess who has been seen round and about London. Perhaps you will enlighten me. I shall indeed, my friend, gladly. I speak of no other than your would-be brother. Are you determined to make me regret confiding in you? <laughs> indeed, you know you can trust me. I am simply having a bit of fun. Yes, at my expense. A favourite pastime of yours, no doubt. The fact is that I am not terribly surprised by your news. I received word from my solicitor that the investigator, whom I engaged to keep track of Wickham's escapades while he was in Hertfordshire, was relieved of his services once Wickham left the area. He did not travel to Brighton with the militia. Wickham was believed to have resigned his commission, apparently with uh, little difficulty. Furthermore, all his Meriton debts were properly settled. That is some cause for relief. Indeed, the Bennets are safe. In the end, that is all that matters to me. Your wife must be relieved as well. Darcy said nothing. Surely you have told your wife of Wickham's treachery by now? No, I have not. My wife and I do not speak of George Wickham. Why in high heaven would we? She knows that I detest the man. Then you and she should not have discussed the events that precipitated your hasty decision to marry. Mrs. Darcy insists that she and Wickham suffered a misunderstanding. If she refuses to be more forthcoming on the subject, I am loath to pressure her. I suppose it is better to not invoke trouble where there is tranquillity. Indeed. In a matter of weeks, Elizabeth and Georgiana had learned to appreciate the camaraderie of their newfound sisterly affection. Each day found them in each other's company much to Darcy's delight as well as his dismay, judging by his eagerness to engage them in conversation at dinner and the subsequent lacklustre reception coming especially from his sister. Georgiana's steadfast companionship went a long way in easing Elizabeth's anxiety over missing her dearest sister Jane and her closest friend Charlotte, especially now. Her initial supposition, so eagerly shared with Charlotte whilst in Hunsford, had proved for naught, owing instead to a case of unpredictable menses. How disappointed she had been. Although barely a matter of weeks, her menses had failed to arrive during the regular period again. Hardly enough time to truly suspect, but surely enough time to hope. You are unusually quiet this morning, Elizabeth. Georgiana said once her sister took a break from gardening. Elizabeth removed her gloves and wiped the tiny pearl of sweat from her brow. She had done nothing out of the ordinary since getting out of bed, yet she felt quite ill. I fear I have misjudged this morning's sun. Perhaps we should return to the manor house. I hope you do not mind my saying, but 
You look peaked. I shall be fine. I think I will have a seat in the shade for a moment or two. Do you mind? Of course not. I shall join you. A few steps into their path to a shaded spot, Elizabeth tightly squeezed her eyes. A bout of dizziness, along with nausea, ensued. Oh, Georgiana, do you suppose you might help me back to the house? I, I, she said, just before the world around her faded. You gave us all quite a scare, Mrs. Darcy, said Dr. Davies, when the last of the maids quitted the room. Elizabeth placed both hands on her temple. She shuddered to think of what might have happened had Georgiana not been by her side. She closed and massaged her eyes before opening them again. She could hardly account for her mishap. Do you recollect how you felt leading up to that moment? the doctor said. I remember the dizziness. My stomach felt a bit queasy. By now, Elizabeth realised the saddening truth. Her menses had come. Your sister said you fainted. Elizabeth hardly knew what to say. Such was the state of her busy mind. Another month. Another dose of disappointed hopes. Yes, yet never before have I fainted a day in my life. Why now? There are any number of causes, Mrs. Darcy. Your sister also said you and Mr. Darcy enjoyed an early morning ride, that you enjoyed your routine stroll around the park as well as spent an hour with her in the garden. When considering how hot the sun is today, I would ascribe your collapse to a combination of those factors. He handed her a cup of tea, a special blend he had prescribed for the cook to prepare. "'Drink this, Mrs. Darcy. It shall help you rest.' Too tired to object, she took several sips. A persistent doubt demanded satisfaction. "'Dr. Davis, may I be entirely frank?' "'I insist upon it.' "'I must know. My menses. I had not... Is it possible?' He placed his hand on hers. Mrs. Darcy, has it been uh, a long time since you last had your menses? My menses have been irregular enough of late, thus consistently giving rise to hope and subsequent disappointment. Upon examining you, Mrs. Darcy, I would say there is no cause to believe that you are suffering from anything other than a normal onset. His eyes filled with concern. You are a young bride. You are anxious to conceive Pemberley's heir. I understand. However, I must caution you of the risks. By now, the effect of the herb tea was taking its toll. Her eyes begged the doctor to continue his speech. Forgive me, Mrs. Darcy, for I fear what I am about to tell you will not be easy to hear. Perhaps I should speak with you and your husband together. No, no, I would have you keep what is discussed solely between the two of us. Very well, then. All evidence suggests you are of strong constitution. However, owing to your slender physique, your delivery will likely be wrought with complications. You strike me as someone who is far too intelligent not to know what havoc such difficulties wreak. Elizabeth said nothing. Mrs. Darcy, I do not mean to add to your burdens. I know as well as anyone that it is vital that you and your husband beget Pemberley's heir, but I would be remiss if I did not sufficiently enlighten you to the added risks that you and your husband must consider. Elizabeth had gathered enough from her recent discussions with Georgiana to suspect what the doctor had refrained from coming right out and saying. The Darcy's family history included several accounts of untimely deaths pursuant to childbirth. Georgiana's mother died during childbirth. Georgiana's grandmother died during childbirth as well. He all but told her to hope for the best and to prepare for the worst. Slender physique? delivery complications. He did not know anything about her. Elizabeth sniffed back her tears. 
she would show him. I will not burden my husband with your prognosis, and I insist that you do not go against my wishes in this matter. The doctor started packing his bag. What would you have me say to your husband? Surely his staff has alerted him to my presence. No doubt he will be here momentarily, demanding an explanation of what happened, as well as a full account of everything we discussed, along with my prognosis. You may tell him anything you like. You may tell him what you told me, that I collapsed from the sweltering heat. However, Dr. Davies, as much as I respect your years of service to the Darcy family, I do not subscribe to your opinions. I will leave you now. I urge you to reconsider, Mrs. Darcy. In the meantime, see that you get plenty of rest for the next few days or so. I shall return tomorrow. Desolation overcame Elizabeth the instant the doctor quitted the room. She mulled over his words, yet found none of them capable of diminishing her emptiness. Weeks? Months? How long would it take until she conceived? Darcy raced into the house and tore up the grand marble staircase. He stopped shy of colliding with the physician as the latter made his way down the stairs. Mr. Darcy, uh, your wife is resting. If you will... Uh... I wish to speak with you. Dr. Davies had been his family's physician for decades. Normally jovial, today his air portended gloom. In silence, Darcy headed down the stairs to his study. The two of them now seated, the doctor said, Mrs. Darcy asked me not to tell you all that she and I discussed today, but in light of my loyalty to you and in light of your family's history... I fear I must go against her wishes. I insist. Uh, first of all, your wife collapsed, Mr. Darcy. His heart pounded. Collapsed? He jumped to his feet, causing blood to rush to his head. Darcy swallowed. My wife, is she? <laughs> Will she? There is nothing wrong with your wife, per se. At least nothing that a bit of rest will not cure. You need not worry. However, she asked that I not tell you the nature of our subsequent discussion. Those words evoked a chilling effect. He ran his fingers through his hair and then massaged his temple. Did she give a reason? She said she does not want you to bear the burden of the implications of what we discussed. Darcy pursed his lips. What is Elizabeth thinking? Why does she wish to keep anything from me? You mentioned my family's history. Yes, specifically in the case of your mother. Although you and your sister are evidence enough that not all deliveries, no matter how difficult, are life-threatening, the fact is there are no guarantees. Your mother and your wife have more in common than not. Pray tell there is no cause for concern with my wife in that regard. I could not bear it. There are no guarantees in such matters as this, Mr. Darcy. No, you will excuse me. I must go to my wife. I shall see myself out. Moments later, Darcy stood outside Elizabeth's door, summoning his strength. His wife need not suffer the doctor's dire prognosis alone, not so long as there was breath in his body. He opened the door and walked over to her bed. Though her eyes were closed, Evidence of tears existed all over her face. Why had he not noticed it before? Dr. Davis was correct. The similarities between his wife and mother were striking, if not in countenance, certainly in stature. All the pain and emotion of watching his beloved mother during her final hours, on a day not unlike this one, rained down on him. A long-forgotten tightness clinched his chest. His eyes misting with sorrows present and sorrows long past, he recollected his plea. Mother. Mother. His repeated appeal had been met with silence. Darcy vowed such a fate would never befall his wife. Never. Chapter 13 Lady Alexandra ran her gloved hand along the sideboard. 
Then she inspected her fingers. So I am banished from Pemberley once again, this time not by my stern father, but by his unfeeling grandson. With Lady Alexandra's return from London at the end of the season, the last thing Darcy wished was to have her presence in the manor house disrupt its newly established calm and equanimity. In addition, his sister was spending more time becoming acquainted with his wife, a turn of events which pleased him immensely. Darcy looked about the finely decorated parlour. He had gone to considerable lengths to restore the Dowager House to its current state. Even Lady Catherine would be proud of the outcome. I dare say living in the Dowager House hardly qualifies as banishment. Besides, you brought this upon yourself by your uncharitable attitude towards my wife whilst in Kent as well as in town. Darcy walked across the room and stared out the window. The view from where he stood was pleasing. Two tiny squirrels rejoiced at the sight of each other just outside the window. Green hills rolling along the lush landscape, and informal gardens scattering rich colours over acres of the ground's canvas enriched the natural beauty of his beloved home. He saw no reason his aunt should not be just as happy here as she was at the manor house once she had given herself time to embrace his scheme. Moreover, what a difference it would make for his own domestic felicity. You are welcome at the manor house. The only change is that you no longer live there, he said, still peering out the window. I cannot believe you have chosen your wife over your aunt, your own flesh and blood. Turning to face her, he said, Do not be ridiculous. She is Mrs. Darcy, mistress of Pemberley. I have heard it all before, only you neglected to remind me once again that she is also the mother of Pemberley's future heir. Considering what a dismal failure she has been on all fronts, I would think it a great stretch of the imagination to credit her with any such lofty title. With a quick intake of breath, Darcy said, Enough! You are relegated to the Dowager House. Please try your best to deserve it. Shoulders back, arms crossed, he said. A word of caution. Hold your tongue if you expect to receive ready access to the hospitality of the manor house. I am amazed the mistress of Pemberley is not here to gloat. <laughs> she won. You speak of winning when there was never a contest. I have told you this. Pemberley has but one mistress. Her ladyship tilted her head and raised her eyebrow. Then where is she? My wife is resting at the moment. That is strange. She is resting at this hour of day. Is there something you are not telling me? I have told you all that I intend to tell you. If I may return to the situation at hand, you will be comfortable here. I have arranged for all your belongings to be moved. Furthermore, you will have your own household staff. And how shall I pay for all that? Or will the mistress of Pemberley oversee the affairs of the Darger House? Is that not her prerogative? I will not stand for it, nephew. If this is to be my home, then I will have the final say over the management of the household. Darcy swept both hands over his face. As you wish, Lady Alexandra. I have no desire to quarrel. Then you agree that I have final say over the staff, over who comes and goes, over everything? As regards the Dowager House, yes, you have my word. She placed one hand on her hip. I will require a monthly stipend. Naturally, Lady Alexandra, you may have whatever you need to assure your comfort. Speak with Mrs. Darcy to work out the details. Lady Alexandra's expression cut through him like a dagger. I will do no such thing. His aunt's audacity knew no limits. Then speak with my steward. Now, I will leave you to settle into your new home. Darcy bowed. Good day, your ladyship. Lady Alexandra threw her parasol across the room the moment her nephew quitted the house. The nerve of that young man! His audacity knows no limits! She paced back and forth whilst she contemplated her next step. All the disappointment and contempt she held for her deceased father and brother, she determined to direct towards her nephew.
His condescension, his heavy-handed officiousness, she had seen it all before, had lived it. <laughs> well, no more. Lady Alexandra marched down the hallway, determined to put the plans she had laid out whilst in London in motion. Immediately upon entering the room, she calmed. Her mind wandered back to a time of innocence, of hope. This was her grandmother's sitting room. Lady Alexandra's eyes filled with tears. Though the years spent in that room with her beloved grandmother had been few, Lady Alexandra remembered them as some of the best times of her life. She had been more of a mother to Lady Alexandra than a grandmother. Lady Alexandra walked across the room and picked up the miniature of her grandmother's likeness. She traced the delicate pattern of the frame. Carefully returning it to its place, her ladyship turned and looked around. A weak smile mingled with her tears. Grandmother's favourite chair was still situated over by the window. Lady Alexandra would sit in her lap for hours. Oftentimes she fell asleep whilst listening to tales of handsome knights and beautiful princesses. Her ladyship sat in the chair and peered out the window. She espied the flower garden her grandmother had patiently tended. Memories of the scent of her grandmother's roses overwhelmed her senses, and Alexandra closed her eyes and breathed in deeply. Opening her eyes, she observed the desk where she had watched her grandmother write letters to friends and acquaintances. Grandmother loved this room. Indeed, so much so that she refused to move back to the manor house after Lady Alexandra's mother had passed away. She wanted, even encouraged her son to find another bride, someone young and vibrant to be a mother to his young son and daughter, her grandchildren. He never did. Grandmother died in this room. Hours later, her ladyship cast her cherished memories aside and recalled her task. She walked over to the desk, sat down, and commenced her letter-writing campaign. "'What is the meaning of this summons, nephew?' Lady Alexandra said, entering Darcy's study without waiting to be announced. Darcy folded his paper and peered at his aunt. Over the past few weeks, the influx of strange men and women coming and going from the Dowager House had driven him to distraction. That morning, whilst enjoying a horseback ride, Darcy espied what he supposed was a gentleman caller from the day before leaving Pemberley. Lady Alexandra, I have asked you here this morning to discuss a matter of grave importance. She crossed her arms in front of her chest, but remained silent. Am I correct in assuming that the gentleman I saw leaving my estate some hours earlier was your guest for the entire evening? Suppose he was. How does that concern you? Darcy raised his brow deliberately. Have you no concern for your reputation, Lady Alexandra? Oh, please, nephew, do not pretend to be sanctimonious with me. One would think you are not a married man by your attitude. The point is that I am married. You are absurd, nephew. And your behaviour is scandalous. Darcy carefully measured his tone. Therefore, I have decided to make a few changes as regards your association with Georgiana. He tightened his expression. I will not forbid you from visiting her here, but she is no longer allowed to visit you at the Dowager House. How dare you endeavour to interfere in my relationship with my own niece? This is your doing, Lady Alexandra. My sister is young and impressionable, and whilst you may think that your behaviour is entirely appropriate, I will not have Georgiana thinking your manner of comporting yourself is proper. Lady Alexandra placed both hands on his desk and leaned forward. Do not do this, nephew. Surely you must know I would not do anything that is deemed improper whilst in Georgiana's company. No, Lady Alexandra, I know no such thing. He reached for some papers on his desk, signalling an end to the discussion. Fitzwilliam, I beg you to reconsider. My mind is made up. His eyes met hers briefly before he resumed his perusal of his papers. Now, if you will excuse me, I have other matters to attend this morning.
A week later, after Lady Alexandra had made such a fuss of inviting the Darcys to dine with her at the Dowager House, Elizabeth obligingly accepted. Persuading her husband had not been easy, owing to his disappointment over her ladyship's recent conduct. Last-minute estate business prevented Darcy from accompanying his wife, so she decided to enjoy a leisurely stroll down the long lane to the Dowager House alone. Having been shown into the parlour, Elizabeth walked about the room and took note of some of the changes her ladyship had made over the past weeks. Apparently, Lady Alexandra and her nephew had different notions of what was considered stylish. The furniture and arrangements had a decidedly feminine flair. Once having seen everything there was to see in the newly renovated room, Elizabeth looked at the mantel clock. What on earth is keeping her ladyship? Elizabeth was about to take a seat when a servant opened the doors, and in waltzed the last person in the world Elizabeth wished to see. She gasped aloud. Mr Wickham! Wh what are you doing here? How awkward! this being the first time the two had met face to face since their encounter at the Netherfield Ball. She had supposed she had seen the last of him back in Hertfordshire. Elizabeth had taken extraordinary measures to make certain that her sisters felt no obligation to inform her of the gentleman's comings and goings in Meryton whenever they wrote to her. So long as he kept his distance from her younger sisters, she could not have cared less about him, and all evidence suggested he was doing just that. Nonetheless, when Jane wrote of the militia regiments relocating to Brighton, she felt comfortable that he was amongst them. He bowed. Before he opened his mouth, Lady Alexandra entered the room. Mrs. Darcy, do you forget yourself? Mr. Wickham is my particular guest. Elizabeth's eyes widened. Her mouth fell open. You and the gentleman are acquainted? Indeed, we met in London. He and I share a history, for as it turns out, Pemberley is the only home he has ever known. Wickham walked to Elizabeth's side with long strides. It is a pleasure seeing you again. I shall look forward to renewing our acquaintance. Elizabeth stepped back. All eyes turned to the door when Darcy entered the room. He glared at Wickham. He turned his impenetrable stare on his aunt. You go too far. Darcy walked to Elizabeth and extended his arm. Mrs. Darcy. Taking his lead, Elizabeth walked out the room and out of the house without a word. The silence was unbearable to Elizabeth's way of thinking. She wished he would say something, anything. Clearly, he was livid. Finally, Elizabeth interrupted his quiet outrage. What do you suppose your aunt is about in inviting Mr. Wickham into her home? I have no idea, but I will know soon enough. Darcy sat at his desk with his hands buried in his hair. Why does Lady Alexandra hate me so? Is there nothing she will not do to smite me? Surely that foul man told her he is banished from Pemberley. What are they about? The belligerent smirk on her face when she entered his study did not help. Prepared to do battle, Darcy stood and confronted his aunt. How dare you invite that gentleman to my home? Did I fail to make it clear to you that he is not welcomed here? Your home? <laughs> Mr. Wickham is my guest. Why do you hate me? Why do you hate him? Darcy ran his fingers through his hair. I do not hate him. I simply cannot abide him. He is an immoral man. Oh, for heaven's sake, nephew, who are you to judge? Why invite him of all people? Then... With the suddenness of a crashing lightning strike, it all came together. You know, my father's dying confession. He said Wickham is a Darcy. You have known the truth all along. Her ladyship's eyes widened. Your father confessed to you? Darcy's heart raced. Then it is true? Wickham is my father's bastard son? Is, is that what you think? Is that why you detest him? 
Darcy said nothing. His aunt's words and their implications hurt too much. Suspecting was one thing, but knowing... Oh, Fitzwilliam, it is true. George is a Darcy by birth. However, he is not your father's son. George is my son. Darcy jerked his head back. Your son? How is that possible? My story is a long, sad, incredible tale. One that involves young love, scandal, lies, and ultimate betrayal. I remember old Mr. Wickham rather fondly. He was a good man. He loved his son. George is not the son of the steward. My dear father was ruthless in his scheme to hide my shame, but not wanting to punish the baby, he took it upon himself to give the child to a family that would assure his place at Pemberley. Her ladyship sat with her nephew and spoke at length about the sordid details of her decades-long tribulation. My father, she said, did not know that I was with child when he sent my suitor, Mr. Stanley Elliot, away. Even if he had known, it is doubtful he would have allowed me to marry someone of Mr. Elliot's standing in the community, or rather lack thereof. Lady Alexandra stood and walked over to a portrait of her late father. Your grandfather paid Mr. Elliot to stay away from me. I do not blame him for taking the money, mind you. He had no choice. He took the money for his family's salvation, for my father forced the Elliots to leave Derbyshire. Mr. Elliot went away to serve in the Navy. He died at sea within weeks of setting sail, never having learnt of my condition. Months later, after having learnt of my situation, your grandfather deemed me a disgrace to the Darcy name. He arranged for the baby's welfare upon its birth, and he arranged my marriage to a titled, if not very wealthy, gentleman. Her voice cracking with anguish, she paused to rein in her emotions before continuing her speech. Mrs. Wickham, the steward's wife, travelled with me to Scotland, where she remained with me throughout my confinement. Thereafter, she returned to Pemberley with the infant, with my child, intent to raise him as her own. I subsequently travelled to the continent to marry my aristocrat, according to my father's scheme. My noble husband was to have a substantial fortune and me to boot, yet not be burdened with the task of claiming another man's bastard child as his own. You see, nephew, my marriage was not one of love, but rather one of convenience. I have to believe I was banished from Pemberley, not because my father did not love me, but so as not to threaten the Darcy reputation, the reputation of Pemberley and its heirs, and not to interfere with the prospective courtship between my brother and the beautiful young Lady Anne Fitzwilliam. Her ladyship dabbed at her eyes with her handkerchief. In my brother's defence, he supposed I had left England in anger over my father's denial of my true love and his role in sending Mr. Elliot away. Your father, my own brother, did not even know of my actual scandal. Lady Alexandra told Darcy that his father had written to her years ago, saying he only had learned of Wickham's true parentage when his steward was dying. Old Mr. Wickham had not wished to take the secret to his grave. To the extent possible, her brother had wanted her son raised in a manner as befitting a Darcy. Darcy said, This is a sad and sorry tale. However, it changes nothing as regards my sentiments towards Wickham. Darcy told his aunt what Wickham attempted with his sister. However, her ladyship expressed no surprise by the revelation. That is unfortunate indeed, although my news renders George's actions towards your sister rather less debauched. Georgiana will forgive him, I am certain of it. Perhaps she will be open to an alliance once again. My son's benefiting from the Darcy fortune is apt. I dare say my sister will want to have nothing to do with that scoundrel. Perhaps 
You do not know Georgiana as well as you think you do. His eyes widened. What are you suggesting? Have you spoken with Georgiana about this? I confided the truth to her. She is not a child, and it is about time you recognize that. How dare you? She would have found out anyway. Besides, Georgiana had already told me what happened between her and my son before I confided in her. You had no right to speak with Georgiana about such a delicate topic as this without first obtaining my permission. Nephew, you think far too highly of your status as Georgiana's guardian. To me, you are her older brother, not her parent. My rights as her aunt are equal to yours before God, even if not the law. Enough! Her eyes cold and her sharp voice raised, she said, You are just like your father. Just as he is his father's son, you are your father's son. Tell me that if Georgiana fell in love with someone you deemed beneath her, and heaven forbid a child was conceived out of that love, you would not go through extraordinary lengths to hide the truth from the world. Darcy opened his mouth to protest, but then closed it, choosing instead to remain silent. You cannot deny that you would do anything to protect the Darcy name, to protect your precious Pemberley from scandal and dishonour. My own father wanted nothing to do with my shame. He banished me from Pemberley, as I am sure you too would do to your own sister should she suffer a fall from grace. You do not know anything about me, Lady Alexandra. I know you, nephew. I look at you and all I see is your father, my brother. Do you know what else he did when he discovered the truth? When he wrote to me, it was not to welcome me back to Pemberley. He wrote to tell me that he would rather things continue as my father had planned. He told me that his wife did not know the truth, and he had no wish that she should find out, not knowing how such a scandalous family secret would affect her. After your mother had passed, his excuse was that he did not want the scandal to taint the legacy of you and your sister. His rationale was that I had a good life, that he saw no need to disturb the plan our father had made. She leaned back and crossed her arms. Can you believe it? Her head shaking, she harumphed. Hm, as sure a case of like father like son as one would imagine. Of course you can believe it. The three of you were cut from the same cloth. So yes, nephew, I know you. Darcy frowned. Why was she impugning him by his father and grandfather's behaviour? Darcy said nothing. Lady Alexandra continued. My brother offered me financial support, which I, of course, refused. He promised me that he would take care of my child, to take him under his wing, to educate him, and to bequeath him the living in Kempton. You said you know what Wickham tried to do to my sister. Do you not know that my father did bequeath him the living? Wickham did not want it. He demanded that I give him the money, which I did, to the sum of three thousand pounds. I further stipulated that he was never to set foot on the estate again. Well, that was then, and this is now. George is returned, and I have every intention that he will stay as long as he wishes. <laughs> Am I supposed to pay his way as well? I expect you to honour the terms of your father's last will and testament. It is too late. The living has been given to another, to a gentleman who is worthy. Then I will expect you to make other arrangements for my son. He is a Darcy. He is entitled to his share of the Darcy fortune. His posture stiffened. Your son is no more entitled to a share of the Darcy fortune than you are, Lady Alexandra. You will do well to remember that. You are here because I allow you to be here. You mean to say you will do nothing on George's behalf, even now, when you know the truth? The truth? Now that I know the truth, I am even less inclined to act on his behalf than ever before. Why are you so heartless? Darcy ran his fingers through his hair. After a hard swallow, he said, Lady Alexandra, I do not mean to upset you. I am saddened by the hardships you have endured and that you have lived with this secret for so long. 
Darcy stood from his chair. It has been a very trying day. Let us resume this discussion tomorrow. Some hours later, Darcy walked into his wife's apartment and took a seat on the sofa beside her. I came to see how you are doing in light of all the confusion this evening. Are you all right? Elizabeth laid her book aside. I suppose the better question is to inquire if you are all right. You look as if you have seen a ghost. Having contemplated how much of what his aunt had confided in him he wished to discuss with his wife, and still having failed to reach a decision, he simply took her by the hand. How did your interview go with your aunt? He gently squeezed her hand. The situation is worse than anything I might have imagined. He then pulled her into his lap and rested his chin atop her head. I fear our lives will never be the same. Chapter 14 The next day, Georgiana looked up from the pianoforte when he walked into the music room. Tall, handsome, he had not changed a bit. With a practised smile, he strolled over to the instrument, clapping his hands. Bravo! In all my travels, I have yet to meet anyone who equals you in your mastery of the pianoforte. George, Lady Alexandra said you might arrive this week. She stood from her seat, raced over to where he stood, and curtsied. He accepted her proffered hand and bowed. Dearest Georgiana, what a pleasure it is to see you once again. I wish everyone here at Pemberley welcomed me as wholeheartedly as this. If you are speaking of my brother and his bride, you must give them time. If not for the fact that uh, Lady Alexandra took me into her confidence, I confess that I might have suffered some measure of reservation over your being here as well. Now I can honestly say that I am delighted you have returned. Indeed. <laughs> you cannot imagine how pleased I was when her ladyship told me that you looked forward to renewing our acquaintance. As much as I love Pemberley and shall always consider it my home, I would not have returned had I thought it meant causing you a modicum of discomfort. He cupped her hand in his. It is fortunate that you are willing to consider the misunderstanding between us uh, a thing of the past. We have always been close, you and I. Now we are even closer. Wickham offered her his arm, which she eagerly accepted and the two walked to the pianoforte. He sat beside her. There was no hiding the effect of his tender words on her eager sensibilities. Now that you are family, and my brother has allowed you to return to Pemberley, perhaps... Please, dearest Georgiana, I know what you're about to say. It is best left unspoken. He patted her hand. Surely you must know that I carry the memories of our years together at Pemberley closest to my heart. Those were some of the best days of my life. How can I help caring for you? His countenance clouded. You know your brother as well as anyone, I dare say. You know how his good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. <laughs> to say nothing of his temper, he prides himself on the fact that it is most resentful. Wickham, hardly knowing how to look, busied himself by flipping through the selection of music sheets. Darcy and I have a long way to go before we regain even a semblance of our former rapport. I would not do anything to give him an excuse to deny me my rightful place. As heir and master of Pemberley, he retains that right. Any resumption of my attentions towards you, as honest and pure as you and I know it would be, he would regard with contempt. Taking care that she read more in his words than a less sentimental young lady might, he took her hand in his and caressed it. I have always cared for you, dearest Georgiana, in a very special way. Since learning that we are cousins, my feelings have only increased. Let us be contented with the knowledge that, in spite of our tender regard, it was not meant to be. For we are family. Thus we have no need for any greater ties between us. 
So long as you and I know how special the unbreakable bond is between us, my heart is at ease. I would beg that you consider yours similarly. He raised her hand to his lips and kissed it with affectionate gallantry. Persuaded by the sincerity of his plea, Georgiana, whose sentimental heart had always retained a strong impression of his kindness to her as a child, protested no more. The two cousins selected a piece, and she played whilst he turned the pages for a half hour. When Wickham stood to leave, Georgiana, with all the sensibilities of a young girl of sixteen, watched him walk away with the satisfaction of knowing that her love for her cousin George had not been in vain. That following evening at dinner, Wickham's simpering caused Darcy to lose his appetite. Each course was as unappealing as the one before. Venison, roast beef, salmon. Why, these were all Wickham's favourites. Appalled and disgusted by the easy acceptance by his wife and his sister of the scoundrel, Darcy silently fumed throughout the meal. Not that anyone noticed. Wickham's easy manners made him the life of the party. Georgiana may have won my wife over to her cause, eliciting Elizabeth's support in allowing Cousin George to be welcomed at Pemberley, but she will have no luck in persuading me. This is all Lady Alexandra's doing. In light of Georgiana's history with the scoundrel, she should never have forgiven him. Surely she has acquiesced for our aunt's sake. Lady Alexandra employed those very tactics on me, saying she deserves to know her son. Pemberley is the only home she has, and it is the only home he knows as well. <laughs> now look at me, sitting at the head of my own dinner table, honouring the last man in the world with whom I would wish to break bread, and welcoming him into the Darcy fold. Is there a worse fate I might endure? If so... I would do so with relish rather than sit across the table from him for the rest of my life. Finally, the last course ended. Elizabeth stood, signalling the women to adjourn to the parlour. Darcy stood. I believe we shall forego port and accompany you ladies. Lady Alexandra looked at him purposely. I see no need to abandon formalities, nephew, even though we are all family. Besides, I believe George has a matter he wishes to discuss with you. She turned to Wickham and said, Do you not, son? After the ladies quitted the room, Darcy relinquished all pretense of civility towards his unwanted guest. Get on with it, for heaven's sake. What do you wish to discuss with me? The footman endeavoured to fill Darcy's glass with port, a service he hastily dismissed. Wickham readily accepted his drink. There is the matter of your father's will. That is a matter long resolved. You said you had no interest in the living. In turn, I gave you a sizable amount of money. Yes, but that was before I appreciated the significance of your father's... Uh, my uncle's intent. He meant for me to live comfortably for the rest of my days. Had I known he intended the living as my legacy, I should not have turned it down. <laughs> my uncle knew me better than I knew myself, and I must now consider that the living would have been such a thing for me. Surely the quiet, the retirement of such a life, would have answered all my ideas of happiness. This discussion is immaterial. The living belongs to another. There is nothing to be done. I have determined what I consider a fair exchange. No doubt, Darcy said. He took a cigar from the humidor, prepared and lit it, and took a puff. Well, what is it? You might grant me the annual value of the living, in perpetuity. Darcy nearly choked, not from the smoke he had just inhaled, but rather Wickham's audacity. You are a fool if you think you will receive a farthing from me. Wickham stood and straightened his coat. He brushed his sleeve. So, have you given any consideration to how your Fitzwilliam relatives and society, for that matter, will react to my happy news? It is not every day that one learns he is the son of an aristocrat and the first cousin of the heir of Pemberley. Wickham picked up his glass and took a long swallow. 
The loud sound that vibrated through the room when he slammed it down on the table startled the footman. You and I will continue our talk in the morning when you have had time to sleep on my proposal. Do you really think you hold some sway over me? Who do you think you are? By all accounts, I am Lady Alexandra's one and only child. I, too, am a Darcy. I think I am entitled by birthright. I think you are delusional. Darcy leaned back in his chair. You had better run along and bask in the bosom of your recently acknowledged mother while you can and stop wasting your time with me. Though you are blessed with such happy manners, if I know anything at all about you... I feel rather certain that you will soon find a way to alienate her. Hours later, Darcy walked into Elizabeth's apartment and sat beside her on the sofa. You were uncommonly quiet this evening, she said after closing her book. Drumming his fingers on the sofa's arm, Darcy said, The night was a disaster. Elizabeth tucked her knees underneath her and began braiding her long hair. Quite the contrary. I consider tonight an unmitigated success. Why? Is it because I managed not to wring Wickham's smug neck? Darcy rolled his eyes with displeasure. You will not believe what the man asked of me after dinner. I can imagine. Now that he has taken leave of the militia, he must be rather listless. Please, spare me his tales of woe. I owe him nothing. Elizabeth remained silent. I am amazed that you are unable to see the man as he is, and that you so readily accept him as someone of good intent. I told you before, it is important to Georgiana that we all get along. My sister is young and naive. She likes to believe there is good in everyone. I might expect such foolishness from her, but if you knew her history with the man, then you would not be so forgiving. Georgiana told me what happened. She did? He rubbed the back of his neck and narrowed his eyes. Did you give her an account of your own unfortunate history with the man? Elizabeth flipped her long braid over her shoulder and crossed her arms. Indeed, I did not. However, as I told you, what happened between Mr. Wickham and me was merely an unfortunate mis misunderstanding, of course. Darcy reached out and placed his hands on her face, silently questioning, wondering. Why will she not tell me what happened that evening at the Netherfield Ball? Is she harbouring tender feelings for him still? He removed his hands, stood, and walked away. Stopping at the door adjoining their suites, he turned and looked back at his wife. I leave for Matlock in the morning. After a moment of indecision, owing to her startled expression, he said, Good night, Mrs. Darcy. What a ridiculous argument! After hours of tossing and turning in his empty bed, he managed to capture a few hours of sleep. He awakened during the early dawn. After dressing, he resolved to go to her room and apologise for his curtness, and to explain his purpose in going to Matlock. She was sound asleep when he looked in on her. Her lush eyelashes swept her cheeks, her lips were slightly parted. A tempting prospect indeed. He leaned down kissed her forehead, and spoke softly. I shall return soon. Darcy and his cousin Richard sat in Lord Matlock's study partaking of his finest liquor. Richard twirled the dark amber beverage in his glass. Oh, this must surely put your mind at ease, he said. How so? Now you know your father has not hidden his illegitimate son in plain sight all these years. I know not which is worse, the prospect of an illegitimate brother or the knowledge of my aunt's scandal. This must certainly bring shame upon the Darcy family legacy. I assure you the Fitzwilliams will be none too pleased either. This is exactly why I must be the one to bring this to light. I dare not yield so much power to the likes of George Wickham. I do not know. For the right price he might be persuaded to keep this information to himself. No, I'm afraid he is far too greedy and envious of me for that. He would want more from me than I would ever allow. Besides, I will not have this hanging over my head. I shall tell Lord and Lady Matlock, and thereafter, let things fall wherever they may. Need I remind you of what this will mean to Lady Catherine? said Richard, his brow arched. 
Given how Lady Catherine and Lady Alexandra were at loggerheads at Rosings, I suspect the former will be delighted with the revelation. Richard nodded. You might just have a point. Darcy stood and stretched his long legs. I'm off to speak with your parents. <laughs> Wish me luck. Richard stood to join him. I think I will accompany you. Moral support and all that, you know. Hoping for the best whilst preparing for the worst, Darcy accepted any support he could find. One thing was certain. He would never forsake his father's only sibling, his aunt, Lady Alexandra. She had suffered enough. Meanwhile, the Dowager House inhabitants were settling into their own routine. For heaven's sake, what has you in such a state this morning? All that door slamming and barking at the servants is enough to wake the dead. Wickham spoke not a word. He marched straight to the sideboard and helped himself to coffee. Lady Alexandra pretended she did not notice as he slipped a flask from his jacket and laced his drink. How was your meeting with my nephew? Or need I ask? His handsome face grimaced. Your nephew left Pemberley at the break of dawn, according to old Lady Reynolds. She refused to tell me where he went or when he might return. Surely urgent business must have come up. It is unlike him to leave his wife so abruptly. How would you know such a thing? You met him only a few months before you met me. Her ladyship's heart sank with his indictment. What brought about all this newfound bitterness? At their meetings in London, from their initial introduction to their parting, had been filled with affection, even gratitude. Yes, there was remorse, but all on her side. He had embraced her from the start, accepted her benevolence, and accepted her. Wickham peppered his voice with a modicum of deference. What I meant to say is, uh, I have known your nephew all my life. Between the two of us, I am the better judge of his character. She walked to him, removed his cup from his hand, and placed it on the sideboard. Come and have a seat. I have something for you. She led him to a sofa where both took their seats. Lady Alexandra opened a small, ornate box that sat on the table and retrieved its contents. This is all I have left to remind me of your father. I have cherished it for years. I want you to have it. With a long look, she handed the ring to her son. A large, sturdy band of gold surrounding an oval sapphire. Wickham accepted the ring with a plum. With a practised eye, he raised his hand, commanding a better view. It is a thing that must surely capture the applause of a besotted young woman. I dare say it will not fetch much at any of Lambton's pawn shops. It might fetch a bit more in London. Wickham placed the ring in his pocket. Have you anything else of significance you wish to pass along? Perhaps something of the heralded Darcy family heirlooms? I seem to recall Pemberley's last mistress adorned in jewels worthy of a queen. Lady Alexandra retrieved the ring from her son's pocket and placed it upon his finger. A better fit she could not imagine. Nothing in my possession compares to this ring's worth, which is why I want you to have it, son. Wear it proudly. It belonged to your father and his father before him. Whilst it is true the Elliots were not rich, they were proud. Above all, they were honourable. <laughs> that may be, but neither honour nor pride means much without a respectable fortune. Now that I know my true heritage, I will settle for nothing else. You speak foolishness, my son. I have no claim on Pemberley. Surely you realise you have none as well. As far as I know, there are only two living Darcy males. Once we announce my connections to the world, and so long as Darcy does not beget an heir, what is to prevent my inheriting everything? <laughs> Especially if Pemberley is entailed. Pemberley is not entailed. You studied law, did you not? Surely you know you have no legacy as regards Pemberley. Both you and I are at the mercy of my nephew's benevolence. Your benevolent nephew is not immortal. As it stands today, he has no heir apparent. 
I intend to look into the matter. I may be entitled to more than any of us is aware. His tone took on an air of defiance. You may decide against helping me, but you will not stand in my way. Lady Alexandra shook her head and placed her hand on his arm. Please, son, do not give me cause for regret in having brought you back to Pemberley. Jerking his arm away, he said, Spare me your feigned concern, mother. You and I both know what my being here is all about. It has nothing to do with your latent maternal feelings. You brought me here to spite Darcy. You meant to use me as a pawn in your scheme to get back at him for refusing to allow you to have your way in his home. How dare you suggest such a thing? Do you really think me so petty? I do not know what to make of you, Lady Alexandra. I mean to make up for... Wickham held up his hand. I have heard enough excuses and apologies to last a lifetime. The decision to leave Pemberley may not have been yours, but it was your decision to stay away. You could have returned at any time. You might have been a mother to me instead of denying me my birthright and allowing me to be raised as the son of a servant. The Wickhams were decent, respectable people. Your parents were hardly deemed servants. But then again, that is the point. They were never my parents, were they? My true parents were wealthy, one of the most respected families in all of Derbyshire. All of the respect in the world would not have survived my scandal. There, she said it. For the first time in her life, she owned her shame. Son, I'm afraid, Lady Alexandra, you have not earned the right to refer to me as such. Of course, you are right, George. However, as I told you in London, your father was not a wealthy man. Had he been a man of means, your life would have been completely different. I know my father would have accepted him. The scandal would not have existed, and I would have raised you as my son. The footman entered the room. Sir Thorpe has arrived, your ladyship. Wickham narrowed his eyes. What in the hell is he doing here? Embarrassed, Lady Alexandra pursed her lips. Thank you, Thomas. Please allow me a minute with Mr. Wickham and then show Mr. Thorpe inside. When they were alone, she glared at her son. What is the matter with you? You and Sir Thorpe got along swimmingly in town. I do not trust him. I am sorry to hear that, son. George. He is my guest, just as you are. Wickham shuddered and threw up his hands. Thorpe is the last person I wish to see this morning. He regarded her coldly. I shall return to the manor house. You had much better wait until my nephew returns. He is a reasonable man. Patience is called for if you wish to regain his good opinion. My business will not wait. Darcy will not get away with eschewing my demands. I am not without options. She surely did not like the sound of that. What do you have in mind? You shall see, Lady Alexandra. You shall see. Chapter 15 What a delightful summer morning! What could possibly disrupt this tranquil moment? The sun beamed. The birds struck a merry chorus, and the blue sky boasted fluffy white clouds. Walking along one of her favourite paths, someone's approach roused Elizabeth from her reflections upon her husband's trip to Matlock. Mr. Wickham, how will it be, always in his company now that we are family, and he can come and go at leisure? Before she could strike into another path, he overtook her. Good morning, madam. He touched the rim of his hat and bowed. She smiled wryly. Ever the perfect gentleman. I am on my way to the house to see Darcy, said he. My husband is not at home, as you already know, for Mrs. Reynolds said you were there to see him earlier. Yes, of course, he said, biting his lip. I suppose I shall take advantage of this opportunity to spend time with you. Would you mind if I accompany you on your solitary ramble? That must surely render my solitary stroll rather less solitary. Actually, I realize I must be heading back to the house. 
In my haste to enjoy the fresh morning air, I neglected to attend a few things. Then I shall be happy to escort you back to the manor house. Elizabeth ignored his extended arm. He might be the newest member of their family, but there was no reason for Elizabeth to go out of her way to befriend him. For Georgiana's sake, she would extend him the minimal degree of civility that polite manners and courtesy dictated, nothing more. This was just such an occasion. She might have to walk alongside him, but she certainly did not have to enjoy it. I am glad to have this opportunity to speak with you in private, my dear cousin. What could you have to say to me that would dictate we speak in privacy? I suppose I have been remiss. I never had an opportunity to congratulate you on your engagement and subsequent marriage to Darcy. The weight of his stare disquieted her. The fact is, uh, I consider myself uh, rather cheated. Cheated, Mr. Wickham? Indeed, I asked for your hand in marriage first, you recall. You did, and as I told you then, Mr. Wickham, you could not possibly tempt me to marry you. It ended rather badly, or did you forget? Had you not run away from me, evidently straight into Darcy's arms, then you would be my wife. You were wrong to accept Darcy's proposal without allowing me a chance to apologise for the unfortunate incident that occurred on the terrace, especially since you did not like him. I overheard you say as much that very evening. I came after you to apologise to attempt to make amends for our altercation. Surely you remember. I arrived in the house whilst Darcy was announcing to your mother that you and he were to be married. You saw me. I was standing right there. What is your point, sir? My point is that a life with me is the life you ought to have. I wager you would be far more contented. And now that the truth is known that I, too, am a Darcy blood, you might have all this still. You flatter yourself. My reasoning for marrying Mr. Darcy had nothing to do with all this, as you say, Mr. Wickham. Then why did you marry him when it was but an hour before you accepted his proposal that you swore you would loathe him until eternity? Things change, Mr. Wickham. The fact remains that Mr. Darcy and I are married, and that I would not change for anything in the world. I cannot help but consider that you and I were destined for each other. Thankfully, she had walked fast. She would soon be rid of him. This was not a discussion she wished to continue. It was certainly one she never intended to engage in ever again. At the risk of provoking him, she said, I beg you, Mr. Wickham, not to presume that I would have accepted you under any circumstances. It will make for a more felicitous acquaintance. We are all family. We should do our best to get along with no regrets, no remorse, and no pretending that there was anything other than a certain degree of mutual fondness on either of our parts. If you insist, madam, I shall do my best to oblige your wishes. After all, everything worked out for the best. You got what you wanted all along, a rich husband. Now we may enjoy the best of both worlds, for we are family, and I am here to stay, which means I will be here for you should you ever need more than your pompous husband can provide. Against her unspoken protests, he took her hand and managed to bestow a wet, lingering kiss before she forcibly withdrew. With a lopsided grin, he raked his eyes over her body. And rest assured, madam, my offer stands day and night. Lady Alexandra handed Sir Thorpe a cup of steaming hot tea. It was so kind of you to come as soon as you received my letter. You needed me. There is no other place I would rather be, my lady. He took a sip of tea and then set his cup aside. The tension between you and your son filled the room when I walked in on you too earlier. Have you any regrets, Lady Alexandra, about bringing him to Pemberley? I do not know what has become of my son. 
Things were so much better when we were in town than they have been of late. I thought he had forgiven me, accepted me. But ever since his arrival at Pemberley he has not been the same. Bitterness consumes him. I suppose being here, at his childhood home, and yet not being here in the same standing as Darcy, is a cause for resentment. Mind you, I am not making excuses. I am only making an observation. No, I know you are only trying to help, and I appreciate it. Yes, you can always count on me, Lady Alexandra. I am your faithful servant. He accepted her proffered hand, and she squeezed his hand in turn. You are a true friend. Would that I could be so much more. Lady Alexandra reflected on Sir Thorpe's earlier proposal of marriage. It would not do. He was a good man. He deserved better than relegation to second fiddle in her life. I am afraid I owe it to my son to finish what I have started in coming back into his life. You owe him nothing more than that which you have bestowed, the truth of his lineage. He is a grown man. What he does is for him to decide, and can have no bearing on the choices you make for yourself. He raised her hand to his heart. You would be happy with me in Yorkshire. No, it is not Pemberley, but it is a comfortable estate. You would want for nothing. My life is filled with complications, and I suspect things will grow worse. I admired you long before I learnt of any of this, from the moment I first laid eyes on you standing on the dock, your lovely eyes brightened by the brush of the sea against your beautiful face. My feelings have not changed. My feelings have only deepened. Yes, Pemberley is your home. You need not remain here to make it so, for you carry its magic in your heart. Thus it will always be your home. Her ladyship pursed her lips. Sir Thorpe, what about the scorn and ridicule that awaits me should I show my face in society once more? Would you really want that for yourself? For your dear mother? It is a small price to pay for the chance to pass the rest of my days with you at my side. As for my mother, she thinks the world of you. Should she accept him? Could she? George Wickham walked into the room before she had time to consider Sir Thorpe's proposal further. Taking note of their intimacy, he gave the older couple a disdainful look. He then turned and left the room without a word. Elizabeth found her husband in his study the next morning. Less than thrilled by his actions of the day before, she still smarted. You might have awakened me before your trip to Matlock, Mr. Darcy then I would have known when to expect your return. I came to your apartment. You were sleeping so soundly I did not have the heart to disturb you. Besides, my steward had full knowledge of my plans. Am I expected to learn about your comings and goings from your steward? Accept my apology, Elizabeth. Darcy stood, walked over to her, and took her hand. It will not happen again. I shall be sure to tell you about my comings and goings from now on. Does that please you? Well, I suppose it is a small consolation. The fact was, she was more than a little upset. Which vexed her more she dare not vouch for, not knowing when he would return from Matlock, or worrying that something dreadful may have befallen him on his travels. All the pleasure she suffered in seeing him enter the dining room the evening before, albeit after the first courses had been served, she buried inside. He needed to account for his actions. Surely he would be upset if she jumped into a carriage and scurried off to see her relatives on a whim. Did his actions in town suggest otherwise? Surely what is good for one is good for all. I waited up for you last night. He took her hand in his and squeezed it tenderly. Oh, I am sorry. I had no idea. Where were you? Sir Thorpe and I were embroiled in a long game of chess after everyone else retired. Her husband's sudden acceptance of Sir Thorpe puzzled her. When he first had arrived at Pemberley, Darcy called the man a charlatan. When did you become so fond of the gentleman? 
or does this new-found regard have anything to do with your mutual disdain of Mr. Wickham? His voice calm and collected, Darcy said. You suppose Sir Thorpe harbours dislike of Wickham? <laughs> One would have to be blind not to see it. The two gentlemen had little, if anything, to say to each other at dinner last evening. Well, that makes Sir Thorpe a very wise man. I will never trust Wickham. And if you think you can trust him, I urge you to think twice before surrendering your guard around this man. Darcy placed his hand on his wife's face and looked deeply into her eyes. He then placed his fingers against her lips to silence her protesting his admonishments against Wickham. Elizabeth, you do not know this man. He is a scoundrel of the worst kind. He may not have harmed you yet, but that is not to say he never will. Her mind was racked with uncertainty. Should she tell him that she already knew what Wickham was about? That his misdeeds against Georgiana alone had been enough to persuade her against his character? What an untenable position! They had agreed, even if tacitly, to put their differences aside for the sake of family harmony. The last thing she wanted to do was stir the pot. Elizabeth bit her lower lip. He looked at her with such intensity. How she wished she had been blessed with the gift of clairvoyance, to have a glimpse of his mind right then. Did his stare portend annoyance, anguish, affection? A knock at the door effectively ended her suspense. Darcy looked at the clock. That will be Sir Thorpe. He and I made plans for this morning. Shall we resume this discussion when my business with Thorpe is done? Elizabeth pressed her hands to her temple. I would like that very much, for I have a few questions that beg answers, Mr. Darcy. He nodded his consent. Having informed his staff never to enter his study when he and his wife were in there alone, Darcy walked over and opened the door. Sir Thorpe, please come inside. Good morning, Mr. Darcy. He looked at Elizabeth and bowed. Ah, oh, Mrs. Darcy, it is a pleasure to see you. I thank you again for such a lovely evening. There is no need to thank me, Sir Thorpe. Please pardon me. Darcy had learned from the housekeeper that Wickham had come around looking for him the prior day. The fact that Wickham had spent time roaming the halls did not bother him as much as one might imagine, for soon after Wickham's initial visit to the manor house, Darcy's staff was advised that his cousin was to be supervised at all times when inside the manor house. His cousin. How he derided the appellation. But it was better than the alternative. For that, he would be eternally grateful. He could not imagine a worse fate than to be a brother to George Wickham. Darcy also knew that Wickham and Elizabeth had been walking. What he did not know was what they had discussed. Surely, if Elizabeth had been inconvenienced in any way, she would have told him, would she not? His wife must still suffer some tender feelings for the scoundrel, which made Darcy even more determined to implement the plan he had concocted. As well as he knew his childhood friend, certainly this would be the means of his downfall. That is where Sir Thorpe came in, for he would have a pivotal role to play. After an hour or so of hammering out their plan, Darcy opened his desk drawer and retrieved the satchel of precious family heirlooms. You will know exactly where to place these in the Dowager House, so that my aunt will not become aware that they are even there, I trust. Indeed. Lady Alexandra pawned the last of her jewellery whilst in London to retire Wickham's debts in Hertfordshire. She will have no reason to look for them, whereas he knows nothing of her sacrifice, nor does he care. He will suffer no scruples over making off with the jewels once he knows of their existence. No second thoughts, then? In all honesty, a part of me wishes that our efforts to entrap Wickham will be in vain, and that he will not betray his mother's trust. Ah, but he will. I am doing what is in Lady Alexandra's best interest, but I, too, wish to spare her the pain of knowing of Wickham's treachery. Your aunt has experienced much pain throughout her years, though she would never admit it. However, 
I see it as plainly now as the day I first laid eyes on her standing on the deck of our ship. I would do anything in my power to see that she suffers no more. She is an admirable woman. Her greatest regret is not having raised Wickham as her own son. To know how wild and unscrupulous he turned out to be will certainly riddle her with greater guilt than she already suffers. Better to have her believe he turned out to be a decent young man. I understand, and I would wish to protect my aunt from harm as well. That may not be possible, but I promise I shall do my best. Chapter 16 The world would be nothing if not for certain universal truths. Darcy had correctly surmised the despicable propensity of his cousin's character. Sooner than he had expected, but longer than he would have wished, Wickham's time had come. A stack of affidavits remained locked inside his desk drawer, signed by the area merchants who had accepted jewellery from Wickham in exchange for cash as well as the settlement of debts he had mounted. The recovered jewels lay spread out before them atop a desk. Wickham shrugged. With a dismissive wave of his hand, he said, Lady Alexandra will understand, and she will surely forgive me once she sees that the jewels are returned. Shoulders back and arms crossed, Darcy said, She might, except they are not her jewels. They belong to me. You stole them, and I have enough proof to see that you spend a good part of your life in prison. There is nothing anyone, even Lady Alexandra, can do to stop me. Only you hold that power by leaving Pemberley forever. Make whatever excuse you deem necessary to Lady Alexandra, and be gone by the end of the day. Wickham bawled his fists. Lady Alexandra will not hear of it. Lady Alexandra's good opinion of you will be lost, perhaps forever, once I show her this. Darcy showed Wickham the blue sapphire ring. Wickham's countenance belied his attempts to appear nonchalant. Darcy said, I know by accounts from Georgiana how much my aunt treasured this ring. It belonged to your true father. It meant the world to her to pass it on to you. Darcy stood from his desk and walked over to the door. I suggest you quit while you are ahead. You nettled a hefty sum for your stolen wares. If you have not squandered it all, it is more than enough to establish yourself in another unsuspecting part of the country. Wickham scoffed. <laughs> Lady Alexandra will forgive this transgression. She owes me as much. I, on the other hand, owe you nothing. What is more, I have another grievance to place at your feet. Darcy glared at his childhood friend, dark eyes piercing as he clenched his fists by his sides to temper his rage. You useless fool! How dare you approach Mrs. Darcy's maid, seeking to use her as a pawn in your scheme to make trouble for me and my wife? What falsehood do you mean to make against me? When Darcy's housekeeper had approached him with an account of Wickham's misdeeds, his temper fled. Mrs. Reynolds was an excellent judge of character. If she accepted the maid's account that Wickham had attempted to ingratiate himself with her, it was good enough for Darcy. Besides, it was just the sort of thing Wickham would do. You need not attempt to deny that you have been asking around and endeavouring to ascertain details about my wife, how she spends her time, and, most important, how she spends her time with me. Even if such a thing were conceivable, it would be a servant's word against mine. She made her complaint with Mrs. Reynolds, who happened to believe her. Imagine how dreadful it was for her to have to tell me that you attempted to seduce a member of the household staff as a means of harming me. Old Lady Reynolds has always detested me, and as for the maid, even you can attest to the fact that she has been smitten with me for years. Darcy could not deny the legitimacy of Wickham's claim. Indeed, she had harboured a tender regard for Wickham. He had trifled with her before. 
A woman scorned, I suppose you would have me believe. It is beside the point. Perhaps she turned against you because she discovered your want of whispering the same sweet nothings in other female servants' ears. She has known you long enough and seen how you have treated other young women before her to be too affected by your charms. I am not my father. I will not turn a blind eye to your wickedness as you spread your seed all over Pemberley, leaving me to clean up behind you. Lady Alexandra will have something to say about this. You know better than that. Pemberley is mine. I say who comes and who goes, and I say your time is up. Now clear out before I have you arrested for the thief that you are. You cannot prove a thing. Anyone could have stolen those jewels and sold them. Darcy strolled over to his desk, pulled open the top drawer, and took out a signed affidavit from one Lambton merchant who had accepted the jewels from Wickham in return for cash. He threw it at Wickham. Read it. I have several others. Unless the prospect of imprisonment intrigues you, leave my home at once and never return. Wickham coloured. His eyes turned darker. You pompous high-handed sneak! Do you think I do not know what you are about? This has nothing to do with stolen jewellery and compromised servants, and everything to do with Elizabeth. I proposed to her that night on the terrace, did she tell you? I meant to marry her, and you knew it. You knew she liked me best. We suffered little more than a lover's spat, which you used to your advantage. You swooped in with all your wealth and stole her from me. You are the true thief. A few minutes more, and Elizabeth would now be my wife. Get out! This is not over, not by a long shot. She had not laughed that much in years. Lady Alexandra and Sir Thorpe returned to the Dowager House after a leisurely walk where he regaled her with tales of his former life. The amiable gentleman was a balm to her battered ego. The past weeks of contention with her son might have worn her down completely if not for Sir Thorpe's being there. He knew just what to do or say to reassure her that she was not to blame for her son's deficits. The footman handed her a note when she entered the parlour. I have been instructed to pass this along to you, your ladyship. Thank you, Thomas, she said as she accepted it. Her heartbeat raced. She recognised the handwriting. What was she to make of it? She placed her hand on her bosom. Are you all right, my lady? said Sir Thorpe. This letter is from George. But why would he need to write to me when we share the same home? Has our relationship come to this? Shall I leave you to read your letter in privacy? Oh, no, you are welcome to stay whilst I read it. She unfolded the missive and read what her son had to say. Dear Lady Alexandra, you will forgive me for taking my leave of Pemberley without saying a proper goodbye. Darcy and I quarrelled this morning, and he demanded that I leave post-haste. I confess that I am eager to be on my way. I have abided his condescension and his callous disdain of my birthright long enough. I mean to make my own way. However, you are not to worry, for I shall return. Darcy will rue the day he deigned to make a mockery of my legacy. Regards, George Wickham. Lady Alexandra laid the letter aside and covered her face with both hands. Tumult laced with bittersweet pain etched across her mind. George has left Pemberley. Sir Thorpe bit his lower lip. Did he give a reason? She handed her gentleman companion the letter and he read Wickham's hastily written words for himself. Moments later, she said, What shall I do? He folded the letter and placed it on the side table. I propose you do nothing, your ladyship. He took her hands in his and smoothed them with his thumbs. I am not trying to make excuses for what has happened, but those two were never going to live in harmony. At the end of the day, Pemberley is Darcy's home. He has final say over who comes and goes. 
Her nephew knew how important her son was to her. He promised he would not interfere with the comings and goings at the Dowager House. He would hear from her. Sir Thorpe must have read her mind. He placed his hand on her lips to silence her intended protest. You must admit, this situation has been trying for your entire family. Your son is a grown man. He says he intends to make his own way in life. Allow him to do just that. Lady Alexandra released a deep sigh. She could not erase a lifetime of inattention simply by inviting her son to live with her at Pemberley. He was his own man with his own life, his own history that had fashioned his character. He said he would return, and no doubt he would. Her greatest hope was that when he did, he would return a better man than when he left. A week later, the Darcys were beginning to establish a semblance of normalcy. Darcy attributed his aunt's relatively easy acceptance of Wickham's precipitous departure to Sir Thorpe's influence. If only his sister had suffered his leave-taking half as well. Elizabeth too, for that matter. Darcy rightly surmised that he was not the most popular person with either of the women in his life. Oh well, life now was far better than the alternative. Elizabeth, forgive me if I misunderstand the situation. However, I feel you are most displeased with me of late. I expected Georgiana's animosity over Wickham's departure. Though she will not admit it, I feel certain she blames me. Are you of the same mind? Actually, Mr. Darcy, I am not so much opposed to the fact that Mr. Wickham is gone, but rather that you saw fit not to apprise me of your scheme. Oh, is that all? I feared it was something serious. Elizabeth rolled her eyes. Mr. Darcy, what could be more serious than your making such decisions with little regard for my sentiments? I did what I did for you, for all of you. I know that Lady Alexandra, Georgiana and you do not disdain Wickham as I do, and the fact that he is family affords him a certain amount of leeway. However, none of you know him as I do. He is rotten to the core. Nothing will change that fact. However, the past weeks with him in our midst since having learned Lady Alexandra's secret has taught me that whilst I always valued family, particularly my family, above all else, at the end of the day, we are all imperfect people whom are not to be judged, but rather loved and cherished. I have also come to realise that I have been particularly harsh in my judgments towards your family, which is why I took it upon myself to invite your uncle and aunt Gardiner to Pemberley when they travel to the north. A warm colour covered her face with a wonderful glow, and the delight that his heart so cherished added luster to her eyes. Elizabeth said, Truly, Mr. Darcy? Yes, truly. Your uncle wrote to me to accept the invitation. Rather than stay in Lambton, as they had planned originally, they will stay at Pemberley with us. I suppose it would be pointless to ask why you did not tell me of your plans. I wanted to surprise you. Elizabeth danced to his side and kissed him on his chin, and in so doing caught him quite unawares. This is the best surprise I ever had. <laughs> How shall I repay your kindness? There is nothing to be done. Pemberley is your home, and your relations are as welcome here as mine, the one exception being George Wickham. Elizabeth could not have been more delighted than when she welcomed her beloved aunt and uncle to Pemberley. Her aunt Gardner added to Elizabeth's euphoria when she handed her a letter from Jane. Filled with anticipation, Elizabeth read the letter with alacrity. Its contents threw Elizabeth into a flutter of spirits, for Jane confirmed what Elizabeth had wished for most since learning a week or so earlier of Mr. Bingley's return to Hertfordshire. The two were engaged to be married. On the evening before the gardeners were to embark upon the next leg of their northern holiday, Elizabeth and her aunt spoke alone after dinner. Tell me again, aunt, of Jane's delight. 
Trust me when I say she is exceedingly pleased. But enough about your sister's future felicitations. Pray, how are things between you and your own husband? I know from your letters that you are anxious to conceive. However, these things take time. Soon enough, there will be many little ones for you to cherish and love. Elizabeth's lower lip trembled. I am not as certain as you. Concern etched across her aunt's face. Elizabeth reached and touched her aunt's hand. Do not misunderstand me. My husband is everything that is attentive, but he acts as if he does not want... By his behaviour, one would believe he does not wish to beget children. Elizabeth stood, crossing her arms as she walked to the window. It was not always this way. I mean to say, during our first months of marriage, he was exceedingly amorous. But ever since... She turned to face her aunt. I think the doctor went against my wishes and shared his dire prognosis with my husband. You mean he confided to your husband the risks associated with your giving birth? Yes, said Elizabeth. I know no other way to account for my husband's change. This is exactly why I did not want him to know. What with his family's history, his grandmother, his mother? Mrs. Gardner walked over to her niece. Have you discussed any of this with Mr. Darcy? If you could only imagine how many times I have wanted to talk with him, but I hardly know where to begin. I believe he will be most unreasonable. You will never know until you try. Elizabeth suffered some reservations over her aunt's advice, such that it surely showed on her face. Her aunt lifted her chin and looked into her eyes. Speak to him as only a wife can speak to her husband. You will know what to say. Three weeks later, whilst sitting in her favourite little alcove wool-gathering, Georgiana was roused from her seat and her reflections by someone's approach. She hesitated but a moment before curtsying. Cousin George, what on earth are you doing here? Georgiana looked around to see if anyone was in the vicinity. Is my brother aware of your return? He went to her side and persuaded her to sit with him. No, he is not. In fact, I took a big chance in coming here. However, I had to come. I had to see you. You had to see me? Indeed. You see, my dearest cousin, I need your help. She bit her lip nervously. If you have come to ask me to intercede with my brother on your behalf, I must tell you that it, it would be a hopeless cause. Both Lady Alexandra and I have prevailed upon him to reconsider his latest dictate to no avail. A hint of worry played across his face. Has Darcy said anything to you to explain his harsh sentiments towards me? No, not one word. He refuses to answer any of our inquiries as to the cause of your sudden departure. It is no wonder, for he has no legitimate quarrel with me. The fact is that his vengeful nature simply will not allow him to forgive me for the unfortunate circumstances of my birth. It matters not that I am his own flesh and blood. He continues to regard me as the lowly son of his father's steward. The winds of fate have changed, and Darcy, well, he simply refuses to accept it. Wickham stood, walked over to a nearby tree, and plucked a leaf from its low-hanging branch. He turned to face Georgiana. The only way I can reconcile Darcy's behaviour is by recalling that he has always been jealous of me because your father loved me best. Darcy hates me. There had to be more to the story than what either her brother or her cousin allowed. Why have you returned? Surely you risk incurring his wrath. He dropped the leaf and returned to her side. I fear that the only person who can persuade Darcy to let go of his malice is his dear wife. I know that should I have a chance to speak to her away from Pemberley and your brother's watchful eyes, I would be able to remind her of what great friends she and I had always been in the past. 
Then I shall ask her to speak on my behalf to Darcy. He knelt and took her by the hand. Pemberley is my home, too. It has been and always will be my home. Though I might not always expect to reside here, as I am not its heir, I should certainly expect to come and go at leisure. You must understand that, Georgiana. Imagine what would happen should you ever lose Darcy's good opinion, should you fall prey to his ill temper, and should he banish you from Pemberley. She withdrew her hand. My brother would never do that. Do you know that with certainty? Surely Lady Alexandra told you the story of how her own father banished her from Pemberley owing to the circumstances of my birth. We suffer human frailties, all of us. We all make mistakes. However, Pemberley's masters tend to forget that they too are human and subject to the same frailties as the rest of us. Just when she was beginning to think better of her brother, due in part to his affection for his wife, Georgiana questioned her beliefs. From what she could remember of her father, he was the best of men. She saw in her brother many of her father's admirable qualities. He was the best master, devoted to his family and their protection, highly regarded by all of Pemberley, all of Derbyshire. However, Lady Alexandra also had spoken highly of her own father and how well regarded he was amongst all those who knew him. She had spoken of his darker nature as well, his ruthlessness, and worst of all, how he had turned his back on her. Could one man be both good and heartless? Could her brother have inherited those same traits? Oh, what a chilling prospect! Georgiana stood and walked over to the same low-hanging branch where he had stood. She crossed her arms over her chest. He approached her from behind and placed his hand on her shoulder. Mind you, dearest Georgiana, my intention is not to speak ill of your brother. I cannot fault Darcy. He is a man of his upbringing, but I shall not go away without first trying to regain what is rightfully mine by birth. Say you understand, dearest cousin. Say that you shall do all in your power to persuade Elizabeth to see me. She was not her brother. Ill temperament and vengefulness were not in her nature. More than that, George was family. She turned to face him. I promise to do all that I can. I think you deserve your place at Pemberley. Oh, you are a blessing, dearest cousin. But mind you, Elizabeth must not know about this meeting, or she will surely seek permission from Darcy before agreeing. I intend for our meeting to be thought of as a chance encounter, if you will. Do you think you are quite capable of pulling off my surprise? I shall be forever in your debt. Again, I promise I shall do my best. Chapter 17 you foolish girl! Elizabeth hardly knew how to think, such was her vexation. That is why Georgiana was particularly fidgety the closer we drew to our destination. Her sweet, innocent sister had been the means of bringing Elizabeth face to face with the one person she did not wish to see. Pulling Elizabeth along, Georgiana hurried to his table in the back of the tea-room. Although Georgiana could not have been more blatant, he pretended he had not been expecting them. He stood and bowed with great flourish. Good morning, ladies. How fortuitous I am in seeing you. The prospect of basking in your beautiful presence has been my fondest wish ever since I last saw you at Pemberley. Good morning, Cousin George. We have missed you at Pemberley. It is not the same without you. Georgiana faced Elizabeth. Do you not agree, Elizabeth? We all miss George's liveliness. Georgiana, I dare say we get along fine. If you will pardon me, I wish to speak with your cousin in private. You shall wait for me at one of the tables in front. But, Elizabeth... Please do as your sister advises, Georgiana. We shall join you shortly, I am sure. Georgiana pouted and walked away, looking back from time to time with uncertainty. I would not be so sure were I you, Mr. Wickham. 
I have no business with you. I know family is important to you, Elizabeth. We are family. I made a mistake, and I need you to persuade Darcy of my sincerest regret so that I might reclaim his good opinion. What you are asking is the impossible. As much as Mr. Darcy does not care for you, I know he cares for Lady Alexandra. Whatever you did to cause him to force you from Pemberley and in so doing break his aunt's heart must have been particularly egregious. You mean to say he did not tell you of his grievances against me? I do not care to know. Elizabeth backed away. As I said, I have no business with you, nor do I have any quarrels. Whatever misunderstandings arose between you and my husband that led to your current predicament have nothing at all to do with me. His voice hardened. It has everything to do with you, and you well know it. Darcy orchestrated this entire situation. He denied me what is rightfully mine, and then he tempted me to take measures that were certain to better my plight. Why would he do that? He has always been, and he always will be, jealous of me. First it was his father's preference for me, then Georgiana's, and now yours, especially yours. Mine? He knows you liked me best from the moment of our introduction in Meryton, and he simply cannot stand it. He orchestrated his malicious scheme to keep us apart. Elizabeth placed her hands on her hips. Mr. Wickham, the sooner you disentangle your mind from the notion of my ever having preferred you, the better. I rejected your foolish proposal, as you well know. There is nothing that would have tempted me to accept you. You are a fool to think otherwise. I will stop thinking it when you stop looking at me the way you do. Even when your precious husband is in the room, your eyes always find their way to me. Oh, you are ridiculous. You came to the Netherfield Ball that evening looking for me. You expected me to offer for you, and I did. Only, like a child who chases a ball and then becomes bored once it is within her grasp, you tossed me aside the moment you saw the chance to land a bigger catch. That is not what happened, and you well know it. All I know is you struck gold when Darcy took advantage of our misunderstanding, and I intend to benefit from your good fortune. I refuse to stand here a second longer and subject myself to this ludicrous abuse. Wickham grabbed Elizabeth's arm. Now, unlike the first time on the terrace at the Netherfield Ball, the force of his grip stung. However, the prospect of repeating the scandal tempered her response. The fire in her eyes silently raged. He drew her close. They now faced each other, much too close for such a public place. The bitter smell of alcohol loomed heavy on his breath. Unhand me this instant, you fool, Elizabeth said. Striking him would have been appropriate, except that it would have caused a scene. That was the last thing she wanted. He released her with more force than was warranted. This is not over, Elizabeth. You will hear from me. Furious, Elizabeth walked away. Her husband was right. The man is a scoundrel of the worst sort. He is incapable of commanding respect. She hoped, nay, she prayed, that his threats were nothing more than the rambling of a bitter coward. Maybe this time she truly had seen the last of him. Once alone in the carriage on their way to Pemberley, Elizabeth lambasted her sister. The younger woman needed to let go of the fantasy she had concocted as regarded their family's future with George Wickham. Georgiana, your behaviour is unconscionable. You deliberately misled me in saying you wanted an outing with me when all you intended was to put me in Mr Wickham's path. Elizabeth, I am sorry you are so upset with me. You must believe me when I say I meant no harm. He is my cousin, my family. I shall not turn my back on him simply because my brother does not like him. He treated George abominably in forcing him to leave Pemberley, again. Pemberley has always been George's home. It is the only home he has ever known, and we are his only family. 
The blood coursing through his veins is the same blood that courses through my brother's. Georgiana obviously had not seen how her cousin manhandled Elizabeth some minutes earlier. Perhaps it was for the best. Indeed, he is family, but that does not render him as worthy. Your cousin is not half the man that your brother is, and it has nothing to do with his being of Darcy blood. You must abandon this habit of second-guessing your brother. Neither of us is privy to his motives in demanding that Mr. Wickham leave Pemberley. Nevertheless, you, nay we, must trust that he is doing what is best for all of us. Elizabeth, if I believed there was merit in your claims, I might regret my actions. However, I... Elizabeth raised her sleeve and showed Georgiana the fresh bruises on her arm. Is this proof enough of what the man is capable of doing? Georgiana gasped. Your arm! What happened? Your cousin is what happened. Furthermore, he threatened that I have not heard the last of him. Oh, Elizabeth, this is bad. My brother will be furious. Elizabeth lowered her sleeve. Perhaps now you see that you need to let go of this fantasy that we shall all have a happy ever after existence with Mr. Wickham. It will never be. He is a wicked man. Deep in your heart, you know it is true. Georgiana's eyes filled with tears. She covered her face with her hands as though attempting to bury her shame. Elizabeth moved to sit beside Georgiana and embraced her. You need not fret. I have no intention of telling your brother any of what happened today. Oh, you have my eternal gratitude. Georgiana, I do not seek your gratitude. Mr. Wickham is family. There is nothing to be done to change that fact. Although he is quick to issue threats, so long as he stays far away from Pemberley, I shall consider him completely harmless. After a light rap at the door, Elizabeth did not wait for a response before entering her husband's room. He was reading in bed. His ardour he dare not vouch for seeing her thus. He immediately placed his book aside and got out of bed. He took his wife by her hand and led her to the sofa. Settled comfortably beside her, Darcy said, What brings you to my room at such an hour as this? Is there something on your mind? Must I have an excuse to want to spend time with you? Of course not, but you have been unusually quiet all day, as if you are shouldering a heavy burden. He ran his fingers along her face. I wish you would tell me what is on your mind. He raised her hand to his lips and kissed it while she tucked her fingers and grasped her sleeve, making a concerted effort to hold it in place. She curled up in his arms and he kissed her on the forehead. What were you reading when I entered? It is a rare edition of one of Shelley's works. I received it today. Despite the lateness of the hour, I could not wait to start reading. Shall I read it to you? It might help you fall asleep. Do you mean to say that your reading material is boring? He chuckled. You might find it so. He relinquished his wife and went to retrieve his book from the bed. After reclaiming his wife in his arms, he read to her. It never failed. Just as he had expected, the sound of his voice lulled her into a quiet slumber. Darcy lifted his sleeping wife. Cradling her in his arms, he took her to her own room. Removing her robe, his eyes met with a most disturbing sight. What on earth? He sat on her bed after tucking her in. He smoothed her hair. She was resting peacefully. There would be time enough to discover what was troubling her in the morning. He leaned down and kissed her lips. I love you, Elizabeth. Chapter 18 each subsequent line of the missive from Longbourn conveyed more devastating news than the one before. My sister is ruined. Oh, Jane's hopes shattered. Oh, foolish Lydia, what have you done? Elizabeth jumped at the sound of the door opening. She put the letter behind her back whilst using her free hand to wipe away her tears. Her efforts proved futile. 
Darcy approached his wife and placed his hands on her shoulders. What are you hiding? He then noticed her tear-stained cheeks. Why are you crying? Elizabeth remained silent. Darcy said, I was told you received an urgent express this morning. Is it a letter from Longbourn? Has something happened to one of your parents or one of your sisters? Elizabeth nervously shook her head, no. It is a letter from him. Elizabeth burst into tears. Darcy reached behind her back and retrieved the letter. Try as he might to conceal his rage, his eyes nearly lit the parchment with flames. Threats and innuendo jumped off the page. Retrieve the jewels from Pemberley. Say nothing of my demands to anyone, else I will let it be known that I have ruined your sister Lydia. No decent family will go anywhere near the Bennets of Longbourn. Say goodbye to the prospect of an alliance between sweet Jane and the fool Charles Bingley. Meet me. Darcy balled up the letter and tossed it to the floor. How dare that scoundrel attempt extortion against my wife? Hunting down the villain and exacting his revenge would have to wait. Elizabeth was clearly distraught. Darcy did not intend to make the situation worse by worrying her over how he planned to deal with Wickham. Darcy took Elizabeth into his arms and encouraged her to cry to her heart's content, to release the pain and embarrassment she must have been suffering. When she calmed, he took her hand, slowly pushed up her sleeve, and examined her bruises. You have seen him since I exiled him from Pemberley? He looked into her eyes. He did this to you. Her lips trembled. I am so sorry. He hushed her. This burden is not yours, it is mine. I shall handle it from this point on. But I need to explain. No, you owe me no explanations, Elizabeth. But I know why he has committed these horrible transgressions against my family. You see, hush, you only think you know. I must tell you what happened that night at the Netherfield Ball. Why he thinks he holds this power over me. I know what happened. Elizabeth's eyes begged a thousand questions. Darcy placed his hand on her cheek and wiped away her tears. None of that matters. You are my wife. I chose you. I have thanked God every day since that you accepted. You have? Elizabeth, you are unlike any woman I have ever known. You... you have bewitched me, body and soul. He kissed her forehead. I always knew you would make me happy, make me proud, and I hoped I could do the same for you. He leaned his forehead against hers. You are mine. Yes, I am yours. I love you. Indeed, her tender feelings had been coming on for so long she hardly knew when they had begun. Yet here she was, deeply, profoundly and unmistakably in love with her husband. Did it start the day he placed his beloved mother's ring on her finger and expressed his ardent devotion? Was it the morning they consummated their vows as man and wife? Or when he stayed by her side night and day whilst she recovered from her bout of malaise over the doctor's dire prognosis? Whenever had been the start, she was happy, and she had been for the longest time. She was safe. She was protected. She was in love. Darcy placed his finger on her chin and lifted her head. Whilst I shall not go into the details of how I plan to seek retribution against George Wickham, trust me when I say I will handle this in a manner that ensures a fitting outcome for everyone concerned. What if it is too late? I rather doubt the harm to your sister is irrecoverable. By all accounts, it has been months since Wickham was even in Hertfordshire. Whilst he was there... I engaged a private investigator to keep me apprised of his comings and goings, all in an effort to keep your young sisters from harm. I never knew. Few people knew. However, if anything scandalous was afoot, my man would have not allowed it. Once Wickham left Hertfordshire, I saw no further need for the investigator's services, and I released him. 
Unless Wickham returned to Hertfordshire recently, he has had no contact with your sister. Elizabeth diverted her eyes. I fear Mr. Wickham's threat may not be meritless. She walked towards the sofa and sat. I received a letter from Jane just this morning telling me that Mr. Wickham recently called on Longbourn. She spoke of Lydia's unbridled enthusiasm upon his arrival and her sudden disappointment once he had gone away. Her tears threatened to fall once again. This is all my fault. If I had only been open with my sisters, none of this might have happened. No, you are not to blame. Darcy lifted her from the sofa and embraced her. I told you I will handle this, and I will. I know now exactly what I must do. The large burly man who sat across from him in the stopped carriage peered out the window. You will find him inside those walls, Mr. Darcy. Wait here. This shall not take long. Darcy stepped onto the street and surveyed his surroundings. The sight of the old fortress's towering forbidding walls gave him pause. It was only a matter of time before his acquaintance with the likes of George Wickham found him at the gates of perdition. Darcy winced. Oh, this place looks and smells like hell. Once beyond the thick, imposing gate and inside the courtyard, he beheld the most decrepit prospect imaginable. Yes, Wickham will jump at my deal. Anything to be away from this foul place. He followed the guard through the courtyard into an old building, through a long dark corridor up the rickety stairs to a heavy locked door. The guard took out the key, opened the door, and moved aside. That one's nothing but trouble, he said, before spitting on the floor. Stepping inside, Darcy met with exactly what he had expected. Wickham cowering in the corner of the dark cell with a single lighted candle. Wild-eyed and unshaven, his hair was unkempt, his clothing soiled. Wickham glared at Darcy. You did this! His nostrils flared as he attempted to right himself. I never thought that even you would see your own flesh and blood imprisoned, you vengeful bastard! You threatened my wife! My wife! This is insupportable. I am a Darcy just as much as you. I do not belong in such a place. You pathetic fool. You must have known I would find out. You know me well enough to know that I would not wish to see my wife's family, my family, ruined, and I would do all in my power to protect them. However... As much as I abhor you, it appears the nature of your transgression works in your favour. I have a solution, one you would be wise to take advantage of. Wickham scowled at Darcy. What scheme have you concocted now? There is a way forward, one that wipes the slate clean as far as we are concerned. It will be the means of making you a better man as well. You need only agree to my terms, and you will walk away from here with me, a free man. Less than a half hour later, the two men walked outside the prison walls and entered Darcy's carriage. Waiting inside sat the tall man of huge stature and a menacing stare. Wickham, I introduce you to Mr. Simon Bartley. You should get to know him, for he will be your constant companion. He has even agreed to be your groomsman. <laughs> you speak nonsense, Darcy. Why on earth do I need a groomsman? Why, to stand up at your wedding, of course. Whilst it is customary for one's best friend to command such an honour, I believe you have none. His eyes opened wide and his mouth fell open. My wedding? Yes, to my youngest sister, Lydia. Surely you will find it no hardship. Unless I am mistaken, you have already shared liberties with her that are normally reserved for a man and his wife. Wickham stuck out his chin. I have not seen the silly girl in months. Enough lies. I know for a fact that you have been to Meryton in recent weeks. Where do you intend to take me? Surely you do not intend to escort me all the way to Hertfordshire? No, Mr. Bartley is the fortunate person who will travel with you to Hertfordshire. Bartley confirmed Darcy's declaration with a deadly stare. Darcy said, 
you and I have a stop before we part company. I shall accompany you to acquire a special license, and I shall remain with you for as long as it takes. Then I shall return to Pemberley to my wife. This is madness. I am in no position to take a bride. Shall I turn your sister out on the street to support us both? You wretched creature. You shall do no such thing. I have made arrangements for your future livelihood. Wickham sat up straight. The living I ought to have had? Darcy harumphed. <laughs> it is a living, in a manner of speaking. It turns out you will be living in the north, in Newcastle, where a new commission awaits you. Wickham folded his arms in childlike protest. You cannot force me to marry the silly girl. Shall we turn this carriage around and head back to the prison? I am certain your cell is just as you left it. You suppose you have it all figured out? I will show up at Longbourn with a special license in hand, and Mr. Bennet will readily hand over his youngest daughter. <laughs> what lunacy! Actually, Mr. Bartley is armed with a letter that practically assures it. Bartley patted his weathered jacket's breast pocket. Wickham eyed the larger man with contempt. Do you honestly think I will remain with this brute once you and I have parted company? Bartley opened his jacket to show Wickham that he was armed with more than Darcy's letter, causing Wickham to colour another shade of pale whilst eliciting a frightened whimper. Darcy twisted his lips mockingly. I think you will do precisely that. Chapter 19 what a beautiful sight to behold. Darcy paused at the doorway a moment before walking into his wife's sitting room. He joined her on the sofa. Elizabeth was absorbed in her latest correspondence. Pulling her into his arms, he said, Is that a letter from Longbourn? Yes, it is from Mamma. She insists that we are to receive Lydia and her husband when they journey to the north. Oh, Elizabeth... Just think how happy it will make Lady Alexandra as well. She has told me time and again how much she longs to meet her new daughter. She has even said she wishes Lydia will be just like me. <laughs> Is she ever in for a surprise? Mr. Darcy. What? So does that mean you are open to the idea of the Wickhams as guests at Pemberley? Your sister may come and go at leisure. So long as her husband is relegated to the dowager house, I suppose I shall have no cause to repine. Oh, Mamma will be delighted. He lifted her hand to his lips. Pressing sweet kisses inside her wrist, he said, What other news from Longbourn? Mamma was especially disheartened by the urgency of Lydia's nuptials. She is determined to make up for the hastiness of Lydia's wedding by thoroughly impressing the entire neighbourhood with Jane's wedding to Mr. Bingley. She says all is on schedule. Oh, how I wish to see my dearest sister on the happiest day of her life. Then by all means, you shall have your wish. Oh, thank you. And just think, we shall have enough time before we travel to Hertfordshire to have a proper wedding here at Pemberley. He furrowed his brow. What have I missed? Who is getting married at Pemberley? Why, Lady Alexandra and Sir Thorpe. Oh, of course, they only decided yesterday. Perhaps they have not had a chance to tell you. How did you find out? She called on me earlier. Whilst your aunt and I are not yet the dearest of friends, I think we are making steady progress towards an amiable regard for each other. Darcy said, it is wonderful that Lady Alexandra has set her grievances towards you aside. Now if she will only forgive me, as Georgiana has seen fit to do. Do I have you to thank for that? I shall not take credit for your sister's change of heart towards you, my love. She is quite a sensible young woman, and as regards Lady Alexandra, I suspect she understands. After all, you have saved her from living her life as Mr. Wickham's greatest victim even if he is her son. She should not be forced to suffer guilt for the rest of her days. I pray you are correct. I wish for nothing more than that we should all be a happy family. Darcy kissed his wife. 
Now, if only the breach between the Darcys and Fitzwilliams would heal. Surely Lord and Lady Matlock, as well as Lady Catherine, will put their disapproval of Lady Alexandra aside. To do otherwise would mean shunning Georgiana and you. I have seen how much they adore both of you. I say it is merely a matter of time. Perhaps the Darcys and the Fitzwilliams will be reunited at Christmas. He nuzzled her earlobes before whispering, You are quite an optimist. I love you most ardently, Mrs. Darcy, with all my heart and soul. He brushed her lips with his. You are beautiful, kind, and understanding. Innocent teasing etched into his voice. <laughs> what is more, I confess you are not too terribly demanding. Elizabeth's spirits turned playful. <laughs> when did you first realise you loved me? I hardly know when it started, but if I have to name a time and place, I would have to say our first morning as man and wife, when the soft sketching of your fingers along my face gently roused me from my slumber. You mean when I did this? Elizabeth traced her fingers along his broad chest. Even though fully dressed, the intensity of her touch was just as powerful as it had been the first time. Indeed, <laughs> may I never tire of the touch of your hands. Darcy raised her hand to his lips and kissed the inside of her palm. Elizabeth said, I seem to recall your mentioning that you dreamed of the two of us as man and wife. Yes, and I awakened to find you amiable to making my dreams come true. Do you continue to have such dreams? I dream every night of worshipping your body, my love. Then you might explain why it has been months since we have unreservedly exercised the fulfilment of said dreams, with no pulling back. Darcy moaned. These have been some of the hardest days of my life. Nevertheless, I am painfully aware of the risks, and I will not chance losing you. I truly value you above and beyond all else in life. He lifted her hand to his lips and bestowed a sweet kiss. My greatest desire is to cherish you more and more as each year goes by. Pemberley needs an heir. I need you. I need you as well. However, I need children. If you allow me to confess my own dreams... I would have to say that my greatest dream is that our home is filled with children. It is what I want more than anything, more than life itself. Elizabeth placed her hand on his. I do not mean to make light of the Darcy's family history in this regard, but there have been many advances in the field of midwifery. You know this because... I am constantly improving my mind with extensive reading, and this is a subject close to my heart. Were I to lose you, I would blame myself forever. It is simply not a risk I wish to take. We must. It is nature's plan. Yes, there are risks. Life offers no guarantees. Elizabeth set astride her husband's lap and started loosening his cravat. Her impetuous act stirred him immediately, just as she intended. Elizabeth. She touched his soft lips with the tips of her small, slender fingers. Hush. She kissed him. You worry too much. I am certain such a fate will not befall us. Elizabeth, my love, I wish to have children. It is my duty to beget Pemberley's heir. However, in spite of the advances, what with all our family's history, I cannot bear to subject you to a similar fate as that suffered by my mother and grandmother. I want to grow old with you. Elizabeth raised his hand to her lips and brushed a light kiss across his knuckles. Mr. Darcy, I grant you that some things are beyond our control, but I urge you to embrace a bit of my philosophy in such cases as this. Our future is bright. I will give you many children. Pemberley's halls will dance to the tune of their tiny footsteps racing to and fro. Further, 
Throughout the years, you will find me by your side, both our faces brightened by our children's enthusiasm, our ears ringing with the sound of their laughter, their children's laughter. And you know this to be a certainty? I do. You see, my love, she leaned forward and whispered in his ear, I know this because it comes down to one thing, a matter of trust. This has been Matter of Trust, The Shades of Pemberley, written by P.O. Dixon, narrated by Pearl Hewitt. Copyright 2012 by P.O. Dixon. Production Copyright 2013 by P.O. Dixon.